Life and Sayings of Mrs. Partington and Others of the Family by B. P. Shelliber. Section 1 To the friends of Mrs. Partington, whose favor has encouraged the old lady in her eccentric sayings, this volume is respectively dedicated. Prefatory Mrs. Partington once declined an introduction to a party because she did not wish to be introduced to anyone she was not acquainted with. She needs no introduction now. In all parts of our own land and over the sea, her name is familiar as a household word, and, as Mrs. Partington would say, forms a tributary clause to many a good story or an apology for many a bad one. A smile attending the utterance of the name in evidence of its appreciation. But a preface, of course, is expected, and so, in the most gentle manner in the world, we will tell you, reader, a little story about the origin of the Partington sayings, and why they were said, and why they are here collected. Perhaps you have guessed it all, but it is well to be certain. In the first place, they were written, as the canine quadruped is said to have gone to church, for fun, for the author's own amusement, with a latent hope, however half-indulged, that the big world which the author very much loves and wishes to please, might see something in them at which to smile. He was modest in his hope, and hid himself behind an incognito, impenetrable, he thought, where he could see the effect of his mild squibs upon the public. The result pleased him, and he kept vigorously blazing away unseen, as much so as the simple bird that thrusts its head under a leaf and fancies itself unobserved, until they have arisen to a magnitude that some people might deem respectable. The origin and object of the Partington sayings being thus described, the motive for their collection shall be confessed. It is the hope that their author may make a little money on them. He is not so squeamish or pretending as to talk of public good and public amusement as his leading motives in the matter, but if these can be obtained through the publication, he will be most happy. The author confesses to certain pressing contingencies, by no means peculiar to him, however, among authors, that would be relieved by a generous return for his outlay of time, and that his pouch may take a more silvery hue from the circulation of his book, is a consummation devoutly by him to be wished. This motive, so entirely original for the publication of a book, the author has secured under the guarantee of his copyright. There might be no necessity for this, where all the rest of the author tribe are writing and printing from higher motives, but he pleads selfishness, and, like the old lady in her variance with St. Paul, there is where he and they differ. Some wiseacre has recently made a discovery of what we have proclaimed from the outset, that the name of Mrs. Partington was not original with us, that Sidney Smith first gave it to the world. Most profound discoverer! but the character we claim is ours. And whether it had been embodied in Mrs. Smith or Brown, instead of Mrs. Partington, would have been immaterial. Those sayings are ours, and we venture to affirm that Sidney Smith would not lay claim to them from the fact that they were uttered by one of the same name as his heroine of the mop. Because, forsooth, he had spoken of Mrs. Partington sweeping back the Atlantic with her broom, would he claim the illustrious Paul and the roguish Isaac, and the jocose Roger, and the great Philanthropos, and the poetical wide swarth, as his progeny? We trow not, even though others might be found ready to do it for him. The reputation of Mrs. Partington belongs to the Boston Post, as much as if Sidney Smith had never uttered the name in his great speech in Parliament. The character has been drawn from life. The Mrs. Partington we have depicted is no fancy sketch and no malaprop imitation, as some have thought, who saw in it naught but distorted words and queer sentences. We need no appeal to establish this fact. Mrs. Partington is seen everywhere, and as often without the specks and cap as with them. There are many matters placed within the covers of this book that the sponsor of Mrs. Partington has written beneath the inspiration of her geniality to the influence of which alone their merit, if they possess any, is to be attributed. Her portrait looks down upon him now as he writes, and her pleasant voice seems inwoven with the Souchong smile it sheds, and seems to say, Print a book. 
Biography of Mrs. Partington Relict of P. P. Corporal Paul Partington, whose name is immortalized by its association with that of the universal Mrs. Partington, a portion of whose oracular sayings our book comprises, was a lineal descendant of Seek the Kingdom Continually Parting Tone, who came from the old country, by water probably, somewhere in the early days of our then not very extensive civilization. At that time people were not in the habit of putting everything into the papers as they do now, when the painting of a front door, or the setting of a pane of glass, or the laying of an egg is deemed of sufficient consequence for a paragraph. Much, therefore, of interest concerning the early history of his family is merely known by the faint light which tradition has thrown upon it. A story has come down to us from remote time, through the oracular lips of the oldest inhabitants, that seek the kingdom continually parting tone, abbreviated to seek, was troubled in the old country by certain unpleasant and often occurring reminders of indebtedness. He clept bills, which were always like a summer night falling dew, and certain urgently pressing importunities, the which, added to a faith that was not too popular by any means, at last induced him to warily scrape together such small means as he could, and incontinently retire from metropolitan embarrassment to the comparative quiet of an emigrant's life where he might encounter nothing more annoying than the howling of wolves or the yelling of savages, sweet music both when contrasted with the horror comprised in the words, "'Pay that bill!' which had long distressed him. Here the voice of the dunner was done, and Seek, under his own vine and pine tree, worshipped God and cheated the Indians according to the dictates of his own conscience and the custom of the times. But little, however, can be gleaned of the early supporters of the family name, save what we procure from the ancient family record, a Dudley Leavitt's almanac on which agricultural memoranda had been kept, and from the memory of such members of a foregone generation as remembered the Partington Mansion in Beanville, of course before it was torn down to make way for the new branch railroad. The new house, as the mansion has been called for a century, see the accompanying sketch drawn on a piece of birch bark by a native artist, to distinguish it from some old house that had at some previous time existed somewhere, was erected about the year blank, as is supposed, from the discovery of a receipted bill from Godfrey Pratt for aid in raising ye new edifice, which bears date as above, and likewise from the fact that a child was born to the erector of the new house the same year, which was duly chronicled in the ancient Bible, with other blessings, and the word house, is distinctly to be traced among them. It is supposed by some that the old house was upon a slight hill opposite the gentle acclivity upon which the new house stood, and fancied outlines of an ancient cellar are there discernible by those whose faith is large enough. But a younger class have set up another hypothesis, that what they suppose must have been a cellar was in reality an apple bin, and there is no knowing when or how the point will be determined. The new house was a staunch piece of work, erected at a time when men were honest and infused much of their own character into the work they put together. The beams of oak so sturdy that time, failing to make an impression upon them, gives up at last in despair. The interior of the mansion, in the latter day of its existence, contrasted gloomily with the modern houses that sprang like mushrooms around it. Its oak panelling and thick doors imparted an idea of strength and the huge beam overhead, beneath which a tall man could not stand erect in the low-studded room, showed no more signs of decay than if placed there a hundred years later. It was not destitute of ornament, for around the fireplace were perpetuated, in the everlastingness of Dutch crockery, numerous scriptural scenes, more creditable to the devotional spirit that conceived than to the art, or artlessness, that executed them. The house was intended as a garrison, and where the clapboards had chafed off were revealed the scarfed logs denoting where the loopholes were, and the leaden bullets still left there, which Paul was wont to dig out with his knife when a boy, and make sinkers of for his fishing lines. Many a story that venerable house could tell of ancient warfare, of the midnight attack and gallant defense, but it never told a thing. It was in this house that Paul Partington was born and grew, amid all the luxuries that the town of Beanville afforded, 
said town at that time consisting of five houses and a barn. In this house he was married, the most momentous act of his life, as through the hymenial gate came upon the world the dame whose name we are delighted to honor. We find upon the fly-leaf of a treatise on calcareous manures, yet sacredly treasured the following memorandum in the corporal's own writing, significant of the methodical habits of the man who shed, in after-life, as far as a corporal's warrant could do it, undying glory upon his country. Married this day, January the 3rd, 1808, to Ruth Trotter, by Reverend Mr. Job Snarl, forty bushes of potatoes to Widow Green. There is a blending of bliss and business in this entry that strikes one at the first glance. The record of the sale of the potatoes, in the same paragraph announcing his marriage to Ruth, might signify to some that they were held in equal regard. But we see the matter differently. The purchase of Ruth and the sale of the potatoes were the two great events of that important third of January, and they naturally associated themselves. So you, madam, might associate the birth of your firstborn, the most blissful moment of your life, with the miserable matter of the death of a lame duck or the blowing down of a pigsty. Of the courtship that preceded that marriage we can say nothing except what we have gleaned by accident from the old lady herself. In rebuking the want of sincerity of devotion nowadays on the part of lovers, she once spoke of a time when some one would ride a hard-trotting horse ten miles every night and back for the sake of sitting up with her, but no name was mentioned. When it is remembered that the ancient borough of Dog's Bondage was just ten miles from Beanville, it is easy enough to guess who the individual was. Ruth Partington, born Trotter, came amid sublunar scenes several years before the nineteenth century commenced. Consequently, she is older than eighteen hundred. She was a child by law for eighteen years before she became a woman and performed the duties encumbered upon her, as we have been informed by her, with great fidelity. We have often endeavored in fancy to picture the Ruth of dog's bondage in the check apron and homespun gown by the brook engaged in washing or basket in hand feeding the yellow corn to hungry ducks, emblematic of that throwing forth of gems that have since been scrambled for by admiring crowds, or seeking berries in the woods crowned with wintergreen as the meat of popular approbation surrounds her brow in the latter day of her existence, or engaged in incipient benevolences as binding up the broken limbs of barnyard favorites or protecting the songsters of the marsh from predatory boyhood fitting for heralds of that matured benevolence which embraces the world in its scope here speaking the consoling word and there dispensing comfort mingled with catnip tea in fancy we say the check apron homespun gown and all are but the stuff that dreams are made of there are vague reminiscences of things that have passed which we catch occasionally when Souchong has released the memory of Mrs. Partington from the overriding care for the world's welfare that would fain keep it home, and we roam back through scenes of her early life that breathe of rurality like a hayfield in June or a barnyard in the month of March. We have tales of apple parings and attendant scenes and suppers, of huskings full of incident and red ears, and resonant with notes the sweet import of which Mrs. Partington can well tell, in jolly quiltings, great with tattle and tea, and moonlight walks home with the laughter of mirth mingling with the song of the cricket in the hedge, or that of the monarch of the swamp singing his younglings to sleep in the distance, or the whippoorwill upon the bough, and stupendous candy pullings with their customary consequences to broad shirt collars and cheeks sweeter than molasses, and slides downhill on the ox sled runners in winter that the boys hauled up to the summit, disastrous at times to propriety and health, but full of a fun that looked at no result but its own enjoyment, the means a secondary consideration. And there gleams through this a ray that reveals early loves and dreams that had an existence for a time to be swallowed up eventually in admiration for that embodiment of war and peace, Paul Partington, whose flaming eye and sword upon an ensanguined muster-field won a regard that only ended in Beanville when the name of Trotter became merged in that of Partington. Tradition, which in this instance may be partly right, 
tells of rivalry for the possession of the bell of dog's bondage. We can conceive of rivalry among the men and envy among the women, of struggles on the one part to gain her favor, on the other part the struggle to lose it by provoking her hostility. Hostility? Herein might arise a question as to whether so gentle a being ever entertained hostility to anything. We should be false to our object, that of writing a true biography of Mrs. Partington, did we pretend that she was perfect. We would take this pen and ink stand, as well as they have served us in our need, and throw them in the grate before we would make any such assertion. But we must say that we never heard she had an enemy, and tradition, that grim old chap that has so many bad things to say about people, and so few that are good, never said a word about it. Doubtless many a rustic heart beat warm beneath a homespun coat of numberless years, and sighs redolent of feeling poured from beneath the rim of many an old bell-crowned hat of felt. But the meteor came, Paul swept the field, the heart of Ruth surrendered with discretion, and other people stood back. Great was this for dog's bondage. The sun rose on the brightest day of the year when it happened. The brook, that had frozen up previously, immediately thawed out. Two robins were seen looking round for places to build their nests, thinking it was spring, so mild was it. The lilac buds almost bursted in their anxiety to notice the occasion, and old farmers, as they talked to one another across dividing fences, spoke most sagaciously about the extraordinary spell of weather. As old Roger, Mrs. P.'s cousin, remarked when he heard the circumstance, "'It was a weather very like a lamb.' But as we were saying, schools were not so common at that time as now, and as there was none nearer the trotters than Huckleberry Lane in the upper parish, and as there was a quarrel between the upper and the lower parishes, old Trotter, who belonged with the lower, felt bound to stand by that section, though he knew nothing about the quarrel, and hence Ruth was kept at home to receive by the fireside the domestic accomplishments nowhere else to be learned and drink in the oracular wisdom of the venerable trotter as it fell from his lips through the aroma of pigtail tobacco and hard cider. Alas for trotter! His day is done, his pipe is out, his cider has gone, and even dog's bondage has become a name obsolete among the places of the earth, that town rejoicing now in the more euphonious title of Clover Hill, probably from the fact of there not being a leaf of clover within seven miles of it. And thou, Dame Trotter, famous for pastry and poultry, beneath whose ready skill thanksgiving became a carnival of fat things, whose memory yet lingers about the olden home, now in stranger hands, with the fragrance of innumerable virtues, like the spicy odor of many Christmas dinners, thou too art gone, and dog's bondage may know thee no more forever. The Reverend Andiram Smith, who preached her funeral sermon, drew largely upon the book of Proverbs for illustrations of her character, and said that better pumpkin pies or a better exhibition of grace he had never known any woman to make before. A kind heart has characterized Mrs. Partington from her childhood up, displayed in many ways. Her benevolence got far in advance of her grammar in her early days, and in her sayings at times are detected certain inaccuracies that some people are inclined to laugh at. But if they will stop a little and see the yellow kernels of wisdom gleaming out through the thickly surrounding verbiage, they will raise their hats in grateful respect for the bounty afforded. The domestic history of Mrs. Partington requires a nice pen to portray it. So full was it of delicate beauty and delightful incident. Marriage meant something in old times. It was no holiday affair, donned like a garment, to be regarded as worthless when the fashion changed. It grew out of no sickly sentiment that had its existence in the yellow fever of a wretched romance, as unlike true life as a cabbage is to a rose or the sear of autumn, a more fitting simile to the vernal spring. It was a healthy, hearty, happy old institution in those days, was matrimony, and people jogged along together in the harness of its duties as harmoniously as the right hand and the left that help each other and yet don't seem to know it so natural is the service rendered, as if they were born to it. And as the right hand or the right eye sympathizes with the left, so did the twain thus united sympathize. Duty and affection leaned upon each other, 
and inseparably strove to make the home hearth cheerful. It became pleasure to carry the sweet drink to the thirsty man in the field of mowing, or to bear the basket of luncheon to the woods, where the red-browed man was chopping wood for winter, or to patiently hold the light in the long winter evenings when the yokes were to be mended or the harness repaired. And it became pleasure when the good man went to town to stow his pockets with something nice for the wife at home, a new dress or a new apron, the remembrance of whose face would come to him when away and hasten his departure back. It was that remembrance which prompted the mare into an urgent trot on the last mile home, though she couldn't see the necessity for it, and his eye looked brighter when he saw the cheerful face at the window looking down the road and shook his whip at it as it smiled at him, as much as to say, Let me get near you and... and what? Ask the walls and the bureau in the corner and the buffet where the china was or the milk pans upon the dresser, what? No jars occurred in a home that owned such a pair. Can the right hand quarrel with the left? Can the left eye cast severe glances upon the right? The home where a true marriage exists is blessed, and the man who finds his domesticity cast in a mould such as we have described may be called happy in the fullest sense of the blissful word. It would have done all of us good to peep in upon fireside scenes at the Partington Mansion. The fireplace, with its wide and hospitable arms extended, looked like an incentive to population, having family capacity revealed in its huge dimensions. It was a brave idea of seat parting tone, and when he laid the cornerstone of the Beanville structure, he had visions of a posterity as numerous as the leaves of the sweetbriar bush that waved by his door. Alas, how were those visions verified, as a few generations saw the line of seek diminishing, to find its end at last, like the snap of a whiplash, in one little knot. But those scenes! It was the custom of the corporal, in the long nights of winter, to seat himself in the right corner of the old fireplace, while the dame occupied the other, and read, by the light of a mutton-tallow candle, such literature as the house afforded. This was comprised in the family Bible, an old and massive volume that adorned the black bureau under the glass, a copy of Army Tactics presented to Paul by a revolutionary soldier, and a copy of Dudley Levitt's Almanac. These were read by the light of mutton fat, aloud, while Mrs. Partington pursued her knitting in the corner, nodding at times, perhaps, as the theme was dull or familiar, but the smile always rewarded Paul's effort to amuse her, as much as if he hadn't read the same things over and over a thousand times. The small covered earthen pitcher kept time to his reading often, and sung and sputtered upon the coals between the old-fashioned dog and irons, as if a spirit were within, struggling to throw off the cover that restrained it and escape. Regularly, as the hand of the old bull's-eye watch on the nail over the mantelpiece denoted the hour of nine, was the book laid by, and the mug taken from the fire, and its steaming contents poured into the white earthen bowl upon the table, which sent up a vapour that rolled upon the dark walls like a fragrant cloud, and made the room redolent with the fume of the mulled cider that smoothed the pillow of Paul. It was pleasant, too, to have a neighbour come in at times and spend an evening, when the big dish of apples would be brought on, and the sparkling cider that snapped and foamed in an ambition to be drank, crowned the board. And then such stories as would be told of breakings out, and great trainings, and immense gunnings, in which exploits were achieved that my voracious pen would hardly dare recall. And the old Indian wars would be fought again by the light of tradition, and the above-named tallow candle, and the tales be retold of revolutionary valor that signalized itself in seventy-six. Perhaps a song would be sung commemorating old times, in the quaint melody that knew no artistic skill beyond nature's teaching. Mrs. Partington, as the presiding genius of these scenes, shed the radiance of her presence over the circle, as the sunflower claims eminence in a garden of marigolds. Her sage voice was heard in wise counsel, and in giving the news of who was sick, or dead, or about to be married, or wasn't about to be married, but ought to be. She was at home. The time we speak of was near the close of Paul's career, before the sad military reverse took place which broke his heart. It would be impossible, in the small space allotted to us, 
to describe all the virtues of Mrs. Partington. It were best to make an aggregate of good and call it all hers. The herbs that adorned the garret walls in innumerable paper bags were not gathered for herself. The balm of Gilead buds and rum that occupied their position in the buffet were not prepared for her, but at the first note of distress from a neighbor her aid was ever ready. She was the first who was sent for on important occasions when good wives must be wakened from their beds at midnight, and to this day half the population at Beanville speak of the benevolent face that bent over them in the first moments of their struggle with existence and gave them a better impression of life than after experience verified, and catnip tea and saffron became palatable when commended by a spoon held by her. She knew the age of every one in the village, and had politicians not rendered the word hackneyed, we would say she had the antecedents of every one at her fingers' ends. She was as good as an almanac for chronological dates, and in the matter of historical incidents, Dudley Levitt and Mrs. P. generally came out neck and neck. She had a great reverence for this same almanac, and we cannot refrain from speaking of an incident in connection with it. She put implicit faith in its predictions, and the weather table stood like a guide-board to direct her on her meteorological march through the year. One year, however, everything went wrong. Storms took place that were not mentioned, and those mentioned never occurred. The moon's phases were all out of joint, and the good dame sat up all one cold night to watch for an advertised eclipse that didn't come off. For a long time she tried to vindicate her favorite, but at last, when a windy day predicted proved as mild a one as ever the sun shone on, her faith wavered to be entirely overthrown by a cold northeasterly storm that had been set down for pleasant. A timely discovery that Ike had put a last year's almanac instead of the true one alone saved the credit of that mathematical standard of natural law. Her domestic virtues were of the most exalted kind. Cleanliness was with her a habit, and every windy day was sure to see Paul's regimentals upon a clothesline in the yard, dancing away with a levity altogether at variance with the rules of military propriety. A spider never dared to obtrude his presence upon the homestead. A moth never corrupted the sanctuary of woolen that her care and a little camphor had touched. The white floor of the Partingtonian kitchen was as full of knots as a map of New Hampshire is of hills, from frequent scourings, and though she never scoured through and fell into the cellar, like the Dutch damsel we read of, it did not seem at all improbable that such an event might happen. But her benevolence was the crowning characteristic of her life, developing itself in a thousand and more ways. It sought to make every one around her happy. She commenced taking snuff with an eye solely to its social tendencies, and her box was a continual offering to friendship. When the last war broke out, she headed a volunteer list of patriotic women to make shirts for the soldiers, and gave them encouragement and souchong tea to work for the brave men that were exposing themselves to peril. And she scraped Paul's only linen shirt, an heirloom, by the way, in the family, up into lint for the wounded soldiers. A fitting spouse was she for Corporal Paul. Her reputation for benevolence was spread all over the land, like butter upon a hot johnny-cake of her own baking, and her current wine for the sick got a premium for three successive years in the cattle fair. Alas, that we have not room to pursue the theme further. We must take a flying leap over many incidents and hasten on. When Paul's younger brother Peter, the Peter that went out west in his youth, whose wife joined the Mormons, died, he sent his little Isaac to the care of the widow of Paul, and from his earliest infancy he has been her care. She never had any children of her own, and her solicitude is earnestly engaged for him. He is as merry a boy as you will find any day, and though a little tricky and mischievous, the first beginning of malice doesn't abide with him. His tricks do not flow from any premeditation of fun, even, they spring spontaneously and naturally as the lambs skip or the birds sing. Whether he takes the bellows nose for a cannon or saws off the acorn on the tall old-fashioned chair for a top, it is all a matter of course, and his bright face knows no cloud when rebuked for what he has done, but he turns to new mischiefs with new zest. Such is Ike. He is now eleven years, just upon the dividing line between accountability and indulgence, 
beyond which boyish mischief becomes malice, to be trained by the magic of a leather strap. Professor Wideswarth, a member of the Partington family, like a remarkable case in the paper of long standing, has associated the two in a poem, which for sublimity is surpassed by Coleridge's hymn in the Valley of Shimuni, but then they are nothing alike, and parties may divide on their respective merits. One thing about the song, it is authentic in its details, as we have heard averred by the old lady herself. The music, set to a rocking chair movement, was very popular when it was first issued, and the editor of the Blaze, in a complimentary notice of it, said no musical library could be perfect without it. The poem we give below. Mrs. Partington at Tea Good Mistress P. sat sipping her tea, sipping it, sipping it, Isaac and she. What though the wind blew fiercely around, and the rain on the pane gave a comfortless sound, little cared she, kind Mistress P., as Isaac and she sat sipping their tea. And in memory what sights did she see as Isaac and she sat sipping their tea? She turned her gaze to the opposite wall where hung the portrait of Corporal Paul, and fancies free to Mistress P. arose in her mind like the steam of the tea. And little saw she, blind Mistress P., as silently she sat sipping her tea, with her eyes on the wall and her mind away, that Isaac was taking that time to play, and wicked was he to Mistress P. as dreamily she sat sipping her tea. For Isaac he, in diablerie, emptied her appy into her tea, and the old dame tasted and tasted on till she thought, good soul, that her taste was gone. For the souchong tea and the strong rap pea sorely puzzled the palate of Mistress P. This moral, you see, is drawn from the tea that Isaac had ruined for Mistress P. Forever will mix in the cup of our joy the dark rap of sorrow's alloy, and none are free any more than she from annoying alloys that mix with their tea. We have spoken before of the Partington Mansion having been removed to make way for the Beanville Railroad. It was taken after Paul's demise. He never would have parted with it thus. He would have fortified it and defended it while a charge of powder remained in the old powder horn that hung above the mantelpiece, or a billet of wood was left to hurl at assailants. But alas! Paul was not there, and his amiable relic opposed but feeble resistance to the encroachment of the new power. As she herself forcibly expressed it, what was the use of her trying to go again a railroad? It was hard for her to give up the old mansion, endeared by so many recollections, not a thousand merely, the number usually given as the poetical limit, but infinite in number, for they embraced all of the days of her wedded happiness and the companionship of the corporal. This sketch of the life of Mrs. Partington would be imperfect were we to omit giving a brief notice of the picture of the inestimable lady that stands as our frontispiece. We have long felt that an admiring public deserved a more definitive expression of her than could be gained from the mere words, however wise, that fell from her oracular lips. A sense of justice to her innumerable merits has impelled us to redeem her from the uncertainty of mere verbal delineation and here we have produced her the fair ideal of wise simplicity. It was with great difficulty that we secured this boon for the world. A modest diffidence that fifty-seven winters have not weakened made her unwilling that her likeness should be thus submitted to the unsparing gaze of thousands. In vain we urged many illustrious examples of like martyrdom, of men who, from pure philanthropy, had sacrificed themselves in the everlasting reproach of stereotype, from the never-souring old Jacob to the meek elder Barry, blessing the world with disinterested benevolence at a dollar a quart bottle, six bottles for five dollars. She was not to be moved by any argument we could offer, and we were about to abandon the idea in despair when the strategy of Isaac effected what diplomacy had failed to accomplish. Snugly ensconced in an old clothes press by Isaac for three days, our artist was enabled through the keyhole to watch the varied expression that flitted across her time-worn face, and his genius achieved its high triumph at the moment when Payne's gas had become the concentrated object of her thought, and oblivious to all external scene and circumstance, her mind was grappling that huge problem in a vain effort to get a little light upon the subject. 
This is the precise moment at which the artist has taken her, impaled her, so to speak, in view of its correctness on his pencil point, and transferred her, still quick with life, to the breathing paper. The faithfulness of this picture cannot be too much admired. We have at a glance the whole character of the old lady, in her blessed lineaments, with a benignity like a cup of sleeper's best ninyong, irradiating every feature. The cat border crowns like a halo the brow, upon whose lofty height benevolence sits enthroned. The lock of grey vibrates tremulously in the wintry air, the specks repose tranquilly in the abstractedness of meditation, the pinned kerchief in modest plates enfolds a breast whose every throb is kindly. The knitting work, the close attendant upon her loneliness, has its position, and the busy fingers in diligent competition ply the gleaming wires. The ancient chair, sacred to memory, the one that came over in the Mayflower, is presented in its puritanic uprightness, and at its back hangs the ridicule, in whose mysterious depths dwelleth many a rare antique, that the light of day hath not seen since the memorable fourteen. Upon the little pine table, white as snow from frequent inflictions of soap and sand, are seen that snuff-box and that teapot, the little black one, in the respective solaces of which the ills of life have found mitigation, and grief has been allayed of half its bitterness. The amelioration of Maccaboy relieving the woes of widowhood, and sorrow finding cessation neath the softening influence of Souchong. Above, upon the wall, hangs Paul's ancient profile in dark rigidity, like a soldier on parade, staring straight forward at nothing, the unbending integrity of whose dicky stands in marked contrast with the charcoal of his complexion. And long and often has that profile been scanned by fond eyes in vain effort to detect one line of the olden affection that warmed the original, or dwelt in the hard-spelt character of Paul's epistles, that well-worn and well-saved are yet treasured in the old black bureau-desk in the corner. And carefully the sprig of sweet fern is renewed above the picture every year when the berries lure Ike to the woods, and he comes back laden with pine and fern and hemlock, to garnish the fireplace and mantelpiece withal. That handkerchief has been preserved as a sacred relic since the corporal's battle days, when, in young devotion, he laid it, blazoned with the glory of the Constitution and Gary air upon her lap, and standing by her with his artillery sword gleaming in his hand, vowed by its edge that his love for her should divide with that for his country. The story has not been written of his deeds of arms, of his moving accidents by flood and field, and dangers in the imminent deadly breaches of his parades in the artillery, and his campaign dinner once a year. These remain to be written, and the biographer of Paul Partington shall set the world aglow with the recital of deeds that have been hid like the diamond in the ashes, but have lost no ray of brilliancy. It may, however, be well to give a few of these exploits as illustrative of the character of the person in whose heroism we may detect an influence the dates from dog's bondage, and nice discriminators may, by close scrutiny, see therein the fusion of the fiery blood of Seek the Kingdom Continually Parting Tum, the trumpeter of Oliver Cromwell, and the gentle outside current that met, mingled, and softened, the vini vidi vici of conjugal triumph, and formed no merely bloody warrior, but a hero, whose sword would be stained by nothing worse than the mark of cheese that crowned the board of war. When the news came in the last war that the British had landed on the coast, although nine miles from Beanville, his voice waked the people from their slumbers, calling them to arms. It was his plume that was seen gleaming in the light of the stars, as he dashed through the town on horseback, urging his steed on through the mud at the rate of five miles an hour. It was his warlike skill that arranged the eleven men of Beanville into a phalanx of attack and it was his eloquence that called upon them as husbands, fathers, patriots, and Christians to fight and die like men. When afterwards it was discovered that all the alarm arose from seeing two men in their boats drawing lobster nets, the merit of valor did not depart from Paul Partington, and though he never got the brevet as sergeant promised him by the general of division, yet the people honored him, 
and the Battle of the Bloody Leaven, as they were called, formed a theme for gossip in the tavern at Beanville for many a day. When the call came for volunteers to throw up fortifications in Boston Harbor, he was the first man to enroll his name. His pickaxe struck the first blow for his country in this service. His use of the spade rendered his advice invaluable to the commanding officer, and he could tell to a fraction how many shovels full to take from one portion, and how many wheelbarrow loads to put in another. His overalls were in the front of the fight. His arm was fearlessly bared in the encounter. But alas for his country, he got a grain of gravel in his eye and had to go home after exhorting his comrades in arms to dig on and giving his overalls to one who needed them. He was afterwards pensioned for his injury, having been very favorably mentioned in the orders of the day. But in the muster field was his greatest triumph. The smell of gunpowder he snuffed like the war steed from afar. In the intricacies of sham fight he was at home. He was always selected to lead the forlorn hope in an attack, and his compressed lips and flashing eyes were precursors of victory. It became a standing rule that he must beat, but when the mad sergeant from the city who commanded the point to be attacked wouldn't give in and charged home upon the corporal, driving him back at the point of the bayonet, whereby he lost three of his men and his credit in a bog through which they were compelled to pass, the star of the corporal waned. His martial spirit departed from that hour. Even though a court-martial was ordered at once, and the sergeant ordered to be shot, which fate was only avoided by his speedy departure from Beanville, it was of no avail. The careful nursing of Ruth availed nothing. He took to his bed, had his artillery sword and cap hung upon a nail where he could see them, and lay down to die. The skill of the country doctor with a pair of saddle-bags filled with medicine, and the whole pharmacopoeia of Mrs. P. couldn't save him, and after making his will like a prudent citizen and a good soldier, he bade the world good night, and Paul was not. No sound can awake him to glory again. He was buried with military honors by the Beanville Artillery, who for twenty years voted annually to erect a monument to his memory, and then gave it up. The poet of the village, in anticipation of the monument, had prepared an epitaph, which we subjoin. Here lies, beneath this heap of earth, a hero of extensive worth, a whole-souled man, full six feet tall, surnamed Partington, christened Paul. The parish burying ground in Beanville, a sketch of which is here subjoined, is situated in the bend of the turnpike leading from Clover Hill, and it is a shrine much visited in the summer months by terriers at the village, for all that was Paul Partington rests beneath the turf with naught but a tall sweet briar to mark the spot, standing like a sentinel on duty, armed at all points, and watching the slumber of the hero of the bloody leaven. The picture was taken by a travelling artist while riding over the turnpike on the stage-coach, who was so struck with the picturesque beauty of the scene that he made an eight miles an hour sketch of it in his portfolio. It is to this spot, on each returning season, that Mrs. Partington comes, by virtue of a free pass allowed her by the Beanville Branch Railroad, and brings Isaac, and praises the ancient corporal's virtues, and tries to incite the boy's ambition to be like him, and he likes to come, for, while he is drinking in the words which Mrs. Partington imparts, he can watch the chipmunks on the decaying wall, and slyly shy stones at birds whose confidence leads them to approach the spot, and twitter upon the mullein stalks that grow rankly by the gate. We say naught but a sweet briar tree marks the spot. The old gravestone, with its hard-faced remembrance of Paul, has been carried off in relics by modern vandals. Chip by chip has the ancient monument disappeared, that affection paid for to the city stone-cutter and placed here until not a scrap of it is left. The ancient stone of blue slate, with its jolly death's head, that appeared as if quick with mirth, the winged chubby cherubs in the corners that looked like babies living in uncomfortable fat, like doughnuts, the simple inscription in Roman characters commemorative of the Roman virtues of Paul, and the quaint epitaph that told, in equivocal English, of a future hope, all have been chipped off. But thanks to art that can restore the lost and create that which never existed, that monument is before us for our admiration. 
How many shocks of elemental war has that antiquated block of monumental sculpture withstood successfully? Standing, despite the snow and frost of winter, or the tornadoes of summer, to be carried off piece by piece in the pockets of encroaching pilgrims. But there is a glory in the idea of a gravestone's being used up in breastpins to be more choicely cherished than the richest rubies. There were melancholy days in the Partingtonian mansion when Paul stepped out. The old chair stood by the right side of the fireplace, as if waiting to be occupied. The mug simmered in the winter evenings between the andirons with a mournful measure, as if responsive to the wind that made a muss and hurly-burly about the chimney-top, but only one now partook of its contents. The regimentals were aired upon the clothesline, and inflated with wind seemed at times like the corporal himself, cut up in parcels, who was, alas, to fill them no more. The settling of the estate broke in upon this dull and monotonous existence, and in the excitement of the law she forgot the sorrow that, as she said, made her nothing but flesh, skin, and bones. The remark she made concerning probate offices is recorded as a living evidence of her sagacity. Someone spoke to her about the probate proceedings regarding the estate. Yes, said she, it is probit, probit all the time, and if the poor widowless body gets the whole, she don't get half enough. The remark, likewise, about doing things by attorney will be remembered until it is forgotten. Don't do anything by power of eternity, said she, for if you do, you will never see the end of it. What profundity! But the estate was settled after much delay, and the farm carried on at the halves by a neighbor whose honesty was no security against the temptation of plethoric crops and opportunity. The hay fell off in the accounts, the recorded corn denoted a speedy famine, and a more disastrous havoc of potato rot has never since transpired than assailed her crops. But this state of things came to an end instead of the farm as was threatened. The march of improvement led to the need of a railroad through Beanville, and the Partingtonian mansion became a sacrifice to the ruthless spirit of progress that all grasping stops not at anything in its path, whether it be a homestead or a hemisphere. Mrs. Partington left Beanville reluctantly. As she herself has said, it was useless to try to stand against a railroad, and the city offering inducements in the way of education for Isaac, the legacy left her by the brother of Paul, she anchored her bark in the municipal haven, where her benevolence of act, intention, and sentiment has been spread broadcast, and many a smile has grown out of her lines that have been cast in pleasant places. There is a mystery thrown about the brother of Paul that we cannot unravel. All that is known of him is that he was a pioneer in Western civilization, was wounded in the Black Hawk War, and died on his way to Beanville, forwarding Isaac and a black silk handkerchief of boys' clothes by stage to their destination. But in Isaac is centered the affection that shed its rays about her early years, and in him she sees the nucleus of a Partingtonian progeny that shall appease the spirit of Seek the Kingdom Partington, if it be knocking round amid sublunar scenes. She takes every occasion to describe his exalted origin. On a recent occasion, while in the street with Isaac, a citizen soldier, in all the pride of regulation uniform, passed them. See, said the boy with animation, does that look like Uncle Paul? She looked at him, half offended. No, said she, with pride in her expression. He is no more like your uncle than Hyperion fluid is like a satire. There was Shakespeare and dignity in the remark, and Isaac turned with emotion to look at the picture of a monkey in a window, tempting a chained dog by holding his tail within an inch of the canine nose. Speaking of the monkey's tail reminds us that we are nearly to the end of our tale about Mrs. Partington. We at the first thought of getting an autobiography of the old lady, which would have greatly enhanced the interest of the book, and had asked her to give us something of this kind, but one afternoon, as we were revolving some stupendous idea, the Nebraska Bill, maybe, or the Gadsden Treaty, or Mr. Marcy's letter, with our feet in slippers a foot or two above our head, and puffing one of those choice habanos that the importer had sent in, we felt a finger on our shoulder. "'Get out, woman!' we cried, somewhat tartly. "'There's nothing for you. Heaven help us. We thought it was the woman with the rummy breath that had haunted us for days. The touch was repeated, 
and looking around to frown down the intruder, the mild gaze of Mrs. Partington was bent upon us. The chair from the other room was brought in. "'So you thought it was the beggar woman, did you?' said she. "'Well, suppose it had have been. Couldn't you have given her a soft word if you hadn't any money? Was there anything harmonious in her asking you for a penny? We felt rebuked. But, continued she smilingly, I have come to say about the writing matter that it will do just as well if you write it for me. Generally, I suppose, a naughty biography is better if it is writ by one's self. But I can trust you to do me justice. What a privilege! Macaulay says somewhere that Boswell was the only true biographer that ever wrote. "'By the star that is now before us,' we ejaculated, looking at Mrs. Partington, "'he shall yet confess that another has been found, and Bozzy's glories be shared with us.' Mrs. Partington smiled at our enthusiasm, and passed out of the door and down the stairs, and waved an adieu to us a moment afterwards from the steps of an omnibus that was to take her home. We have thus given the life of Mrs. Partington with her antecedents and co-associates. It is a desultory story, unlike, perhaps, anything you have seen before, dear reader. Try to fancy its oddity a reason for praise. Remember the dull and hackneyed path of common biographers, and remember, too, that this is the biography of no common person, but that of Mrs. Partington, a name not born to die. Perhaps you may recognize in the oddity of the sketch a gleam of the eccentricity that has marked her sayings. In the hope that he has pleased you, the biographer places his hand on his heart and bows as the curtain descends to slow music. End of Section 1 Section 2 Mild Weather This is grand weather, Mem, for poor people said Mr. Tigg, the rich neighbor of Mrs. Partington, on a very warm day of winter, and indulged in a half-chuckle about it as he rubbed his hands together. It is a remark that almost everybody would make, and mean it, too, at a time when coal, by the rapacity of man, was eight or nine dollars a ton, and cold weather, by the blessing of heaven, that tempers the wind to the shorn lambs and ragged children, was withheld. But not Mrs. Partington." Yes, said she, gently laying her hand at the same time on the sleeve of Mr. Tigg's coat and looking him in the face. Yes, and don't folks use this good weather too much as an excuse for not helping the indignant widows and orphanless children? Depend upon it, cold weather is the best for the poor, for then the rich feel the cold and think more of em and feel more exposed to give em consolation in coal. Cold weather comes down from heaven a purpose to make men feel their duty and it touches the heart as the frost touches the milk pitcher and breaks it, and the milk of humane kindness runs out, and the poor are made better for it. Cold weather is a blessing to the poor, depend upon it. She stopped here, and Mr. Tigg cast his eyes down and struck his cane several times against the brick at his feet. Then, bidding the old lady good morning, he moved away. There was a large doctor to sundries on his book that night, which the bookkeeper will find it difficult to explain, but heaven knows all about it, and the secret gift in charity, and the prayer of the poor recipient, invoking blessings on the unknown benefactor, were great records that night in the angel's book. The China Question You never see such chainy nowhere now as this, said Mrs. Partington, as she took from an obscure corner of the old cupboard a teapot of antique appearance, noseless and handleless, and cracked here and there, and stayed with putty where time's mischievous fingers had threatened a dissolution of the union. That teapot was my grandmother's afore she was married. I remember it just as well as it was yesterday. Remember when your grandmother was married? queried Ike. No, no, the teapot, responded she. And it was a perfect beauty, with the Garden of Eden on it, and the flowers, and Adam and Eve on it, so natural that you might almost smell their fragrance. What? "'Smell Adam and Eve?' said Ike. "'No, the flowers, stupid,' replied she. "'My grandther gave it to her as a memento mori of his undying infection, "'because the colours wouldn't fade, and they never have, "'though children are destroying angels, "'and they made the mischief among the crockery, as they always do nowadays.' "'She had held the teapot in her hands as she spoke, "'and now she gazed in silence upon the picture of Adam and Eve, "'partially concealed in the bushes,' and she reveled in the memory of the past, and wondered if her grandmother ever came back to look at that old teapot, 
that she had preserved so carefully as an heirloom. Then, carefully brushing off some dust that rested upon it, she replaced it, and charged Ike impressively to keep it most sacrilegiously for her sake. He said he would, as plain as his mouth full of preserved plums would let him, and wiped his mouth on the sleeve of his best jacket. Sympathy. "'Here's fresh halibut!' cried the fish vendor beneath Mrs. Partington's window. "'I know it is, you poor creeter,' said the estimable lady, looking after him with a commiserating expression. "'I know it is, and I believe it is the seventh fresh haul about that he has made by here to-day, and he speaks so pitiful, too, when he is telling us of it, it makes my very heart ache for him.' She caught not the deep significance of the cry, but her benevolence, always on the alert, construed it into an appeal for sympathy. Heaven's blessings on thee, Mrs. Partington, and, with reverence, be it wished, where hearts are regarded, may you turn up a trump. Paul's Ghost It was just in the nigh edge of a summer evening, and Mrs. Partington, who had worked hard at her knitting all day, began to feel a little dozy. She felt, as she described it to her neighbour, Mrs. Battlegash, a sort of all-overness. And those who have felt as she thus described it will know the precise sensation. For ourselves, never having felt so, we cannot explain it. It was a sort of half-twilight, when the daylight begins to be thick and muddy, and a time when ghosts are said to be round fully as plenty as at the classic hour of midnight. We never could see the propriety of restricting ghostly operations to this sombre hour, and as far as our experience goes, we have seen as many ghosts at noon of day as at the noon of night. She never told us why or if she were thinking of ghosts at this time. Indeed, all we know about the ghost was from Mrs. Battlegash, and we shall have to give the narration as we had it under Mrs. B.'s own hand. Says Mrs. Partington, says she, Mrs. Battle, she always calls me Battle, though my name is Battlegash, my husband's name it is father's, says she, Mrs. Battle, I've seen an apprehension. And I thought she was a-going to have an asterisk. She was so very pale and haggard-like. And says I, what's the matter? For I felt kind of scared. I had heard a good deal about the spirituous manifestations, and didn't know but they had been a-manifesting her. Says I, what's the matter? Again. And then, says she, as solemn as a graveyard, I've seen Paul. I felt cold chills a-crawling all over me, but I mustered courage enough to say, Do tell. Yes, says she, I saw him with my mortal eyes, just as he looked when he was a tenement of clay, with the very soldier clothes and impertinences he had on the last day he served his country in the auxiliary. I tried to comfort the poor creature by telling her that I guessed he didn't care enough about her to want to come back, and as his estate had all been settled sacrilegiously, it would be very unreasonable indeed in him to come back to disturb her. "'Where did you see him?' says I. "'Out into the yard,' said she. "'When did you see him?' says I. "'Just now,' said she. "'Are you sure it was he?' said I, determined to get at the bottom of it. "'Yes,' said she. "'If ever an apprehension did come back, that air was one. "'Perhaps it is there now. "'Then,' says I, Ruth, says I, "'let's go and see.' "'She riz right up, and we walked along through the long entry into her room, and looked out of her back window, and there, sure enough, was a sight as froze my blood to calves foot jelly. There was the soldier cap and coat, as natural as life with a tompy and a top. My heart come up into my mouth, so that I could have spit it out just as easy as not. Mrs. Partington, says she, what do you think of it? Isn't it his apprehension? But I'm determined to speak to it. I tried to persuade her not to, but she insisted on it, and out she went. Paul, said she, what upon earth do you want that you should come back arter it so apprehensively? The figure was setting on the top of the pump when she spoke, and it didn't take no notice of her. Paul, said she, a little louder. Then slowly and solemnly that air cap turned round, and instead of Paul, Mr. Editor, if you'll believe it, it was Ike, the little scapegrace, that had frightened us almost out of our wits, if we ever had any. That boy, I believe, will be the means of somebody's death. Mrs. Partington grew very red in the face, and raised her hand to inflict corporal punishment on to the young corporal, but the boy looked up kind of pleasantly like, and she couldn't find the heart to strike him, though I told her if she spared the rod she would spile that air child. It is fortnight for him that he isn't a child of mine, I can tell him. Here Mrs. Battlegash's narrative ends. 
We can fancy the scene in the yard, the youngster in the corporal's coat, the red face changing to pleasant equanimity, the raised hand indicative of temper subsiding as the waves do when the wind ceases to blow, and peace like the evening star above them pervading and giving grace to the tableau. Ike so tender-hearted. "'There, don't take on so, dear,' said Mrs. Partington, as she handed Ike a peach he had been crying for. He took the peach, and a minute afterwards was heard whistling Jordan on the ridge-pole of the shed. "'He is such a tender-hearted critter,' said she to Mrs. Sled, smilingly, while that excellent neighbor looked at him through the window with two deprecatory eyes. "'He is so tender-hearted that I can't ask him to go out and draw an armful of wood or split a pail of water without setting him crying at once. She paused for Mrs. Sled's mind to comprehend the whole force of the remark concerning Ike's lachrymosity. And he's the most considerable boy, too, resumed she, that ever you see, for when we had the inclination on the lungs, he wouldn't take a bit of the medicine Dr. Bolus had subscribed, cause he knowed it would do me good, and said he'd full as leaves take molasses. She went on with her knitting, and Ike became lost in the foot of a stocking that she was towing out. Those grapes on the trellis opposite, where Ike is sitting, look tempting. Mrs. Partington says there must be some sort of kin between poets and pullets, for they both are always chanting their lays. Look up. Perhaps it would not make a rap's difference one way or the other in a man's fortunes, whether he looked up or down, but we always fancied that there was a reason for the superstition that made a man's habit of looking down an augury of his success in life, as if his mind, dwelling with his eyes continually on the earth, would better enable him to know how to make money, as a man who dwells in the dark can see better in the accustomed darkness than one who comes directly in from the light. He keeps his eyes on the ground, and no stray fourpences or cents escape his eagle vision. Every rag is marked to see if it may not be a bill in disguise, and the hope to find a pocket-book or two while passing along the street seems to be continually present in his mind. His eyes grow heavy with looking down, and when at last there is no longer occasion to look down, when he has found all the fourpences and pocket-books that he has sought for, then the light is painful to him, and he turns to the earth again before he is dead. Habit makes it his only happiness, and he goes to seeking for pocket-books and fourpences again. If this be the result of looking down, the result of looking up must be, we should suppose, the opposite of this. Lifting the eyes above the world brings one to view things far better than fourpences. As much difference between them as the difference between a star of the first magnitude and a gold dollar. The eyelids turned up, the sunlight streams down upon the mind, and prepares therein a soil for the reception of good seed that shall grow up and bear fruit. Look up! Whoever thinks of groping about the foundations of Bunker Hill Monument when there are so many pleasures of vision to be gained by climbing to its summit? The higher the look or climb, the broader the view from the lofty position one gains. The most beautiful and delicate work of a structure is placed at the top. The fruit that is sweetest is always the nearest the sun. These are facts that belong to everyday life, to say nothing of that spiritual looking up required to give light to the soul, a commodity which some few people possess and seem desirous of benefiting. But don't, in looking up, lose all memory of earth, for you can't drop your body as you can your coat with your wish and soar off on the wings of the spirit. When you look up, keep part of an eye directed to earth, and avoid the coal-holes and cellar-ways that are open for your unwary feet. A too deep absorption in things above the earth may make the star-gazer conscious of a pain in the back from a too sudden contact with the cold, cold ground, as we saw a printer served on a cold morning, the whether he was heaven-seeking is questionable, and who looked very simple as he gathered himself up after the prostration. Let the upward look characterize us all, with the eye to accidents mentioned above, and secure for us a name for aspiring above the groveling things of the world, and five of us out of six may be deserving of it. Look up. A solemn fact. Your plants are most flagrantly odious, said Mrs. Partington, as she stooped over a small oval red table in a neighbor's house, which table was covered with cracked pots, filled with luxuriant geraniums, and a monthly rose, and a cactus, and other bright creations that shed their sweetness upon the almost tropical atmosphere of a southerly room in April, while a fragrant vine hung in chains, 
graced the window with a curtain more gorgeous than any other not exactly like it. Mrs. Partington stood gazing upon them in admiration. "'How beautiful they are!' she continued. "'Do you profligate your plants by slips, mem?' She was told that such was the case. They were propagated by slips. "'So was mine,' said Mrs. P. "'I was always more lucky with my slips than with anything else.' "'Bless the kind old heart, Mrs. Partington. "'It may be so with you, but it is not so with all. "'For the way of the world is hard, and many slips are made, "'and for the unfortunates whose feet or tongues slip on the treacherous path, "'a sentence generally awaits which admits small chance of reversal, "'a soiled coat or a soiled character sticking to them until both are worn out. "'Dear old lady, your humble chronicler remembers that many of the young and beautiful are profligated by slips, slips so gradual that propriety could hardly call them such at first, which end heaven and earth and perdition know how deep. New Remedy for a Drought Mrs. Partington was in the country one August, and for a whole month not one drop of rain had fallen. One day she was slowly walking along the road with her umbrella over her head, when an old man, who was mending up a little gap of wall, accosted her, at the same time depositing a large stone on the top of the pile. "'Mrs. Partington, what do you think can help this ear drought?' The old lady looked at him through her spectacles, at the same time smelling a fern leaf. "'I think,' said she, in a tone of oracular wisdom, "'I think a little rain would help it as much as anything.' It was a great thought." The old gentleman took off his straw hat and wiped his head with his cotton handkerchief, at the same time saying that he thought so too. Hear that voice. Did the reader ever know a man grown and big at that, with a very small voice that almost squealed in uttering itself, and gave a most ridiculous aspect to what was perhaps of great importance, as matters of life and death, the reading of a will, an exhortation to virtue, or an anxious inquiry concerning the health of friends? Of course he has, for there are many such voices about. An agent of a large manufacturing establishment in New Hampshire possessed this peculiarity of voice to a remarkable degree, which once was the cause of a most mortifying and ludicrous mistake. A man came to the factory to get employment, a great burly fellow with a voice like young thunder, and saluted the agent, who was a small man, by the way, with the question, "'Do you want to hire?' in a tone that seemed to shake the room in which they stood. Starting at the sound, and with a face expressive of nervous irritability, he drawled out in his squeaking, querulous manner, as if looking at each word before he uttered it, "'No, I don't know as I do.' The man, not understanding his peculiarity, attributed the strange tones to another cause, and kindly extending his huge hand, as one might suppose a friendly bear would, under like circumstances, patted the little agent on the head, and soothingly uttered, "'Well, well, my little fellow, don't cry about it. Don't take on so if you can't hire me.' The contact of crude humanity with his delicate head operated as magically upon the agent as did the touch of Captain Cuddle's hook upon the refined flesh of Dombey, and frightful was the yell with which he met the mechanic's sympathy in a command to leave the room, and awfully vehement was the manner in which he slammed the door to as a good-humoured fellow passed into the street. Mrs. Partington penned. A friend, returned from a visit to New York, presented to Mrs. Partington a gold pen which had been entrusted to him for her. The present was duly examined and admired, and turned round and pulled out, and held up to the light, and the receipt for pew-rent was brought out from the black bureau on the back of which to test its quality, and she made a straight mark to the right, and then crossed it with another straight mark of equal length, and then said it was charming. "'But who are they?' said she, speculatively. "'I don't know them, I'm sure.' The friend blandly explained that they knew her very well, and that this present was a tribute of regard for her many virtues, which, like the odour of ten thousand flowers, is borne across the entire land. The giver was eloquent, touching. Ah, said she, it is very kind to remember a poor widowless body like me. What friends I have got! I hope that heaven will be rewarded for their kindness to me. It was a fervent aspiration, and though the letter of her prayer might seem to divert the reward from its true object, 
Still, its spirit conferred it rightly. She opened the old black bureau desk in the corner and placed the gold pen carefully by the side of the paste shoe buckles and hoop earrings, valuable relics of bygone times, and then securely locked the desk as she saw Ike looking curiously into the window with his nose flattened close against the glass. The Soda Fountain "'There it goes again!' said Mrs. Partington, as she became conscious of the sublimity of a soda fountain one warm day. "'There it goes again, I declare, fizzing away like a blessed old locomo on the railroad. "'Don't say anything about Nigeri now. "'That isn't nothing in comparison to this. "'And it ain't a bad beer, nother. "'But how in nature they can draw so many kinds out of one faucet, "'that's the wonderment to me.' and she readjusted her specs and took a new survey of the mystery, while Ike, unwatched, was weighing his knife and five jackstones in the bright brass scale on the other counter. Giving Reasons The various reasons which some folks always have ready for their accidents and misfortunes, or as palliatives for their faults and follies, are very amusing. Many stories are told of such. One, we remember, of a boy who had played truant, and gave, as the reason for his absence, that his father kept him at home to help grind the handsaw. A toper, accounting for a bad cold he had, said he had slept on the common and forgot to shut the gate. Another stoker, who was found in the gutter with the water making a free passage over him, when asked how he came there, replied that he had agreed to meet a man there. In our printing office days, when we had to work for a living, it was our luck to work with a queer old fellow who bore the name of Smith or some such odd title. He was a very unhappy man and never smiled unless he had the whole office in a snarl and then he would chuckle right gladly. He was always fancying that his office mates were imposing upon him and a perfect flood of bile would he throw off at times for imagined wrongs. His position was by a window fronting the east and over this window he claimed absolute dominion to shut it up or have it open as he just pleased, maugre the fretting of those who were annoyed by his obstinacy. He assumed the office of a thermometer for the men and graduated the heat according to his own feelings. If the wind was east, he would as surely have the window open as that he would have it shut if it blew pleasantly from the west. One day, with the wind blew east, the window was open all day, and much audible complaint was made by all hands, but without any effect. It was with a feeling nearly akin to exultation they saw him enter the office next day with indubitable signs of having a cold upon him. His nose looked red and raw, and his voice sounded as if he had two tight-fitting cork stoppers in his nostrils. The window that day was not opened, you may depend." One of the men undertook to remind him that his cold was in consequence of the wind blowing upon him. "'Go it ate, said Smith. "'But I hung my hat up by the winder, and last night, when I put it on, it was brim full of east wind. A small trade. "'Cold day, Mr. Smith,' said old Roger, in the dock square omnibus, to his neighbor, who assented very politely. "'And yet,' continued Roger, "'Cold as it is, I have just seen a man in State Street who does not wear gloves.' "'Ah!' responded Smith, struck with the singularity of the statement. "'Why not, pray?' "'Why,' chuckled the old man, "'because he hasn't any hands.' Mr. Smith smiled. "'On locomotion. "'So they've got you on the stage, Mrs. Partington,' said we to the old lady, "'after seeing her name on a theatre bill as one of the characters in a new burletta. "'On the stage?' replied she, and a gleam of memory passed over her face, like a ray of sunshine over a faded landscape, and she looked out of the window and down the street, until her eye rested on an omnibus moving quickly along in the pride of paint and gold, and she took passage in it in fancy, and went along with it. Yes, said she, they did get me on the stage, because it caused a nonsense in my stomach to ride inside, and what a queer figure I did make on it, to be sure." "'But that, dear, was five and twenty years ago, "'and it is so queer they should remember it. "'Oh, them stages! "'I've heard of people riding by easy stages, "'but I never saw one. "'The easiest way that I ever rid "'was on a pillory behind Paul there. "'Easy stages, indeed. "'Why, it shook me as if it would shake "'the sensuality all out of me, "'and I never got over it for a week. "'How different it is now!' "'And she looked at the omnibus just passing her door. "'All you've to do is to get into an ominous.' 
all cushioned nicely with a whole picture gallery round it to see for nothing, and afore you know it, you are where you want to go. Stages, but it is the national stage, we said. Well, well, replied she hastily, tain't no difference. Only the national stage carried the mail, and t'other the female passengers. One was just as bad as t'other, and I don't know but worse. But they've got you in the theatre, the national theatre, we persisted, and showed her the bill. She looked at it a moment, and wiped her specks, and looked at it again in silence, as if her mind hadn't got back from the hard journey it had just taken. At that moment a crash of glass called her hastily to the kitchen. The floor was covered with fragments of that brittle article, and a large ball hopped under a chair, as if ashamed of itself, while Ike was seen through the broken window, making tracks speedily for the shed. We left her picking up the glass, so that he might not get it into his bare feet when he came in. Depend upon it, he had to take a severe talking to when she caught him. The largest liberty. Now go to meeting, dear, said Mrs. Partington, as Isaac stood smoothing his hair preparatory to going out on Sunday. He looked down at his new shoes, and a thought of the green fields made him sigh. A fishing line hung out of one pocket, which Mrs. Partington didn't see. "'Where shall I go to?' asked Ike. Since the old lady had given up her seat in the old North Church, she had no stated place of worship. "'Go,' replied she sublimely, as she pulled down his jacket behind. "'Go anywheres where the gospel is dispensed with. "'Such liberality is rare. "'Bigotry finds no place in her composition, "'and the truth in her view throws its light "'into every apartment of the Christian edifice, "'like an oysterman's chandelier into his many booths. "'The simile is not the very best, "'but the best to be had at present. "'Mrs. Partington in court. "'I took my knitting work and went up into the gallery,' "'said Mrs. Partington.' the day after visiting one of the city courts. I went up into the gallery, and after I had digested my specs, I looked down into the room, but I couldn't see any courting going on. An old gentleman seemed to be asking a good many impertinent questions, just like some old folks, and people were sitting round making minuets of the conversation. I don't see how they made out what was said, for they all told different stories. How much easier it would be to get along if they were all made to tell the same story. What a sight of trouble it would save the lawyers. The case, as they called it, was given to the jury, but I couldn't see it, and a gentleman with a long pole was made to swear that he'd keep an eye on them and see that they didn't run away with it. By and by, in they come again, and then they said somebody was guilty of something, who had just said he was innocent and didn't know nothing about it, no more than the little baby that never had subsistence. I come away soon afterwards, but I couldn't help thinking how trying it must be to sit there all day, shut out from the blessed air. This experience is a beautiful exhibit of judicial life. True enough, Mrs. Partington, how easy might be the determining of cases were but one side of the story told. But alas, for perplexed jurymen, there are unfortunately two sides, and the brain is racked to judge between them. Conscience holding the light tremblingly, lest honor be compromised, and mercy pointing with raised finger to its fountain, as if endeavouring to draw attention from justice, who stands sword in hand to urge her claim to well and truly try, is the solemn duty fastened by an oath, and the commonwealth reposes in blessed security upon the broad responsibility of twelve honest men. God save the commonwealth. End of section 2 Section 3 right and left there never was a time when the divine right of kings could be better shown said old roger emphasizing the word right significantly why asked the little man from the provinces looking up because replied he there will soon be none of them left an audible phew whistled along the table and one distinct knock from each border denoted equivocal approbation the dessert was dispensed with a little truth well put. So you've come down to attend the adversary meetings, said Mrs. Partington as she surveyed the three trunks and two valises and a basket that the cab had just left and the owner of them all, a gentleman in black with a ghostly-looking neckcloth. Ah, said he, humoring her conceit and smiling, for he expected to stay some days. The adversary we meet, we subdue with the weapons of the spirit. 
That is just what dear Deacon Spriggs said when he captivated the crazy engine with New England rum and then put him in bridle. Says he, else of do him with the sword of the spirit. He was such a queer man. These meetings are excellent for converting heathens and saving the lost, and I do hope, after they have saved everybody else, that they will try and save a few more of their own that need teaching. There is a great many round here that want looking after more than the heathen do, and we must look after our own first, or be worse than the infidels. A pair of yarn stockings and a box of butter stopped her mouth for the time, and the old silver spoons marked P.P. and the antique china were brought out, articles that were only used on state occasions. Musical Criticism "'How did you like the concert?' asked Frank of Mrs. Partington at the oratorio. "'Very much indeed,' said she. "'I liked everything about the Ontario but the consecutives. "'The corrosives I thought were sublimated, "'but the consecutives I thought was dreadfully out of tune.' "'Frank explained to her the object of the recitative "'and smiled a little at the queer mistake "'she had made in musical terms. "'Bless thee, Mrs. Partington. "'Thy genius in its extravagance "'is never retarded by terms. "'Life on the Road "'One summer, during the very hot weather, "'our Ellen, whose life could number seventeen happy summers "'and nearly the same number of winters, "'took it into her little roguish head "'that she would like to go to Hampton Beach.' and when such a whim had once got into her head, the question might well be asked how could it be got out. It would be hopeless to attempt it, provided any one were so inclined. But no one said a word, and Ellen did go. She and her little friend Charlotte, who was on a visit to Ellen, started for the beach with lots of precautions and doughnuts from Ellen's mother, for there is not a better soul between here and Great Hill than that same mother of Ellen's. The horse and the wagon, bearing its charming freight of two pretty girls, moved swiftly and safely over the road to the beach, and many a musical echo reverberated through the woods and along the meadows and by the hillsides and from the hilltops as they passed along. The day was very pleasantly spent by the seashore, and, when wearied with rambling over the fine smooth beach and sporting in the breakers like naiads, they started on their return home, with hearts as light and eyes as bright as when they set out in the morning. Their horse was a spirited animal, which could ill brook a whip, and was also emulative to a great degree in competing with other horses for mastery on the road. In fact, he would allow no horse to go by him, and made it a matter of principle, if horses are ever governed by principle, to go by all on the road. They had got perhaps halfway home, when they overtook an oldish sort of a man who was driving a fast horse. Billy, Ellen's horse, stuck up his ears and put her with an evident determination of going by. The old un stirred his beast up to the strife, and away they went, over the road as swift as the swallows, neither having the advantage. Ellen laughed at the sport, and held the ribbons with the tact of a veteran yehu. The contest was soon decided, for the old chap raised his whip and slightly touched Billy with the lash. Billy impetuously kicked at the insult, but darted like lightning along the road, distancing his competitor in a twinkling. The old man was seen no more by the victors, but over the road they still flew, Billy heeding neither rain nor word. The remembrance of the insult put him to his speed, and he dashed along with terrific velocity. Men rushed out and threw up their hands and cried, "Whoa!" Women screamed and prophesied woe to them. Dogs barked as they skimmed along. But no fear was felt by our Ellen in her peril. Her pulse was quick with the excitement, but no fear mingled with it. Her cheek was red as the rose, and her eyes laughed as her ringing voice told the people to get out of the way. She wound the ribbons round her hands, and to keep the middle of the road was her only care. "'Bravo, Ellen, bravo!' and the brave heart and strong arm gave her the victory. A two-mile heat, the quickest ever ran in our county, stands recorded to her fame. This isn't much of a story, but it shows what a true woman can do and should do in an emergency. It will not do for Ellen's husband to treat her badly, we can tell him when he gets her. His bones wouldn't be entirely safe. Fancy Diseases Diseases is very various, said Mrs. Partington, as she returned from a street-door conversation with Dr. Bolus. 
The doctor tells me that poor old Mrs. Hayes has got two buckles on her lungs. It is dreadful to think of, I declare. The diseases is so various. One way we hear of people's dying of hermitage of the lungs, another way of the brown creatures. Here they tell us of the elementary canal being out of order, and there about tonsors of the throat. Here we hear of neurology in the head, there of an embargo. One side of us we hear of men being killed by getting a pound of tough beef in the sarcophagus, and there another kills himself by discovering his jocular vein. Things change so that I declare I don't know how to subscribe for any disease nowadays. New names and new nostrils takes the place of the old, and I might as well throw my old herb bag away. Fifteen minutes afterwards, Isaac had that herb bag for a target, and broke three squares of glass in the cellar window in trying to hit it before the old lady knew what he was about. She didn't mean exactly what she said. Daguerreotypes. What artfulness, said Mrs. Partington, as she held her miniature in her hand, done in the highest style of the Daguerrean art. The features were radiant with benevolence. The cap, close-fitted about her venerable face, bore upon it the faded black ribbon, the memento of ancient woe, the close-folded kerchief about her neck was pinned with mathematical exactness, while from beneath the cap border struggled a dark grey lock of hair, like a withered branch in winter waving amid accumulated snows. The specks and box were represented upon the table by her side. The picture was like her, and admiration marked every line of her countenance as she spoke. What artfulness here is, and how naturally every liniment is brought out! How nicely the dress is digested! She was talking to herself all the while. Why, this old black lute string that I have worn twenty year for Paul looks as good as new, only it is a little too short waisted by a great deal. Oh, Paul, Paul, sighed she, as she sat back in her chair and gazed with a tear in her eye upon an old smoke stained profile cut in black that had hung for many a year above the mantelpiece. Oh, Paul, what a blessed thing this is, where art helps nature and nature helps art, and they both help one another. How I wish I had your dear old fizz mahogany done like this. I'd prize it more than gold or silver. She sat still and looked alternately at the daguerreotype and the profile, as if she hoped the profile would speak to her. But it still looked rigidly forward, thrusting out its huge outline of nose, as if proud of it, and then with a sigh she reclasped the case and deposited the picture in the upper drawer of the old black bureau in the corner. Ike was all the while burning holes through a pine shingle with one of Mrs. Partington's best knitting needles. That and that. You do make that child look like a fool, wife, with all that toggery on him, said Mr. Fogg angrily as they were starting out for a walk. Dear me, says Mrs. Partington, meeting them at the door. What a doll of a baby, and how much he resembles his papa. Mr. Fogg coughed, and they passed along. On politics. As regards these electrical matters, said Mrs. Partington just before election, she lived on a main street, and the cheering and noise of parties passing her door kept her awake at nights. I don't see the use of making so much fuss about it. Why don't they take someone and give him their sufferings, if he hasn't got any of his own, and let him be governor till he dies, just as they do the judges, and arterwards, too, as they sometimes do them, for they might as well be dead a good many of them. Oh, this confusion of noise and hubbub! My poor head aches a hearing of it, and Isaac has got such a cold, looking out of the window at the possessions without nothing on the head. And then what critters they all be, to be sure! Their newspapers are brimful of good resolutions, but ne'er one of em did I ever know em to keep. They are always resolving, like the showman's resolving views, and one resolution fades away just as quick as another comes. If I could have my way, I would— "'Hooray! Here they come!' cried Ike, breaking in upon the old lady's remarks, and banging his slate on the floor, and throwing up the window with a vehemence that broke two squares of glass. Hooray! came up in a big chorus from the street, filling Mrs. Partington's little chamber to its utmost capacity with, Hooray! the great element of political life. There they go again, cried she, with their drums and lanterns like crazy critters, and keeping folks awake when they ought to be in the arms of Murphy. Ike pulled in his head and dropped the window, and the good old lady mended the fracture of the glass by a hat and a pair of pants of Ike's, 
with the threat of severe punishment if he ever did so again. But do you suppose she would have kept it? Ike knew better. When the glazier came in the next day to mend the window, she had to tell him the story of how it was broke, but all the blame was on the politicians. "'Don't crowd so, good woman,' said old Roger at the Lowell Institute, as he was waiting his turn to give his name. "'Don't crowd so.' And looking over his shoulder, he met the reproachful glance of Mrs. Partington herself, who was there for the same purpose. He immediately gave way to her, and the next morning found himself not divisible by seven nor anything like it. "'So much for politeness,' growled old Roger. "'She'll get all the natural religion now, and much good may it do her.' You would have smiled to see the spiteful manner in which the little man said this. Beautiful reflection interrupted. "'Dear me,' said Mrs. Partington. "'And so she is, dear, not that she meant so, "'because under that black bonnet is humility, "'and self-praise forms no part of her reflection. "'It was a simple ejaculation, that was all. "'Our word for it. "'Dear me, here they are, going to have war again over the sea, "'and only for a turkey. "'And it don't say how much it weighed, either, "'nor whether it was tender. "'And Prince Knockemstiff has gone off in a miff, "'and the Russian bears and ostriches are all to be let loose to devour the people, "'and heaven knows where the end of it will leave off. "'War is a dreadful thing, so destroying to temper and good clothes, "'and men shoot at each other just as if they was gutter purchase, and cheap at that.' "'How sorrowfully the cover of the snuff-box shut as she ceased speaking, "'and the spectacles looked dewy, like a tumbler in summer heat filled with ice-water, as she looked at the profile of the corporal, with a sprig of sweet fern above it, and the old sword behind the door. What did Ike mean, as he stole in, and deposited some red article under the cricket upon which her feet rested, and then stole out again? A hissing sound followed. Crack! Snap! Bang! Whiz! When a bunch of crackers and Mrs. Partington, in consternation and cloth slippers, danced about the room, forgetful of distant war and her present alarm. Ah, Ike! Appointing inspectors. Inspectors of customs, said Mrs. Partington energetically, as she laid down the paper, chronicling some new appointment. Here was a new idea that broke upon her mind like a ray of sunshine through a corn barn. Inspectors of customs? And she looked up at the rigid profile of the old corporal, as if she would ask what he had to say about it. But that warrior had hung there too long to be now disturbed by trifles, and he took no notice of her. "'Inspectors of customs,' continued she, as she turned her attention to the old black teapot, and then turned out the tea which celestial beverage gurgled through the spout in harmony with her reflections, not too strong. "'That's a new idea to me. But thank Providence I hain't got no customs that I had in his lives they'd inspect as not. Only I'd a little rather they wouldn't. I wish everybody could say so.' "'but I'm afeard there are many customs that won't bear looking into. "'Well, let every tub stand on its own bottom, I say. "'I won't cast no speciousness on nobody. "'But I don't see what they wanted to appoint any more for, "'and be to so much suspense when every place has so many in it "'that will inspect customs for nothing. "'If they'd only make my next-door neighbor Miss Juniper now "'an inspector of customs, they wouldn't need another for a long ways. "'That's mortally certain.' She stirred her souchong as she ruminated, untasting, and Ike helped himself, unheeded, to the last preserved pear there was in the dish. Mrs. Partington at tea. "'Adulterated tea,' said Mrs. Partington, as she read in the transcript an account of the adulteration of teas in England, at which she was much shocked. "'I wonder if this is adulterated.' And she bowed her head over the steaming and fragrant decoction in the cup before her, whose genial odors mingled with the silvery vapor, and encircled her venerable pole like a halo. "'It smells virtuous,' continued she, smiling with satisfaction. "'And I know this Shushan tea must be good, because I bought it of Mr. Shushan himself at Reading's. "'Adulterated!' she meandered on, pensively as a brook in June. "'And it's again the commandment, too, which says, "'Don't break that, Isaac!' As she saw that interesting juvenile amusing himself with making refracted sunbeams dance upon the wall and around the dark profile, and among the leaves of the sweet fern like yellow butterflies or fugitive chips of new June butter, the alarm for her crockery dispelled all disquietude about the tea, 
and she sipped her beverage all oblivious of de la tea various infusions sir you owe me a cent other things may be great said old roger with a nod besides what's called so some very little thing if tis done well can be a great one in impudence say for instance yesterday a boy asked me pitifully for a fourpence i gave him what i thought to be one and passed on presently i felt a twitch at my coat-tail and looked round and there stood the boy sir says he you owe me a cent this ear won't pass for but five cents it's crossed i gave the little rascal a shilling at once i couldn't help it the thing was sublime admirable hang me if it wasn't and the little man struck his cane violently on the ground and laughed happily at the supreme impudence displayed in the affair guessing at a name drive him out screamed mrs partington as ike whistled in an immense house dog who perambulated the kitchen dotting the newly washed floor with flowers of mud and audaciously smelling mrs partington's toes as the old lady stood up in a chair to avoid him drive him out what is his name isaac guess replied ike i can't i know perhaps it's watch or ponto or caesar what is it why guess i tell you i can't guess perhaps it's hector or tiger or rover what is his name guess oh you provoking creeter i'll be tempered to whip you within an inch of your skin if you provoke me so why don't you tell me i did tell you the first time whined ike pulling the dog's ear with one hand while he wiped his dry eyes with the other his name is guess the old lady was melted by his emotion and as soon as the dog was sent out some nice quince jelly settled the difficulty he is such a queer child murmured she so bright i suppose twas because he was weaned on pickles ike ate his preserves in silence but his eye was on the acorn on the post of the old lady's high-backed chair and he thought what a nice top it would make if he could saw it off some day burning water well this is a discovery exclaimed mrs partington smilingly as she stood with a small picture in her right hand her left resting upon the pine table and her eyes fixed upon the flame of a glass lamp that sputtered for a moment and then shot out a gleam of cheerful light that irradiated every part of the little kitchen revealing the portrait of paul upon the wall and ike asleep by the fire she spoke to herself it was a way she had and she met with no contradiction from that quarter this is a discovery this lamp was almost burnt out and i filled it up with water and it burns like the real isle the experiment was perfectly triumphant the problem of light from water was demonstrated and yet with this vast fact revealed to her mrs partington with a modesty equal to that of the great philosopher who picked up a pocketful of rocks on the shore of the vast ocean of truth smiled with delight at her discovery nor once thought of putting out a patent or selling rights was entirely willing all might burn water that could a striking manifestation i can't believe in spirituous knockings said mrs partington solemnly as some things were related to her which had been seen that appeared very mysterious i can't believe about it for i know if paul could come back he would revulge himself to me here and wouldn't make me run a mile only to get a few dry knocks strange that the world should be so superstitional as to believe such a rhapsody or think a spirit can go knocking about like a boy in vexation i can't believe it and i don't know as i could if that teapot there was to jump off the table right afore my eyes she paused and through the gloom of approaching darkness could be seen the determined expression of her mouth a slight movement was heard upon the table and the little black teapot moved from its position crawled slowly up the wall and then hung passively by the side of the profile of the ancient corporal the old lady could not speak but held up her hands in wild amazement while her snuff-box fell from her nerveless grasp and rolled along upon the sanded floor she left the room to procure a light and as soon as she had gone the teapot was lowered by the invisible hand to its original station and ike stepped out from beneath the table stowing a long string away in his pocket and grinning prodigiously ike and the elephant well said ike looking the elephant directly in the eye at the same time doubling up his huge fist as big as a half-cent bun 
and putting on an air of defiance after the animal had stolen his gingerbread. "'Well, you got it, didn't you, you old thief, you? I suppose you think you've done thunder and great things, don't you? For my part, I don't call it no better than stealing. Oh, you may stand there and swing that ridiculous-looking trunk of yourn just as much as you're a mind to. You can't skewer a fellow, I tell you. This is a free country, old club feet, and you ain't a-going to take any more liberties here like that.' I can tell you it won't be safe for that ingy rubber hide of yourn if you do. You take my gingerbread away again if you dare, that's all. You just try it, you ungainly reptile, you. Oh, you may look saucy and pretend you don't care, but you just say two words. Just knock that chip off my head, and if I don't give you fits, my name ain't Ike Partington, that's all. Just put down that big ingy rubber bludgeon and I'll black your eyes for you, you old tough leather. You darsn't say a word, you ill-mannered old hunch. I'd knock your eye teeth out if you did. Oh, take it up if you're a mind to. You needn't think to bully it over me because you're a little bigger than I am. I can tell you, we don't stand no such nonsense as that round here. If twer'n't for that policeman looking here, I'd pitch into you like a thousand of bricks. I wouldn't get out of your way as people do when you come along, and I should like to see you just step on my toes. Why can't you just try it now, will you? I guess I'd make you hear thunder with them leather apron ears of yourn. "'You big overgrown vagabond, you. "'Tain't no use of talking to you, but I shall be here, "'and if you don't mind your eye, I'll lick you like blazes afore I go out.' "'Here Isaac undoubled his hands, and shaking his head threateningly at the huge animal, "'he went over to get a look at the monkeys, "'while the elephant lazily swung his trunk from side to side "'and good-naturedly fanned himself with his big ears, "'as if he hadn't minded a word the little fellow had said. "'A Substitute "'I haven't got any money,' said Mrs. Partington, as the box came round at the close of a charity lecture. "'But here's a couple of elegant sausages I have brought that you can give the poor creeters.' The box holder looked confounded. The people smiled. With her view of charity, she saw nothing wrong in the act. "'Bless thee, Mrs. Partington. Angels shall record the deed on the credit side of thy account, and where hearts are judged shall thy simple gift weigh like gold in the day of award.' Wholesome advice. Isaac, said Mrs. Partington, as that interesting juvenile was playing a game of knuckle-up against the kitchen wall to the imminent danger of the old clock which ticked nearby. This is a marvellous age, as Deacon Babson says, and perhaps there's no harm in em, but I'm afeard no good'll come out of it. No good at all, for you to keep playing marvels all the time as you do. I am afeard you will learn how to gamble." and become a bad boy, and forget all the good device I have given you. Ah, it would break my soul, Isaac, to have you given to naughty tricks, like some wicked boys that I know, who will be rake shames in the earth if they don't die before their time comes. So don't gamble, dear, and always play as if you had just as leaves the minister would see you as not. She handed him a little bag she had made for him to keep his marbles in, and patted his head kindly as he went again to play. Ike was fortified for the next five minutes against temptation to do evil, but chase, span, in the ring, knuckle up, or anything, are potent when arrayed against out-of-sight solicitude, and we fear that the boy forgot. There is much reason in the old lady's fear. A Ghost Story In the vicinity of a town not many miles from Boston was a dark glen by the roadside reputed to be haunted. A traveller had been found here many years before, frozen to death, and his troubled spirit, with a disposition to trouble everybody else, was said nightly to visit the scene of his mortal termination, to have a melancholy satisfaction all alone by himself, or with but such auditors as he could press in to participate in the services of the evening. An old fellow who resided in the town, and was fully imbued with the superstition, had been one night to a husking where the milk punch had circulated with more than common generosity, and though not foul, he had enough on board to make him comfortable and happy and glorious or all the ills of life victorious. Towards the hour of breaking up, the conversation turned upon the ghost, by whose dark hunting ground our friend had to pass over a road raised up amid an alder swamp, whose sad gloom could hardly be dispelled by a noonday sun, and where nothing but a ghost of the most simple sort would wish to abide. With Tippany we fear na evil, with Usquebe we'll face the devil, Burns said, and milk punch we suppose to be about the same in its courage-inspiring properties. 
our hero snapped his fingers at danger from ghosts and unholy angels and cared for neither a bodle it was a mile walk good to the spiritual precinct and thinking on his way that it would be the part of prudence to prepare for emergency before he came to the dark gulf he was to pass he gathered a small artillery from a stone wall determined if assaulted to do battle manfully for the credit of the punch he had crossed a little brook that murmured beneath the rude bridge above it and had fairly got through the dangerous part as he considered it of his journey and muttered to himself in rather a tone of disappointment i guess he must be sick fog isn't good for him when lo almost directly in the path before him was an object that made him come to a stand at once it was all ghostly white and he had barely time to look at it when a hideous groan came towards him on the night air which the milk punch could hardly counteract in its effect on his nervous system rallying however he selected a missile and let it fly at his ghostly obstructor another groan like the last bellow of expiring nature answered this assault he hurled another huge stone and gathering courage from the excitement he blazed away in a manner that would astonish either human or superhuman antagonists but without any apparent effect upon the adversary who stood his ground manfully or perhaps we should say ghostfully as the last stone of his ammunition was expended however with a cry that echoed fearfully through the alders the ghost rushed towards him and a violent shock laid him senseless upon the ground a vanquished man he was found the next morning pensively sitting by the roadside contemplating the scene of his night's exploit with his head in his hand he told his story and pointed to the scattered missiles for proof of what he had done and he was believed for to give up the ghost was out of the question but on going home a small white two-year-old bull was seen grazing by the roadside and suspicion for a moment crossed their minds that this might have been the ghost after all seen through the medium of the punch but this would have been voted rank heresy against the ancient institution of ghosts and they held their peace end of section three section four a dangerous position don't lay in that posture dear said mrs partington to ike who was stretched upon a settle with his heels a foot or two higher than his head don't lay so raise yourself up and put this pillow under you i knew a young man once who had a suggestion of the brain in consequence of laying so his brains all run down into his head and with this admonition she left him to practice soon after the hazardous experiment of tying his legs in a bow knot round his neck as he had seen professor baldwin do a lesson on sympathy what a to-do they are making about this cosset said mrs partington smilingly the news had reached her ear of the triumphs of cashut and the name had assumed a form and that form recalled a train of peculiar and characteristic associations and she went on like an eight-day clock a cosset is a pretty thing in a family where there's children, and they are dear critters for girls that hasn't got sweethearts to invent their young affectations on. But what's the use of making such a fuss about it? But this is Kashut, Aunt, the great Hungarian, said Ike, tremendously, who was well posted up in passing matters, who has come over here to ask our sympathy and enlist us in behalf of his country. Well, said she, as the new light dawned upon her, they may have our sympathy and welcome cause it don't cost anything but we mustn't list and give em money that would be again our constitutions and the prudent dame drummed thoughtfully on her snuff-box cover with her eyes fixed upon the vein of the old south while ike amused himself by scratching k o s u t h with a fork on the end of the new japanned waiter how ike dropped the cat now isaac said mrs partington as she came into the room with a basket snugly covered over take our tabby and drop her somewhere and see that she don't come back again for i am sick and tired of driving her out of the butter she is the thievinest creetur but don't hurt her isaac only take care that she don't come back ike smiled as he received his charge and the old lady felt happy in getting rid of her trouble without resorting to violence she would rather have endured the evil of the cat great as that evil was than that the poor quadruped should be inhumanely dealt with she saw ike depart in the dusk of the evening and watched him until he became lost to view in the shadow of a tree 
It was a full half hour before he returned with his empty basket, and an unusual glee marked his appearance. It sparkled in his eye, it glowed in his cheek, it sported in his hair, and Ike looked really handsome as he stood before the dame and proclaimed the success of his mission. "'Did she drop easy, Isaac?' asked the old lady, looking upon him kindly. "'And won't she come back?' "'She dropped just as easy,' said Ike, letting his basket fall on the floor and shying his cap upon the table, somewhat endangering a glass lamp with a wooden bottom that stood thereon. "'She dropped just as easy, and she won't come back. You may bet high on that. "'But you didn't beat and mangle her, Isaac, did you?' "'If you did, I should be afraid she would come back and haunt us. "'I have heard of such things.' "'And she looked anxiously in his face. "'But detecting there no trace of guilt, "'she patted him on the head and parted his hair "'and told him to sit down and eat his supper, "'which the young gentleman did with considerable unction. "'Isaac! Isaac!' screamed Mrs. Partington "'at the foot of the little stairway that led to the attic "'where the boy slept the next morning after the above occurrence. "'Isaac!' "'And he came downstairs slowly,' "'rubbing his eyes as he came. "'She had disturbed his morning nap. "'Isaac,' said she, "'what is that hanging yonder to a limb of our apple-tree?' "'One scattering tree, as she said, "'constituted her whole orchard, "'unless she counted the poplar by the corner. "'I can't see so far off,' said Ike, "'still rubbing his eyes. "'Well, I should think it was a cat, "'and it looks to me like our tabby. "'Oh, Isaac, if you have done this!' "'And a tone akin to horror trembled in her voice.' "'I'll go and see if it's her,' said Ike, as if not hearing the last part of her remark, and he dashed out of the door, but soon came back with wonder depicted on every feature of his expressive countenance. "'Oh, it's her! Sure enough, it's her!' cried he. "'But I did drop her. Well, how could she come there, then?' And the good old lady looked puzzled. "'I'll tell you how I guess it was,' said Ike, looking demurely up. "'I guess that she committed suicide, because we was going to drop her.' "'They are dreadful knowing critters, you know.' "'True enough,' replied the old lady, "'while something like a tear glistened in her eye. "'Her pity was excited. "'True enough, Isaac, "'and I dare say she thought hard of us for doing it, "'but she hadn't ought to, "'as she'd have considered a minute.' "'Ike said no more, but went out "'and cut down the supposed suicide "'with a serious manner, "'and buried her beneath her gallows, "'deep down among the roots of the old tree, "'and she never came back. The old lady told the story to the minister, and Ike vouched for it, but the good man shook his head incredulously at the idea of the suicide and looked at the boy. He very evidently understood how the cat was dropped. Stopping a Bus Mrs. Partington had watched three-quarters of an hour for an omnibus, and she swung her umbrella as one drove up, and the driver stopped his horses near where she stood. "'Now, Isaac,' says she, feeling in her reticule for a copper, away down under the handkerchief and snuff-box and knitting-work and thread-case and needle-book, "'be a good boy, dear, while I am gone, and don't cause a constellation among the neighbours, as some boys do, and there's a cent for you. And be sure you don't lay it out extravagantly now, and be careful you don't break the windows, and if anybody rings at the door, be sure and see who it is before you open it, because there is so many dishonest rogues about.' If any porpoises come a-begging, give em what was left of the dinner. Heaven bless em, and much good may it do em, and why bless me if the omnibus hasn't gone off and left me standing here in the middle of the street. Such impudence is without a parable. Her spectacles gleamed indignantly down the street after the disappearing bus, and for a moment anger had the mastery. But equanimity, like twilight, came over her mind, and she waited for the next bus with calmness on her face and her green cotton umbrella under her arm. After a wedding. I like to tend weddings, said Mrs. Partington, as she came back from a neighboring church where one had been celebrated, and hung up her shawl and replaced the black bonnet in the long preserved bandbox. I like to see young people come together with the promise to love, cherish, and nourish each other. "'But it is a solemn thing, is matrimony, a very solemn thing. "'Where the pasture comes into the chancery with a surplus on "'and goes through with the ceremony of making a man and wife, "'it ought to be husband and wife, for it ain't every husband that turns out a man. "'I declare I shall never forget how I felt "'when I had the nuptial ring put on to my finger "'when Paul said, With my goods I thee endow.' 
He used to keep a dry goods store then, and I thought he was going to give me all there was in it. I was young and simple and didn't know till arterwards that it only meant one calico gown in a year. It is a lovely sight to see the young people plighting their trough and coming up to consume their vows. She bustled about and got tea ready, but abstractedly she put on the broken teapot that had lain away unused since Paul was alive, and the teacups mended with putty and dark with age, as if the idea had conjured the ghost of past enjoyment to dwell for the moment in the home of present widowhood. A young lady who expected to be married on Thanksgiving night wept copiously at her remarks, but kept on hemming the veil that was to adorn her brideship, and Ike sat pulling bristles out of the hearth-brush in expressive silence. Mrs. Partington in the Market "'I wonder what they mean by a better feeling in the market,' said Mrs. Partington, looking up from the newspaper which she was reading, and the problem deeply agitated her mind, revealed in the vibration of her cat-border. Her address was directed to nobody in particular. It was a little private wonder got up for her own amusement. The market and the deaths and marriages were Mrs. P.'s favorite study in the weekly chronicle. But some of the mercantile phrases were at times imperfectly understood. "'I wonder what they mean. I'm sure I don't feel any better there, and I don't believe anybody does but the butchers, and that's when they are pocketing the money. Things is so dear.' "'But,' continued she, brightening up, "'I should like to see the trade embracing ten hogs heads of tobacco that I see here printed about.' That must have been a real touching sight. She thought of Paul, and the association brought out the cotton handkerchief with the Constitution and Guerriere upon it, and she discontinued. Partington Philosophy Before the railroad company bought and tore down the Partington mansion, and uprooted and overturned the old family shrines without regard to their sacredness, the vandals, turning the good old heart that worshipped there out upon the world to seek new ties amid new scenes it was mrs partington's delight to gather friends about her at thanksgiving time and the time-honoured season passed very happily amid the festivities her benignity would beam with such a radiance that the red seed peppers upon the wall looked ruddier in its genial glow and the bright tin pans upon the shelf seemed brimful of sunshine and smiled out upon all who looked at them there were fine times at the Partington Mansion at Thanksgiving, you may depend. She didn't keep Christmas, she was puritanical in her religious notions, and tended the old North meeting-house for a third of a century, and took pride in saying that she had never been to church, a nice distinction which we leave the old folks to make. Christmas was a church holiday, unsanctioned by a governor's proclamation, and she would none of it. She scented in it the garment of the disreputable Babylonish female mentioned in the Apocalypse, and avoided it. But it is Thanksgiving that we are speaking about now. Well, well, what has all this to do with patience? Have patience, darling, and we'll tell you an instance of patient resignation under disappointment not surpassed since Newton's dog Diamond committed an incendiary act, and his master gravely informed the quadruped, that he was not probably aware of the extent of the damage he had committed, which was doubtless the fact. It was the custom with Mrs. P. to shut up a turkey previous to Thanksgiving, in order that he might be nice and fat for the generous season. One year the gobbler had thus been penned, like a sonnet, with reference to Thanksgiving, and anticipations were indulged of the good time coming. But, alas, the brightest hopes must fade. The turkey, when looked for, was not to be found. It had been stolen away. Upon discovering her great loss, Mrs. P. was, for a moment, overcome with surprise, disconcerted. But the sun of her benevolence soon broke the clouds away, and spread over her features like new butter upon hot biscuit. And with a smile, warm with the feeling of her heart, she said, "'I hope they will find it tender. I guess we can be thankful on pork and cabbage. Say, ye severest, what would ye have done, under such circumstances?' You would, perhaps, have raved and stamped and swore and made yourself generally ridiculous, besides periling your soul in the excess of your anger. But Mrs. P. didn't, and there is where you and she differ. She stood calmly and tranquilly, a living lesson of philosophical patience under extreme difficulty. We cite this example that the world may profit by it. Filial Duty versus Washing Powder 
children of the present day sighed the reverend adoniram spade as he was visiting mrs partington during the spring anniversaries children of the present day ma'am sadly ruffle the bosoms of their parents he crossed his legs as he spoke and tied his handkerchief in a hard knot over his knee at the same time looking at ike through the back window as that young gentleman was performing a slack rope exercise upon the clothesline endangering the caps and handkerchiefs that swung like banners in the breeze mrs partington suspended washing and looked round at her visitor at the same time wiping her hands to take a pinch of snuff yes sir she said i think so but it isn't so bad either as it used to be before the soap powder was found out mr spade quietly protested that he could not see the relevancy of the remark why continued she inhaling the rapé and handing the box to the minister then it was a great labor to wash and do em up but now the washing powder makes it so easy that the children can rumple bosoms or anything else with perfect impurity we don't make nothing of it i consider washing powder holding up a pair of ike's galligaskins that had just gone through a course of purification as a great blessing to mothers the minister smiled and thought what a curious proposition it would be in the society for the mitigation of everything to recommend washing powder as an auxiliary to other operative blessings and thanked mrs partington for the hint a serious question old roger came downstairs one sunday morning with a face unusually animated and stood with his hands behind his back playing nervously with the tails of his coat the breakfast was waiting for him the fish balls were getting cold the coffee was evaporating but he didn't seem to care he leaned over the back of the landlady's chair and asked her in a whisper if she could tell him why a dyspeptic was out of immediate danger when his disease was most distressing she looked earnestly at the top of the teapot a few moments and then said that for the life of her she couldn't tell a curiosity was evinced by the boarders and they asked what it was they all gave it up too why said he looking very red it is because he can't digest then drawing his chin within his stock the old fellow laughed lustily and in his paroxysm threw his arms around the landlady's neck for support but she threw them off very indignantly for the boarders were all looking at her he then sat down to breakfast with a good appetite rather a rascal mrs partington your neighbor mr gruff is rather irascible i think said the new minister on his first visit to the old lady as he heard gruff scolding ike for throwing snowballs at his new martin house gruff kept a grocery over the way and was in a constant quarrel with every boy in the neighborhood mrs partington looked at the minister through her spectacles inquiringly before she answered rather a rascal said she slightly misapprehending his question and patting her box affectionately yes indeed i think he is a great rascal he sold me burnt peas for the best coffee once and it wasn't weight nother when they built our new church somebody said there was a knave in it and i knowed in a minute who they meant why i mean interrupted the minister blandly laying his white hand gently on his arm i mean that he is quick-tempered oh that's another thing yes he is very and she changed the subject but that word irascible ran in her head for an hour after he was gone and when ike came in she told him to take down the old johnson's decency and find the defamation of it the sensitive man sees a bloomer the sensitive man came in one day just after dinner threw himself into a chair and fainted after a mug or two of coquituate water had been dashed in his interesting face he came to a little gazed wildly upon the circle that surrounded him and said in a sort of unearthly whisper where is she nobody knew what he meant the fog a moment later rolled from his soul and he was enabled to explain with the aid of some slight stimulant a crowd in the street had obstructed his path as he walked pensively along with his eyes cast down looking up a vision of beauty burst upon his ravished sight and he stood entranced as he gazed upon it and when it passed away with the crowd he climbed upon an omnibus and watched that object through his tunneled hand until it became indistinct and lost in the distance that object was a bloomer he had long ardently wished for this opportunity 
in visions of the night had angels in short dresses and trousers thrust themselves among his sleeping fancies to the bewilderment of his waking thoughts it had become the great idea of his mind and all his other thoughts bowed to this as did the sheaves of the israelitish brethren to the sheaf of joseph of old he had at last seen a bloomer the climax of his earthly desire was attained the driver of the bus callous to the emotion of his bosom asked him what in thunder he was a-looking at up there the sensitive man made but one step to the ground so buoyant was he and he bounded like cork he could have leaped over the state house little boys and sedate passengers stepped back dismayed and a gentleman in a black coat and white neckcloth looked around anxiously after a policeman what were policemen to the sensitive man those terrific functionaries were nothing even the cold reality of a watch-house floor would be as soft as down could he carry with him the consciousness that he had seen a bloomer he looked to see if her passing figure had not left its impression in aerial portraiture upon the impalpable atmosphere he looked upon the pave to detect the print of her charming foot upon the insensate bricks but she had fled like some bright exhalation of the morning and he turned back sorrowing a coach came nigh running over him the tension of his spirit relaxed enduring only to bring him within the precinct of his vocation when his too sensitive nature gave out and the result was as explained above and hourly since has he longingly gazed from the window in ardent hope of seeing again the beauteous vision which had enthralled him and disappointment like a worm in the mud feeds on his damaged cheek power of attorney when the widow ames had been notified that her share of the paul jones prize money would be paid her upon presenting herself at the dummer bank she debated in her own mind though the debate never was reported whether she should go herself or give a power of attorney to some one else to receive the eleven dollars and sixty-two cents that was her share in this strait she called on mrs partington who she knew had authorized a person to settle the beanville estate for her when the beanville railroad had driven her from the homestead go yourself dear said the old lady bringing the poker down emphatically upon the bale of the tea-kettle as she was clearing out the ashes from the stove don't trust to nobody but yourself for raising the poker if you give anybody power of eternity depend upon it you won't never see the final conclusion of it the poker fell again upon the harmless tea-kettle which seemed to sing out with reproach for the outrage and ike who was looking slyly into the back window wondered if mrs ames wasn't sitting on a favorite piece of spruce gum of his and whether it wouldn't stick her to the chair so that she couldn't get up it showed that the boy had a reflective turn of mind the new dress for ladies a new custom for ladies said mrs partington when a friend spoke to her about the proposed innovation in dress the sound of costume came to her ear indistinctly and she slightly misapprehended the word a new custom for ladies i should think they had better reform many of their old customs before they try to get new ones we're none of us better than we ought to be and costume ma'am i said cried her informant interrupting her they are thinking of changing their dress well for my part i don't see what they want to make a public thing of it for changing the dress used to be a private matter but folks do so alter they are always a changing dresses now like the caterpillar in the morning that turns into a butterfly at night or the butterfly at night that turns to a caterpillar in the morning i don't know which but again interrupted her informant i mean they are going to have a new dress oh they are are they replied the old lady well i'm sure i'm glad in it if they can afford it but they don't always think enough of this a good many can't afford it they can't but did you hear of the new apparel for women that somebody is talking about why my dear mrs p said he smiling that is just what i was trying to get your opinion about then returned she why didn't you say so in the first place well i don't know why a woman can't be as virtuous in a short dress as in a long one and it will save some trouble in wet weather to people who have to lift their dresses and show their ankles it may do for young critters as sportive as lambs in a pasture but only think how I should look in short coats and trousers, shouldn't I? And old Mrs. Jones, who weighs three hundred pounds, wouldn't look well in em neither. But I say let em do just what they please as long as they don't touch my dress. 
I like the old way best, and that's the long and the short of it. She here cast a glance at the profile on the wall, as if for its approval of her resolution, and an idea for a moment seemed to cross her mind that he, the ancient corporal, would not know her were he to visit sublunar scenes and find her arrayed in the new dress, and her compressed lips showed the determination of her heart to abide by the old costume, and she solemnly and slowly took an energetic pinch of snuff as if to confirm it. PSYCHOLOGY Sensitive people talk about feeling, in the presence or atmosphere of a man, the peculiar disposition that governs him, whether a gentle or a stern one, whether a hypocritical or a knavish one. We have realized in some degree what the feeling must be, as we have at times elbowed our way among the gentlemen who throng about State or Wall Street. The atmosphere was so hard that we shrank at once into our empty pocket, a thing which finds no sympathy in those diggings, and escaped as fast as possible. We could read every disposition that we rubbed against like a book, or as well as the most subtle magician could do it. The dollar was the idea that every brain was working and struggling to coin itself into. The dollar gleamed in every eager glance of the eye, and was heard in every word. The dollar was the sun that shone in the air that blew, and though celestial choirs had been at hand chanting the music of the spheres, unless it had the right chink to it, it would not have been regarded. Let sensitive ones who have no money go down upon change and try the experiment. It will not make them any poorer, though most certainly they will not be any richer by it. Matter of fact. Shakespeare's well enough, said Mr. Slow, but he don't come up to my idea of poetry. There is too much of your highfalutin humbug about him. What he says don't seem to mount to nothing. As for Falstaff, He's a miserable and disreputable old fellow, and Hamlick's as mad as a bed-bug. Why didn't he knock his old father-in-law over and done with it, and not make such a hillabaloo about it? Shakespeare isn't what he is cracked up to be, and if he doesn't improve, I wouldn't give two per cent for his chance of immortality. Who believes this ear, for instance? Orpheus' lute was strung with poet's sinews, whose golden touch could soften steel and stones, make tigers tame and huge leviathans, forsake unsounded deeps to dance on sand. That's all gammon. Poet sinews indeed. Dare say twasn't nothing but catgut, and as for its softening steel and stones and taming tigers and making levithians dance on the sand, that air's all bosh and too ridiculous for any man to believe. Mr. Slow looked fearfully oracular as he said this, and the subject was suspended. THE CAT AND KITTENS Before Ike dropped the cat, it was a matter of much annoyance to Mrs. Partington, upon coming downstairs one morning, to find a litter of kittens in her Indian work-basket, beside her black Sunday bonnet, and upon the black gloves and handkerchief long consecrate to grief. Ike had left the basket uncovered during a search for some thread to make a snare to catch a pigeon with. Her temper was stirred by the circumstance, as what good tidy housekeepers would not have been by such an occurrence. "'I'll drown em said she, "'every one of em "'Oh, you wicked creeter continued she, raising her finger and shaking it at the cat. "'Oh, you wicked creeter to serve me such a trick!' But the cat, happy in the joys of maternity, purred gladly among her offspring, and looked upon the old lady through her half-closed eyes, as if she didn't really see any cause for such a fuss. "'Isaac,' said the dame, "'take the big tub and drown them kittens.' There was determination in her eyes and authority in her tone, and Ike clapped his hands as he hastened to obey her. "'Stop, Isaac, a minute,' she cried, "'and I'll take the chill off the water. It would be cruel to put him into it stone cold.' She took the steaming kettle from the stove and emptied it into the tub, and then left the rest to Ike. But she reproached herself for her inhumanity long afterwards, and could not bear to look the childless cat in the face, and many a dainty bit did that injured animal receive from her mistress. Mrs. Partington perhaps did wrong, as who hasn't at some period of life. Perfection belongeth not to man or woman, and we would throw this good pen of ours into the street, and never take another in our fingers, could we pretend that Mrs. Partington was an exception to this universal rule. End of section 4 Section 5 A point settled. Dr. Digg, for whose researches the world can never be grateful enough, 
has been studying out of the genealogy of the great family of Co, which occupies such a distinguished mercantile position. This family is scattered the world over, and almost every sign in every city bears the name of one of them as partner. He traces their genealogy back to Jericho, of Palestine, modern Jeremiah Co, or for shortness, Jericho, whom we find frequently mentioned in ancient books. The doctor expresses the belief that the exclusive business habits of the family may be attributed to their Jewish extraction. Moral Training Moral training, said Mrs. Partington, is the best, after all. She had heard someone in the omnibus speaking of moral training, and her benevolence gave it into the charge of memory until she got home, and memory revolved it, and pondered it, and reviewed it, and fancy construed it to mean something about the military training that was to come off the next day. I hope it will be a moral training. I'm sure, said she for I see the governor is to be there in his new suit, and I hope they'll make the revolutions well before him. I do admire the military, where the soggers and their fancy unicorns look just like a patchwork quilt. They was in moral trainings in old times when men put enemies into their heads to steal away their hats. As Mr. Smooth, the schoolmaster, used to say your Uncle Paul had a good deal of military spirit sometimes, Isaac. A.K. had remained very quiet while she was speaking. "'What upon earth are you doing there, Isaac?' cried she. The young gentleman readily told her he was painting a horse, at the same time displaying an animal, nominally of that description, done beautifully in blue, which he appeared to look on with much satisfaction. "'But what are you painting it with?' As true as I'm alive, you've got your Uncle Paul's tompion that he used to wear in his cap so long ago, and you're using up all my blueing. That pompon saved for so many years to be used for such a purpose. Ah, Ike, Ike, we fear the old lady will have sad times with thee yet. Why didst thou, yester even, secrete the large ball of yarn for thine own purposes, which to-morrow she will seek for in vain? Say, why? A little truth. There's something for all of us to do, is the heading of a poem in the papers, a subject which seems to have more of truth than poetry in it. There are exceptions, however, to the rule, for a very seedy gentleman with a very red nose told us one day that he couldn't get a thing to do. The man appeared strong, and so did his breath. But there are many worthy people who cannot find that proportion of the uh, something for all to do, and suppose some philanthropist is doing it for them. Hairdressing What a queer place this Boston is! said Mrs. Partington, when she first came here from the country. I was walking along the street just now and saw on a sign, hairdressing. Something like guano, I guess, for the hair, said I to myself. I declare, I'm a good mind to look at some. So I went in and asked a dear, pretty young man, smelling as sweet as catnip, to let me look at some of his hair manure. I wanted to be as polite as possible. Gracious! How he stared at me, just as if I'd been a hottentot or a wild arrod. I mean your hair dressing, said I. Oh, ah, yes, said he. Sit down here in the big chair, ma'am. Scratch, perhaps, ma'am. Scratch, said I, completely dumbfounded. You saucy fellow. I can do all my own scratching and some of your own too, if you say that again. Scratch, indeed, and I went right down the stairs. She never before had hinted that she stood in need of any hair tonic, though everybody knew that she had worn a wig for twenty years. Mrs. Partington says that it makes no difference to her if Fleur is dear or cheap. She always has to pay the same price for half a dollar's worth. Omnibus riding. Tis a rainy morning, and health considered, we think we'll ride. The bus heaves in sight and we look anxiously through the dusty windows to see a dense packing of humanity in one long lane that has no turning occupying the inside. The driver pulls up as we wave our cane. He has been watching us for some distance, calculating on the chances of a summons, and peering down from his perch through the ticket hole, ascertains that there is room for one more. 
there always is we take heart at the announcement and mount the steps while the door swings open to admit us calculated to hold twelve persons beams upon us from the front of the vehicle whether nature in framing the persons bore the bus maker's limit in mind or not it must hold twelve irrespective of size there are but eleven inside and we make the twelfth but where to sit six lean persons occupy one side and five fat ones the other of course our place is with the five and they seem conscious of it they have read the arbitrary inscription and crowd one another and squat their sides to the smallest squeezable limit to admit us and just as the bus starts we fall plump between a very fiery looking old gentleman and a lady of unromantic years and bilously wicked looking withal something cracks in the old gentleman's pocket and a growl greets us from him while with half of our person resting upon the lady's carpet bag we are made sensible of a sharp elbow and the ejaculation oh lord uttered in a tone between a prayer and a reproach of course we have a right there for isn't the coach bound to hold twelve and won't we give one pull for the right before we'll give it up that's a beautiful face opposite a glimpse convinces us of this for we cannot stare at her good manners forbid it there is a glass beneath the driver's seat and here the pretty face in duplicate appears and we gaze upon it unnoted we are now reminded of the presence of the collector of the tickets who touches our shoulder and looks significantly without saying anything he was never known to say anything but twice in his life it is said once to inform a man in the bus that it was cold and again in a confidential whisper to hint that it was unpleasant we struggle to reach the pocket which contains our ticket but the mass that hems us in won't move and in a spasmodic effort to entrap the card three buttons are sacrificed and a bonnet disturbed in its position we laugh at some pleasant allusion of our own about clumsiness but the laugh appears only upon one side and we relapse into silence and look in the glass beneath the driver's seat thank heaven the big man here pulls the string and sturdily tramples over quiescent toes in his egress then the lady with the carpet bag pulls vehemently in a vain effort to jerk the driver through and she gets out then another and another until all are gone but us the pretty girl last and we are captain of the ship all the difficulties of our outset merged in the triumphant consciousness that we have room what do we care now about how many the bus will hold we snap our fingers at the insulting rule that would curtail humanity and gaze upon the other inscription that enjoins the pull for the right then pull the string magnificently the coat stops and we descend among the pedestrians not a whit inflated by our momentary exaltation coriferous meditations golden airs of california said mrs partington as she read in the post an advertisement of some new music such airs i should think would be very replenishing and i wish a draught of em would blow this way what a country that california is murmured she in a half reverie in which golden visions like the sunshine reflections on the kitchen wall from a teacup were dancing through her brain what a queer thing where gold is so plenty they pick it up in quarts in american forks connecticut ones i dare say but spoons i should think would be a good deal better of course it would strange that the miners didn't think of this in the first place many a valuable suggestion of hers has benefited the world though the world was not aware of its indebtedness until she said i always thought so and is coming late she never got the credit for it A.K. and the oranges. I can't conceive," said Mrs. Partington, standing upon tiptoe and pushing aside the antique wash bowl that stood on the front shelf in the old cupboard in the corner, and rattling the papers of seeds and the teacups and the plates, and looking into the dark corners and feeling in, also to be certain. When she said she couldn't conceive, it was but part of the sentence that she wished to speak. The earnestness of her search had suspended the reminder of it can't conceive where those oranges are said she that the young lady sent to me heaven bless them they were so good to look abrade the throat with when it's dry and hot with the information that comes with a cough it is strange where they have gone 
if i believed in super humorous things i should say the spirits had got him but they wouldn't take mine when they could go so easy where they grow and get as many as they want she stopped her search amid the dust and regaled her nose with dust of a more fragrant character what are you doing isaac said she as she saw him forming a star out of an orange upon the closet door and using up a pump tax the boy pointed to his handiwork and the delight she felt for his genius blinded her eyes to the possibility of how he might have come by the oranges patriotism a young key gentleman convoying a british friend around to view the different objects of attraction in the vicinity of boston brought him to bunker hill they stood looking at the splendid shaft when the yankee said that is the place where warren fell ah replied the englishman evidently not posted up in local historical matters did it hurt him much the native looked at him with the expression of fourteen fourth of july's in his countenance hurt him said he he was killed sir ah he was eh said the stranger still eyeing the monument and computing its height in his own mind layer by layer well i should think he would have been to fall so far the native tore his hair but it gave him a good opportunity to enlarge upon the glorious events connected with the hill and the benefits therefore flowing to our somewhat extensive country and he soon talked himself into good humour keep your eyes wide open for the truth let it come down into your mind like the sunlight to illumine all of its dark corners buy the truth and sell it not dull business a long time ago in an old town we wot of there lived a man of humble means there are some poor people there now and in pity for his need he was made sexton of the church of which he was a member the times were dull his salary was low and he found it hard work to make both ends meet he called upon the members of the church but they could not or would not do anything for his relief as a last resort he called upon the minister and told him his troubles and how hard he found it to get along the minister heard his story but instead of relieving his wants or telling him how to do it went to arguing with him about the unreasonableness of his complaint why says he don't you have besides your salary a number of perquisites are you not paid for ringing the bell on the fourth of july and other public celebrations and are you not paid too for your services at funerals when any occur in our society true said the dolores sexton looking up solemnly but i have little hope from this source for confound it none of our society ever die the poor fellow went away sorrowing thinking probably that providence was rather harsh on him in not killing off half the parish that he might have the profit of burying them antiquity in a shower mrs partington attended the dedication of mount hope cemetery in dorchester and got wet with the rain no sheltering umbrella was there to hold its broad surface above her venerable head and the rain all regardless of her august presence poured down relentlessly but we will let her tell the story in her own way the seminary would have been dictated but by an imposition of divine providence the portals of heaven were uncocked and the rain fell as if another delusion was a-going to destroy the world the lightning biased horridly and everybody was filled with constipation not a shelter to be had i tried to lean over and get my bonnet under a gentleman's umbrella in front of me and the water all ran down into my back like a spout till i was satiated through and through like an old boot cold chills run over me as if i had an ager and oh dear look at that bonnet certainly the faded remnant had wilted the pasteboard that formed the crown had relaxed and shook flabbily as we held it and irreparable decay seemed written upon it never will be fit to be seen again said she and we fancied a tone of deeper sorrow in her words as she looked straight up at the stiff old corporal on the wall whom this antique crape commemorated heaven bless thee mrs partington we thought and felt round of a capacious pocket for a dollar to leave with her but as it usually happens when our benevolence comes on we found none and came away with a paper pinned to our hotel by that everlasting ike the national epic i can't see through it said mrs partington with a reflective nod of her head and her eyes earnestly bent upon the keyhole of the closet door as if that were the object she could not see through 
she had just learned the report of the committee upon the prize poem proposition of mr latham and the loss of five hundred dollars to the musical genius of the country can't see why somebody couldn't have written an epic poem when there are so many beautiful epicac poets in the country dear me the older i grow and i never shall see fifty-seven again i am convinced that genius isn't thought half enough of and that versatility of talent and great power of versification isn't rewarded as it ought to be this was said in compliment to whitesworth who it was half suspected had put in for the prize and he bowed modestly as he placed his hand in the vicinity of his heart and felt in his vest pocket for a toothpick mrs partington and the main liquor bill mrs partington was in the gallery of the house of representatives when the main liquor law was under discussion the member from cranberry centre was very attentive to the old dame and replied to her questions concerning the main liquor law and spoke of various provisions of the bill provisions said the kind old dame tapping her box gently i never heard there was any provisions mentioned in the bill though i dare say there is for paul used to say that give old mr tipple a pint of rum it would be victuals and drink and house rent for a week and i believe it was so for only give him rum enough he never asked for bread i remember too continued the old lady raising her voice as she saw mr batkins about to interrupt her they used always to put rum and tobacco into their provision bills in old times when they went a-fishing and i suppose this putting provisions into the liquor bill is about the same thing she looked at mr batkins and smiled as she saw him looking smilingly at her and they both smiled at each other the provisions meant mem said the member impressively are provisions of law ah replied the old lady musingly as she took the third pinch and handed the box to mr batkins yes yes i've heard of folks being bred to the law for though a good many of em is more like vegetables but here the speaker's mallet attracted her attention and she listened to the reading of part of the liquor bill watching carefully for the items is that the liquor bill asked she in an incredulous tone of her friend the member is that it he assured her that it was well continued she as she rose to go i must say that i never see a bill made out in that way before mr batkins handed her out and she remarked to mr very green whom she met on the stairs that she had come to hear the liquor bill and they were reading a new chapter that she had never read in the book of acts take things easy i never knowed anything gained by being in too much of a hurry said mrs Battington. when me and my dear paul was married he was in such a trepidation that he came nigh marrying one of the bridesmaids instead of me by mistake he was such a queer man she continued why he joined the fire apartment and one night in his hurry he put his boots on his hind part of war and as he ran along everybody behind him got tripped up the papers were full of crowners quests on broken legs and limbs for a week afterwards and she lapsed into an abstraction on the ups and downs of life carried away with music everybody will remember the organ grinder's little child who was carried around seated upon the instrument his father was tuning his young heart well satisfied with things as they were so he enjoyed his musical throne we regret to say that this babe of tender years was once made the subject of as cruel a joke as was ever seen in print our friend old roger was concerned in it too and with his kind feelings twas a wonder he could have done it philanthropos observed old roger standing upon the sidewalk good-humouredly beating time to a lively air performed by the man of the organ and observing the dexterity with which he could pick up a cent and not lose a note sir said philanthropos observe the hard fortune of that babe thus chained to such a destiny a child with a soul to save thus risking its safety by breathing continually such abominable airs i know it said old roger in his way i know it and yet the little fellow seems to be entirely carried away with the music philanthropos immediately left him mrs partington in trouble trying the french sea steamer said mrs partington as she read in foreign news an account of trial trips made by the french steamships 
she has always had a deep interest in the french since mr le martin as she calls la martin has been driven out of the provisional government and the people have got to go back to the frog soup again what can they be going to try them for continued she i never knowed that steamboats could be arranged for murder and such things before though i don't see no reason why they shouldn't seeing so many murders come from their arrangements and i wish they'd try em all before they do the mischief and condemnation will be a warning to em just as it would if you could try all of the murderers and hang em off aforehand and save the lives of their innocent victims isaac she screamed as a snowball struck the window don't throw your snow this way and she rushed out to save her glass alas she was a moment too soon for a snowball struck her cap as she shoot from the door tore it from her head and bore it with its strings hanging down far from her her hair all unconfined danced madly in the wind and mrs partington for a moment looked every which way virtue is of little account unless it be tried nor is patience mrs partington calmly digested her cap on her head and went in influenza i declare i believe i'm going to have the influenza day said mrs partington tenderly enveloping her nose in her cotton bandana previous to a blast that would have done credit to sam robinson's stage horn in the old time it is a dreadful feeling to have your head as big as a bucket of water and your nose dropping like the eaves and your flesh all creepy with old pimples like a child with the mizzles oh sister's child she that married with the smith had the distemperature so bad that they had to put cock stoppers in his nostrils to keep his brains from running out she was here brought up suddenly with a fit of coughing knitting work was laid by her for the night and she went upstairs with a hot brick for her feet and a little preparation of something hotter for her stomach an answer what do they call them dances the corps de ballet for asked mr very green of old roger at the theatre the old fellow was watching them intently from the pocket with a double magnifying opera glass and didn't wish to be disturbed but answered because no live dancers can jump half so high as they can mutton custard as regards this mutton custard said mrs partington as she held up the spoon with which she was stirring the preserves and let the treacle trickle back into the kettle in surreptitious ropiness and stirred it again till the little yellow eyes that bubbled on the top seemed to snap and wink at ike who sat whittling a stick and looking intently at the operation till his mouth watered again mutton custard and she smiled as the idea stole across her mind like the shadows of a cloud in summer over a green meadow full of dandelion blossoms and buttercups some new regimen for sick people i dare say but i hope it'll be better than the custards that widow grudge used to make for the poor god bless him with one egg to a quart of milk and sweetened with molasses and thought that heaven itself was too small an emuneration for what she had done but mutton custard tis martin costa said e k who had read the name to her in the post of the individual when he arrived in boston costa the hungarian well continued she it might have been worse as the girl said when she kissed the young minister by mistake in the dark entry for her cousin betsy a mistake is no haystack isaac isaac silently admitted the truth of the remark as she thrust the stick he had been whittling into the kettle and then made a drawing of the equatorial line across both cheeks and warm molasses mrs partington on the religious test the religious test among politicians exclaimed mrs partington as her opinion was asked on the great question that was then agitating the people of new hampshire and she smiled incredulously as she answered i never heard that they had any religious taste at all nor religious feeling neither for that matter we see that all the politicians they say they that ever had any religion has give it all up there is parson trot who used to compound the gospel up in the old church has come at a politicianer and where is his religious taste now i should like to know and there's lots just like him but dear madam quoth the interrogator blandly i didn't mean taste it was a test that i spoke about she inhaled a large thumb and finger full of her favourite before she spoke they testiness said she 
is quite another thing and none of em ain't no better nay they ought to be the inquirer left decidedly impressed with the originality and truth of her remark mrs partington's idea of humour what is your opinion of the humour of hawthorne mrs partington asked a young neighbour that had been reading twice told tales i don't know said she looking at him earnestly but you've got it you better take something to keep it from striking in syrup of buckthorn is good for all sorts of diseases of that kind i don't know about the humour of hawthorn but i guess the buckthorn will be beneficious we eat too much butter and butter is very humorous there was a slight tremor in his voice as he said he would try her remedy and a smile might have been perceived about his mouth next day when she asked him with a solicitous air and tone how his humour was a great curiosity dr dick in a lecture before the spunkville lyceum stated it as an interesting fact and as indicative of the progress of the age that he had in a recent journey among the green mountains discovered a sage cheese we hope the doctor will be induced to give a paper upon the subject to the world cheeses have often been noted for their activity but none of them we believe have ever been distinguished for their profundity mrs partington on extradition extradition of sins said mrs partington as she paused a moment before the bulletin board of the commonwealth during the great excitement i don't see what they want an extra edition of sims for when they had so much trouble in getting out the first one here's the commonwealth fourth edition bald and used by in here she raised her umbrella with a menacing air for the noise was strange to her when her good genius stayed her hand the umbrella the old green cotton one descended gently as a snowflake and the kind old lady invested two coppers american currency in last week's paper which the urchin chanced to have on hand irreverent one of our preachers in his sermon spoke of those who do business as travelling along the level plain of life old roger happened to be there and the old fellow reached over to his neighbour and whispered it may be a plain for some but for myself i have always found it uphill work the neighbour laughed at roger with the back of his head but kept the part grave that was towards the minister End of section five section six indignation meeting the enforcement of the law requiring our canine friends and fellow-citizens to wear collars about their necks a servile mark which no dog of spirit could for a moment consent to wear caused as might be supposed much growling among them and many teeth were shown and much dogged determination was evinced to resist the law acting upon this feeling the more energetic of the canaanites went round among their brethren counselling them to withstand the law and telling them besides that the rights of universal puppydom were in their keeping and asking them in tones of earnest entreaty if they would see those rights sacrificed without a struggle this appeal was effectual and a meeting was forthwith assembled at the old slaughter-house on south boston flats to discuss the great question of resistance it was composed chiefly of dogs whose necks had never shaped with the anonymous badge of ownership of hard-fearing dogs bone-gnawing dogs of dogs not nursed in the lap of luxury or pampered by the indulgence of favouring masters none of the silk-eared and soft-footed aristocracy but there were the huge paws from roxbury neck the shag barbs from the north end and the tough and roughers from west boston and many of minor note not a smile marked their meeting not a tail wagged not a bark disturbed the stillness and anybody with half an eye could see that each heart was nerved with mighty resolution the meeting was organized by the choice of caesar the biggest dog present for president and plato a lean dog in specs who had been very active in getting up the meeting and who was known to be an excellent reporter was appointed scribe some said in an undertone aside that the scribe had nominated himself but his well-known modesty precluded the possibility of this and it may be set down as slander the chairman on taking his seat stood up and after wagging his tail in silence for some moments expressive of his deep emotion he then proceeded to make a speech describing the object of the meeting characterized by all the profundity eloquence 
brilliancy and power that has rendered the name of caesar immortal and that has more or less marked the efforts of every chairman of every meeting since when the memory of man or dog knoweth not the contrary we regret very much that we have not this great speech to print in recommending union in their action he related an original anecdote about an old man and his sons and a bundle of sticks which was received with tremendous applause there was a struggle for the floor as the chairman ceased and amidst much yelping it was assigned to cato an old setter who called upon his hearers to keep cool and not to be in too much of a hurry they would accomplish more by masterly inactivity than by thrusting their necks in the way of danger they must remember the conduct of an ancient member of their race he must refer to it although it was humiliating to think that a dog should be such a fool who dropped a piece of beef he had in his mouth for its shadow in the water prudence with both eyes wide open tight would remove them out of the way of trouble as a last word he would advise them to lay low and look out for bricks a species of dog bane inimical to canine constitutions a heavy old dark-browed dog here arose who commenced to bay violently against the law and those who were enforcing it he was astonished he was paralyzed he was dumbfounded to hear dogs counsel coolness in this crisis the policemen are upon us we have already felt our tails within their degrading fingers i hold them and their leader in detestation he i would bark at the woman who does his washing i hate him so i would point at him in state street though not naturally a pointer i would show my teeth at him wherever i met him his excitement overpowered him and he sat down ponto a large gnarly hard-looking dog here arose and it was doubtful for a time if he could be heard for the noise and confusion which prevailed among the opposers of the law he was for law and order law was too sacred a thing to be handled without gloves it was the palladium of our liberty if the law was oppressive as it doubtless was he would suggest in his reverence for law that they grin and bear it if their necks were a little chafed the evil would be mitigated by the reflection that the law was inviolate individual grievance was nothing in comparison with this grand idea everything that is legal is right what is wrong in the individual may become right in law did the law require him to fasten the collar upon his own neck or upon the necks of those with whom he was allied he would not hesitate to do it in his regard for the law he would he was here pulled down by his tail when amid the shaggy hair which thickly covered his neck a collar was discovered fitting closely to the skin amid the confusion attending this discovery he sneaked away a sandy-haired dog named carlo next took the floor and snarled ominously as he commenced he had but a few words to say he would ask them if they were going to allow this law to be enforced for his part he would fill his pockets with pistols and with a twenty-four pounder under each arm would he go alone to oppose it his remarks produced an immense sensation among the younger portion of the audience a cry was here made for bones a venerable dog arose whose appearance excited respect he gained his feet with much difficulty and it was perceived that he had a wooden leg and bore about his person sundry other marks of dilapidation my brethren said he when the cheering which had greeted him had subsided you have before you but a sorry dog but such as i am is all that was left over from that fatal nineteenth of april when so many of our race were served up cold i was then young and ardent at the first howl of danger i left the bone i was gnawing and threw myself into the front rank of the defenders of my race alas my friends i soon found that i was barking up the wrong tree and discovered too that canine sagacity however good it might be in saving children from drowning or worrying cats could never cope with humanity armed with clubs and actuated by the love of money in a bloody fray my leg was broken with an ignominious brick in another my termination was curtailed in another my right eye closed in darkness in the world for ever with this view of the power of man and of our own weakness i would counsel caution submission even for the present resting in the assurance of the fulfilment of the ancient prophecy of the good time coming when every dog shall have his day
when basking in the broad sunshine of beneficent law we may catch flies in peaceful security fearing not the butcher's art fearing not the urchin's mischief who so reckless of our feelings persist in ornamenting our extremities with cast-off culinary utensils this speech produced a great sensation awakening the president who had fallen asleep during the pathetic part of it and a few sensitive pups near the door were so deeply affected that they had to go out and take a little wine to restore their strength this scribe who had prepared a series of resolutions before he came concluded not to submit them and let them drop back in his pocket to read some other time to private admirers and the meeting dissolved how to get out of an omnibus give the string a sudden jerk at the same instant you start from your seat to make for the door the motion of the coach will afford you an excellent opportunity of testing your powers of navigation and will not in the least annoy you although it may be annoying to those whose corns you tread on if you are timid of falling into the laps of your fellow passengers incline your body forward as if about commencing to swim and place your hands upon projecting knees on each side until you are at a right distance from the door and then make a sudden and energetic plunge at it as if attempting to carry it by storm we have seen a lady attempt this mode of egress and by skilful management contrive to sit on seven masculine laps before she reached the door it saves time to start a trifle before pulling the string you might lose a full sixteenth of a minute by waiting for the coach to stop and that is something where time is money and money is two per cent a month a literal construction preachers said a reverend gentleman should be careful in doing their master's service never to exceed their commission or take anything but the bible into their mouths bless me thought mrs partington as he said this i don't see how he could find room for anything more very well though some mouths are a great deal larger than others i remember my poor paul and his brother were digging a collar once when paul threw some dirt in his brother's mouth paul says he you filled my mouth half full of dirt his brother had a very big mouth have i said paul well just spit it outside and we shan't have any more to dig ah paul was such a queer man he was the beastmost creature what a joyous gleam shot from her specs as his reminiscence crossed her mind giving the very iron of the bows a semblance of gold in its light but the reflection cost her the whole of the fourthly a legitimate conclusion old mr brown and his son george were engaged in the haymow when the conversation turned upon california and the young man expressed a strong desire to go the old man said he shouldn't go they talked about it reasoned about it grew mad about it and the end of it all was that george showed his venerable progenitor down over the mow through a hole in the barn floor into an apple bin to the imminent risk of the venerable gentleman's neck and then ran away leaving his father in the bin among the apples the old man some months afterwards told the minister the story and the reverend very profoundly said that he thought children who showed such disrespect to their parents never came to a good end no sir said old mr brown firmly striking his hoe with energy into the turf no sir depend upon it that boys who throw their fathers down into apple bins don't go to heaven by a great sight an epigram upon the election of general peers the usual changes were made in the various subordinate offices with the usual anxiety among the outside names expressed by the following the office holders are all in a sweat said an office hoper with exultation true said old roger i never yet saw such a journal perspiration question answered where is the fire asked mrs partington of a fireman from an upper window as the bells were waking the night with a clangor in was the ungallant response naming the hottest title of perpetual warmth dear me said the old lady not comprehending him is it so far off i wish it was nearer for your sake but he'll get there soon she muttered to herself if he goes on as he does now and she went to sleep again invoking blessings on the guardians of public safety the test refused mr jabez brattle the elocutionist was introduced one day to professor and expressed himself much pleased at making that gentleman's acquaintance 
mr brattle stated to the professor that he was an ardent admirer of his works and that he could repeat evangeline and the golden legend from beginning to end he commenced the former and had not got more than half through before the professor was seen dashing wildly up school street and in fifteen minutes by the old south he stood upon cambridge bridge thankful at his escape from a bore a wholesome lesson a dog is a very singular animal said the owner of fido to old roger after they had marked the affectionate gambols of the faithful creature who now in weariness had come to lie at his master's feet a very singular animal now you see i will flog him severely suiting the action to the word and now you see him licking my hand in return old roger was moved yes said the old man severely and were i the dog i would give you a different sort of licking from that he is the noblest animal of the two and ought to change places with you let me tell you sir that a man who by a mere accident occupies the superior position and out of pure wantonness abuses the power he may possess or presumes upon that power to hurt the helpless is a scoundrel sir that dog there is a king to him and the old man turned away leaving fido and his master to experience perhaps the benefit of the lesson there is a moral in it a bootless case i wish i could find something to help my corns said mr word despondingly they ache so i'll tell you what'll cure em said one of the boarders they're large boots about two sizes larger and you now wear and your corns will be better mr word wore number twelves already and as he cast his eyes towards his feet upon hearing this advice he sighed piteously for the remedy seemed bootless young man said old roger wiping his mouth on his napkin i pity your case if you depend upon that for to carry out the plan recommended the streets would surely have to be widened and land is very dear in boston it was touching the young man upon a sore spot and he left off complaining from then perhaps true a paper begins a paragraph eulogistic price the immortal friend of mothers etc we are assured by a friend at our elbow that knows that prize is no object with some mothers and that however much it may be pretended that prize is the mother's friend it is a notorious fact that prize is obnoxious to fathers old roger's new hat for heaven's sake old woman get off my hat said roger at the concert as he saw a two hundred and fifty pounder settle on his new ventilated castor old woman it was an ungallant expression but the circumstance would seem to justify it a new hat was a new era in his existence and this was one of the latest recovering himself and pressing over his knee as best he might his crushed tile the wrinkles but too apparent he calmly continued i wouldn't object to your trying it on ma'am where there are the least chances of it fitting but it is evident that it isn't large enough i never saw a hat worn in that way before and i don't want to furnish one to experiment upon either the hat was put on but how like an apothecary's apparent is long indented it looked contrasted with its previous fair proportions the opera is very destructive to hats especially where they throw them at the singers christmas reflection i wish you a merry christmas and a happy new year with your stomach full of money and your pocket full of beer yelled ike as he skipped into mrs partington's kitchen where the old dame was busily engaged in cooking breakfast on christmas morning don't make such a noise dear said the kind old lady holding up a hand you give me a scrutinizing pain in my head and your young voice goes through my brain like a scalpel knife but what did the good santa cross put in your stocking isaac and she looked at him with an arc and pleased expression as he took out of his pockets a jackknife and a hump top painted with gaudy colours ike held them up joyously and it was a sight to see the two standing there she smiling serenely upon the boy's happiness and he grateful in the possession of his treasures ah <sighs> said she with a sigh there's many a home to-day isaac that santa cruz won't visit and many a poor child will find nothing in his stocking but his own little foot 
might have been a grain of the snuff she took it might have been a floating mote of the atmosphere but mrs partington's eyes looked humid though she smiled upon the boy before her who stood trying to pull the cord out of her reticule to spin his new top with reflection about mosquitoes there now i hope you've got it you everlasting torment said mrs partington angrily giving margaret her young neighbour who was in spending the evening with her a smart slap on her forehead and nearly throwing her from her chair at the same time knocking the britannia lamp from the table by her violent motion what's the matter inquired margaret alarmed for such conduct was very unusual and the oil from the lamp had marred her new calico it's only a pesky musketeer dear said the old lady relighting the lamp it's only a musketeer and i can't see the use of em the tormenting creatures they say the lord makes everything for some good purpose and so i think that these sort of annoysome reptiles must be made by somebody else i do the remark may be thought irreverent by some but the old lady was excited and the heat of these warm mosquito teeming evenings ought to excuse more even under such annoyance as she was suffering a passable joke old roger was at the concert one evening and as he sat awaiting the commencement of the performances in a slip where there was room for one more a gentleman came along and tapping him on the shoulder told him in a whisper that he should like to pass in sight of him old roger looked at the stranger a moment he was a large man very large upon my word sir said the old fellow i don't think you can for i have just eaten a hearty supper and from appearances i should judge that you wouldn't sit well on my stomach this was said loud enough for people in the adjacent seats to hear and in an instant eleven double spy-glasses were levelled at him the gentleman looked very red at first i mean said he pointing to the vacant seat will you allow me to pass by you to that seat certainly sir said old roger gravely and i am rejoiced to find that your request is so much more possible than i first regarded it the stranger immediately tendered old roger his hat which he magnanimously declined receiving a porcine exposure couldn't you get young pork ma'am to bake with your beans said old roger somewhat cynically as he sat at table one sunday they told me it was young said the landlady well it may be so but grey hair is not a juvenile feature by any means in our latitude ma'am continued he fishing up a grey hair about a foot and a half long with his fork he may have been young but he must have lived a very wicked life to be grey so soon as he spoke he looked along the table and a slight emotion was visible among the boarders and the man who sat opposite with his mouth full of the edibles with which he had been endeavouring to smother a laugh grew dark with the effort and then collapsed scattering dismay and crumbs amid nicely plaited folds of old roger's shirt frills i wouldn't be so bothered about my meals said a jaw printer to a brother typo who had to wait pretty often for dinner that didn't pay for waiting if i bowed it out i'd have my dinner just as soon as i could get it a knave in the church a knave in our church screamed mrs partington as her eye rested on a description of the new edifice and the offensive word struck terror to her soul a knave in our church who can it be dear me and they have been so careful too who they took in exercising him aforehand and putting him through the catechism and the lethargy and pounding him into a state of grace who can it be and the spectacles expressed anxiety i believe it must be slander after all oh what a terrible thing it is to piss in the peace of a neighbourhood deteriorating and backbiting and lying about people when the blessed truth is full bad enough about the best of us what a lesson is here for the mischief-maker to ponder upon truth lent dignity to her words and gave a beam to her countenance reminding one somewhat of a sunset in the fall on a used-up landscape mrs partington one fourth of july was much incommoded by the crowd that rushed to see the procession she said she didn't see the least need of scrouging so for she dare say the procession was full long enough to go round the pundit pund dr dig and old roger were holding an animated conversation upon the subject of california 
the doctor contending that the chances were against the emigrants thither getting recompensed for their trouble for said the doctor the ground is all occupied and those coming last have small chance of procuring a lucrative field for their operations my dear sir said old roger with animation i can assure you it is not so for i am informed by an intelligent returned californian that every man who goes to the mines has his pick the doctor however still contended for his point and could not see how it could be possible and thought old roger's friend must be mistaken punch in the head old sherry came home one night when it was so near morning that the line dividing the night from the morning was legitimately debatable and having taken an extra glass or two previous to leaving the company he had been with he was somewhat dull of apprehension and the houses seemed walking around him unaccountably and the streets by some sort of undulatory motion that he had never before noticed seemed determined to throw him down but he got home safely so far well but he had lost his night key or it was in the pocket of his other pants in the wardrobe within ten feet of the spot where mrs sherry was probably at that time reposing whose snore he even fancied he heard jarring the latch of the outside door it must be one or the other for he felt in his pockets for it in vain he didn't like to alarm the house nor the people in it for a quarter of a century's experience of the quality of mrs sherry's temper led him to know that her welcome to him in his present plight would be more warm than agreeable even if she consented to let him in at all it at last occurred to him that a window in the rear of the house could be opened from the outside and he at once resolved to gain an entrance in this manner then creep upstairs to bed and say nothing to anybody accordingly with this burglarious idea in his mind he went round to the back of the house the window was a little above his reach but he found a barrel somewhere and by skilfully manoeuvring got it beneath the window and elevated himself upon it he tried to lift the sash and it slid up easily to the desired height where he secured it with a stick mr sherry congratulated himself upon his triumphant achievement on the difficulty the outposts were won another step and he would be master of the citadel already was his foot raised to take this last step his head and shoulders were within the window when the treacherous barrel losing its equipose in the exertion mr sherry was making fell over his luckless elbow touching the stick that sustained the window it fell with a crash upon mr sherry's broad shoulders and he found himself in a trap from which he could not escape mr sherry's maiden sister a romantic damsel of thirty-five had heard the noise and as she awaked from her slumber the idea of thieves flashed across her mind she had been dreaming of brigands and robbers and the noise occurred just where a heroine was forcibly carried from her paternal home by ruffians and masks upon the spur of the moment she darted into her nephew's chamber contiguous to her and told him in a big whisper that robbers were breaking into the house and added the gratuitous and sanguinary information that they would all be murdered in their beds while she went to impart this gratifying news to the rest of the household the young man arose and without stopping to dress himself seized a big stick and went stealthily downstairs he opened the door softly of the room from which the noise proceeded and beholding the supposed burglar in the window the young sherry gave his parents head a couple of whacks with the stick when a cry from that suffering specimen of a suspended animation revealed to the young man who the victim was and with the assistance of the rest of the family who had now assembled the two hundred pounds of old sherry was soon housed such a lecture as he received either the lecture or the debauch or the cane perhaps the whole combined gave him a severe headache the next morning and he was constrained to keep his bed he summoned his son to his bedside and with an expression of grave authority he asked the young man if he didn't think he was a graceless rogue to be punching his parent's head in the way he did if he wasn't really ashamed of himself the young sherry made up a mouth in which much fun blended with considerable that was serious and replied that his respected sire would never have got any punch in his head from him had it not been for the punch he had got in his head before he came home the old sherry admitted the corn turned over and slept on it end of section six section seven matter of fact and sentiment said augustus as he gazed from mrs partington's little window his finger pensively resting upon a cracked china teapot upon the sill 
here is a spot in which to cultivate the flowers of poesy here the imagination may soar on unrestricted wing here balmy zephyrs rising from embowering roses waft ambrosial sweets them is beans planted in the window said the old lady interrupting him what you say is very true there is nothing better for sore than balmy gilead buds in rum and it's so handy to have them in a temperance neighbourhood too where people are too good to keep rum in the house themselves but leave it all to be buried of the neighbourhoods how glad i am always to have it for em they're so kind too always advising me to give up keeping it in the house but dear me what would those poor creatures do if i should i may be committing sin in keeping it but a bad use of a thing makes all the trouble after all augustus was moved but there was so much of the cart earthy in her remark that he was silent i should like to know what he meant about embowling roses murmured she to herself peppermint would be better if he has colic she looked at him earnestly but there seemed no token of pain and she forbore to speak commiseration for clerks shopkeepers is not enough thought of said mrs partington after having been out making some purchases how they do toil and how they suffer one dear pretty young man with a nice black coat on and a gold chain and a starched collar with a caravan on his neck told me with tears in his eyes that he was selling to me at less than he gave for it and i bought it out of pity though i knowed i could get it five cents a yard cheaper next door talk about moses being executed on one string indeed these poor creatures are rogerses every one of em by the odd stake and are all the time a-dying there's a constant flow of the milk of compassion in her breast inexhaustible like the purse of the gentleman in the story the more that is taken from it the more remains the allusion to moses was drawn from an advertisement of a prodigy violinist who was to play a violin solo from the oratorio of moses upon one string the bouquet look here exclaimed mrs partington in a tone of triumph as she returned from answering the doorbell bearing in her withered hand a bouquet of generous proportions and exquisite beauty with her name written in fair characters upon an accompanying card look here at the bucket of flowers somebody has sent me how charmingly it smells as well as looks and the colour is is all blinded together too so prettily at this stage of her admiration a small belay dropped upon the floor and here she continued is a letter besides written in a beautiful hand from somebody with ornamental corners from your valentine timothy toby close the missive she said not another word took one more inspiration from the bucket and busied herself in preparing the large-mouthed honey bottle for its accommodation it might have been from the projecting lily spear it might have been from a grain of subtle macaboy coming in contact with her eye and it might have been from some deeper cause but a tear escaped the area of the right eye of her specks and stood for an instant in pellucid lustre on her cheekbone before passing away through the channels time had worn in her face mrs partington on ventilation we've got a new venerator on our meeting-house said mrs partington but how on airs they can contrive to climb up there to let the excrecations go out is more than i can see into but it is such a nice intervention for keeping a house warm what sort of a ventilator is it asked we anxious to get an inkling of the old lady's philosophy it is one of the emissaries replied she sagely and it is ever so much better than professor epsom's because a room is kept so warm and comfortable by it not the least danger of taking cold from draughts of too fresh air it will be a great accusation in cold weather but how will you do in summer we again asked the dame for a moment was puzzled she had not thought of this contingency oh cried she after a few moments reflection aided by the merest trifle of macaboy at the same time proffering us the box i suppose then they will stop it up altogether and open the windows it was an idea worthy of the profound black bonnet and far-seeing specks before us she left us then we watched her from the window and felt anxious about her rheumatism as we saw her right foot sink in a in an attempt to reach a canton street omnibus 
Anyone who breathes the suffocating air of our concert rooms will be reminded of Mrs. Partington's venerator for keeping a room warm. Our relations with Mexico. Our relations with Mexico, said Mrs. Partington contemplatively, at a glance stand upward to the wall where the portrait of the deceased corporal in rigid pasteboard looked straight forward, as if indicating a bee line of duty that she should follow, a sort of pictorial sinosa to which she always looked for guidance our relations with mexico said she some of the poor creatures maybe left there in the late hospitalities too poor to go back if i was president pierce now i'd send right away and bring em all home by the express the mexicans had better not trouble any of our relations i can tell em of course she could tell em there was no doubt of it Mrs. Sled believed she could, and Ike, who was busy in transforming the old lady's new clothes, stick into a bat and say a word. If there is a weakness in Mrs. B.'s character, and as a chronicler we should be false to our trust to say that there was not, that weakness is love for her relations, continually manifesting itself in blue yarn stockings and su chong D. The first of April. I never see the like said mrs partington as she slammed to the front door with a noise and jar that set everything to dancing in the house and the timid crockery stood with chattering teeth upon the little buffet in the corner it was wrong in her to say she had never seen the like for this was the fifth time that she had been called to the door by a violent ringing within half an hour and had found no one there hence anger so rarely an occupant of her mind but so justifiable now prompted the slamming of the door and the remark i never see the like it was the first of april and the occurrence was the more annoying for this reason she stood still by the door and watched stealthily for the intruder tapped her box easily and regaled her old factories with a dusty oblation and held still the peal of the bell again startled her by its vehemence she opened the door and looked out but no one was to be seen as she turned away a string attached to the bell wire extending from the banister met her gaze and sitting quietly upon the stairs with a grin on his face that had a world of meaning in it and the world of fun in it said ike how the spectacle sparkled in the rays of her indignation she went for the rod which had long rested on the shelf but it had been manufactured three days before into an arrow by ike and as the chance of finding it diminished her anger cooled like hot iron in the air and the rogue escaped an inquiry answered does isaac manifest any taste for poetry mrs partington asked the schoolmaster's wife while conversing on the merits of the youthful partington the old lady was basking a chicken that her friends had sent her from the country oh yes said the old lady smiling he's very partially fond of poultry and it always seems as if he can't get enough of it the old spit turned by the fireplace in response to her answer while the basting was going on i mean said the lady does he show any of the divine flatters the old lady thought a moment as for the divine flatness i don't know about it he's had all the complaints of children and when he was a baby he fell and broke the cartridge of his nose but i hardly think he's he's had this that you speak of the roasting chicken hissed and sputtered and mrs partington basted it again bailed out so our neighbour mr guzzle has been arranged at the bar for drunkardies said mrs partington and she sighed as she thought of his wife and children at home with cold weather close at hand and the searching winds intruding through the chinks in the windows and waving the tattered curtain like a banner where the little one stood shivering by the faint embers god forgive him and to pity them said she in a tone of voice tremulous with emotion but he was bailed out said ike who had devoured the residue of the paragraph and laid the paper in a pan of liquid custard that the dame was preparing for thanksgiving and sat swinging the oven door to and fro as if to fan the fire that crackled and blazed within bailed out was he said she well i should think it would have been cheaper to have pumped him out for when our cellar was filled after the city fathers had degraded the street we had to have it pumped out though there wasn't half so much in it as he has swilled down 
she paused and reached up on the high shelves of the closet for her pie plates while ike busied himself in tasting the various preparations the dame thought that was the smallest quart of sweet cider she had ever seen have you got a baby a bachelor friend of ours was riding upon a time through the state when he overtook a little girl and boy apparently on their way to school the little girl appeared to be a five or six years old and was as beautiful as a fairy her eyes were lit up with a gleam of intense happiness and her cheeks glowed with the hues of health our bachelor looked at her for a moment admiringly she met his glance with a smile and with an eager voice saluted him with have you got a baby he was struck aback by the question and something like a regret stole over his mind as he looked upon the animated and beautiful little face before him no he answered well she replied drawing her tiny form proudly up we have and passed on still smiling to tell the joyous news to the next one she might meet what a world of happiness to her was concentrated in that one idea the baby and in a joy she felt as if all must have the same delight as herself and it was a matter of affectionate pride to her that lifted her little heart above the reach of ordinary care for in the baby was her world and what else had she to crave such was the reflection of our friend and he remembered it long enough to tell it to us a home truth what a to-do they make about treating the slaves bad at the south said mrs partington and everybody strained their ears to catch an opinion that perhaps was fraught with the destiny of millions there was a slight tremor in her voice a sort of rumbling before the bustin of the volcano and her eye looked troubled as a lake by a fitful gust what a to do they do make about it to be sure but some of our folks don't do much better i know a poor old colored man here in boston that they treat jest like a nigger people ain't no better than scribes pharisees and hippogriffs that say one thing and do another there is truth in thy remarks o most esteemable mrs p our philanthropy we fear if weighed in a just balance would be found often sadly wanting a seasonable pun fine gloves them said old roger as he held out his hand encased in a new pair he had just bought an assent was expressed but continued he can you tell me why a man is more likely to get taken in while buying gloves in the winter than in summer they couldn't i'll tell you then it's because they are more apt to get worsted very close veins what is the matter with mrs jukes doctor asked mrs partington as dr bolus passed her house she had been watching for him for half an hour through a chink in the door and people who detected the end of a nose thrust out of the chink of aforesaid stopped an instant to look at it strongly inclined to touch it and see what it was she is troubled with varicose veins ma'am replied the doctor blandly do tell cried the old lady well that accounts for her very coarse behaviour then and it isn't any fault of her after all poor woman cause what is to be will be and if one has very coarse veins what can one expect ah we're none of us better than we ought to be good morning ma'am said dr bolus as he turned away and the old lady shut the door no better than we ought to be what an original remark and how candid the admission the little front entry heard it and the broad stair that led to the chamber heard it and ike heard it as he sat in the kitchen daubing up the old lady's pembroke table with flour paste in an attempt to make a kite out of a choicely saved copy of the puritan recorder we're no better than we ought to be generally mrs partington on vacation five weeks vexation in august said mrs partington when she heard that the school had a vacation for five weeks five weeks vexation it is a trying season for mothers and wearing and tearing to, to their patients and the jackets and trousers of the children talk about the relaxing from study i don't believe it's half as bad as the green apples they get in the country but i do love to see the little dears enjoying themselves frisking about like pigs in clover as happy as the days is long what an idea of freedom there is in a little boy with his face and hair full of molasses and fun and good nature be still you good for nothing cried she as ike attempted to take her snuff-box be still i say 
but it was not an anger for she felt in her capacious pocket and from away down under her snuff-box and thimbles and bone buttons and needles and pincushions and beeswax she brought up a ball of variegated hues and smiled as she gave it into his eager hand and bade him be a good boy torchlight patriotism hooray hooray yelled ike as he dashed in at the front door with a lighted torch swinging it over his head and spattering the oily fluid around upon the tables and chairs a drop even falling upon the snow-white table cover that lay folded up on a shelf the smoke of the torch filled the kitchen and rolled along the snow-white ceiling in murky volume to the great annoyance of mrs partington who always said if there was anything on earth that she held in utter excrescence it was isle what's to pay now said the dame rising and she heard through the floor the noise made by the unterrified democracy in torchlight procession assembled paul was a democrat and the sympathy kept time with the martial music quite a furrer said we to her as we recognized her a tremendous cheer interrupted us a few roar said she smiling i think it is a good many roar ah continued she i do love to see the unclarified democracy in possession with the torches a-blazing and the patriotism a-busting she felt patriotic her face was momentarily lit up with the emotions of her soul and the light of a roman candle and then the venerable countenance melted away in the darkness as the candle after making a great effort to sustain itself became exhausted and snuffed itself out mrs partington on suffrage how these men do talk about exercising their right of suffering said mrs partington as if nobody in the world suffered but themselves they don't think of our sufferings we poor creatures must suffer and say nothing about it and drink cheap tea and be troubled with the children and scar and scrub our souls out and we never say a thing about it but a man comes on regularly once a year like a farmer's almanac and grumbles about his sufferings and it's only then just to choose a garner after all these men are hard creatures to find out and ain't worth much after you have found em out this was intended as a lesson to margaret who was working charlotte and werter on a blue ground at her side but margaret had her own idea of the matter and remained silent down with the tyrant ha ha down with the tyrant death to the spaniard shouted ike as he rushed into the kitchen brandishing paul's old artillery sword that had hung so long on the wall he struck an attitude and then struck the upright portion of the stove funnel till it rung with the blow and mrs partington with amazement on her countenance and the glass lamp in her hand stood looking at him ike had been reading the thrilling tale of the black avenger or the pirate of the spanish main and his intellects as sir hugh evans might say were absorbed by the horrible don't isaac dear said mrs partington as she spoke in a gentle but firm tone you are very scarifying and it don't look well to see a young boy acting so it comes i know of reading them yellow cupboard books you should read good ones and if you won't touch that again i will let you have my big bible king james aversion with the beautiful pictures i declare i don't know what i shall do with you if you carry on so i'm afraid i shall have to send you to a geological cemetery to get the old sancho out of you the point of the sword was lowered as it was making a passage for a dark spot in the centre panel of the door the eye of the boy so fiercely lit by the spirit of the black avenger became mild and laughing as he said he was only making believe and mrs partington gave him a penny as she disarmed him what a visible emotion of peanuts became manifest as he grasped the copper and made tracks for the door and climbed over the snow drifts to reach the grocer's opposite mrs partington and the clerk is the steamer signified sir asked mrs partington at the telegraph station yes m'm replied the clerk who was busily engaged turning over the leaves of his day-book can you tell me continued she if the queen's enroachment has taken place yet some say she's enroaching all the time said the clerk looking pleasantly at the old lady and evidently pleased with his own smartness that is impossible responded the venerable dame but said she to herself 
how could he be expected to know about such things and yet there is no reason why he shouldn't for all the bastard signs not me and them things is let down nowadays and nater is shown all undressed like a puppet show sixpence a sight good morning sir said she as he bowed her out and as she passed down the stairs her mind grasping the manifold subjects of the telegraph queen and facilities and signs became oblivious in a fog thought for thanksgiving day this day long celebrated in new england again returns amid whose festivities the heart expands itself and awakes a new cheerful life though the whole year has bounded with selfish fetters and it has pursued unremittingly its aim of worldly gain or worldly advancement on this day all the avenues to its genialities are thrown open and troops of kindly feelings long strangers come thronging back to their early home as their possessors return on this glad season and revisit the source from whence they sprung it is a time of glee and a time of thankfulness the twin feelings of the season the joy of meeting after long separation the gathering of friendly faces about the generous board the hilarious song and the graceful dance the sports of childhood and the heart mingling of youth old enough and willing to love all are worship and offerings of thankfulness where sweet innocence lends a charm it was known months ago that tom was to come home from the city of thanksgiving he had been gone a whole year and when his great red face had disappeared it seemed for a while as if the sun had ceased to shine his first letter was an event in the lives of the old folks at home and tom's sisters and tom's sisters had to carry the letter all around the neighborhood that people might see how well he could write and what proper words he used and how he crossed his t's and minded his eyes but tom has written many letters since and the novelty has worn off but the affection around the old homestead is as bright as ever and tom is actually coming home to thanksgiving and the girls will pinch his red cheeks and tease him with their kindness as they used to do his last letter tells his father that he must have the mare at the depot by six o'clock the girls insist that they will drive down to meet him they are not afraid of a horse not they and go they will the house is swept and the wood is piled up in the best room fireplace and the floor is newly sanded and the chair with the new tidy that bella has knit is in its place for master tom when he comes for tom has got to be a character and it is a question if more preparation could be made for a king's reception the old folks talk of his coming and a softer expression than usual mingles in their voices and the clock is watched for the hour of his appearing here they are at last and the red-faced boy gets out father mother god bless you both and he is a child again the child of the old homestead and he loves every stick in the old house better than ever before tis not time to talk yet about the big city that is reserved for the evening when they are seated round the cheerful fire now he must answer the questions about his health and if his last stockings fitted and what he thought when he heard his aunt deborah had got married and if his cousin john had given him the little bible his old school mistress sent him they knew he had because tom had said so in a letter home and if he heard that his cousin sally had got a baby heavens how the questions pour in upon him and will until he gets his turn to ask and theirs comes to answer this is a picture sample of a thousand such freights of happiness are borne on every railroad car the steam whistle of the locomotive conveys a thrill of pleasure to many a listening heart the hum of business palls the ear that listens for happiness and the shutters are put up for one day the heart's jubilee though sin and excess may mark and mar its hilarity an aggregate of joy remains to it commensurate with the virtue that remains to us the noise of the turkey is heard in the land ovations are made to the genius of plenty groaning tables pave the way to groaning stomachs and thankfulness works its way out between the scant apertures left in compact stomach stowage heaven give the rich heart to help the poor and to make them thankful on this day in spite of the three hundred and sixty-four other days of hardship and privation peace inculcated better is a crust of bread and quietness therewith than a stolid ox in strife said mrs pottington as she heard the noise of rang in a neighbour's house it was a sunday morning and ike was cleaning his shoes by the door with a clothes brush why can't folks live in peace without distension how much people have to answer for that causes animosity in a neighbourhood 
thank heaven i have never done anything of that kind that my conscience acquits me of with what a feeling this was uttered and the sunlight came into the window and looked through her specks down into her soul and it was as calm there as the bottom of a well not disturbed by alex's whistling old dan tucker as an accompaniment to his brush human nature seat eleven millionaires in an omnibus and seat between them one old woman who has but five coppers in the world which she intends to invest in that one right when the collector comes in and the old lady takes out her antique wallet to pay him it is curious to observe the avidity and eagerness with which the millionaires watch her operations and peep over to catch a glimpse at the interior of the wallet this is human nature mr steadfast soliloquy well my mind's at last made up i'm going against rum this election i've made up my mind on that pint and there's no shaking me when i say my mind's made up folks may know what to depend on yes i go against rum it's time we looked about us it's time the people got their eyes open to the evil and i'm one of em but stopping suddenly the party what would the party say i didn't think of that before the party of course must be looked into what could we do with our party where would the union be and our institutions and what do you call it if it wasn't for the party i should like to know parties are eagers our pal pal what's his name but i can't go against rum without going against party if i vote against rum and the temperance inspectors and constables and things are chosen where would our institutions be on our destiny as a nation and the respect of people abroad who we don't care a copper about and then if i vote for party and rum triumphs it would go on undermining our moral institutions and our physical constitutions so hang me betwixt them both if i know what to do have it i make a compromise between cold water and rum and make it half rum and the other half rum and water that's the ticket and my mind's made up to vote it when my mind's made up there's no moving me mrs partington ruralizing mrs partington and i were huckleberrying in the country and a large swamp was barely canvassed to fill in the quart which she bore in a five quart pail she despaired of filling it look here aunt said ike in a sort of confidential whisper look in there and see what a lot of em there was a smile upon the face of the boy that betokened mischief or it might have been a gleam of satisfaction at the prospect of filling the pail but certainly a smile was round the little mouth and the eye caught it and a roguish twinkle like a sunbeam lay sparkling there i see said the old lady and a moment later the log cabin bonnet borrowed for the occasion was seen about the tops of the bushes its restlessness indicating its wearer's activity ike remained outside fizz buzz what was that a humblebee as we are a sinner another and another the log cabin was besieged and mrs partington rushed frantically from the bushes swinging the tin pail and crying shoo shoo with all her might was a trying time for the widow of corporal paul and ike did not escape for a big humble bee attacked him and he roared heartily with a sting upon his cheek the laugh disappeared at the recital of their troubles at home people regarded the matter as a trick of ike's but how could he have known about the humble bee's nest being in there mrs partington avowed that she never was so frustrated by anything in her born days and the people believed her she thinks notwithstanding the bees that she would like to have a villain in the country and become an amatory farmer ventilation in the course of his rambles in the country mr spotgam called at a poor-looking house by the roadside to inquire the whereabouts of a trout brook which he had supposed to be in the vicinity some pretty children attracted his attention and he stepped inside the door to play with them and invest a few cents in the refection the father came in a moment afterwards and appeared somewhat confused to find a stranger in his humble domicile warm sir said he wiping his forehead wife throw up the window and let us have a mouthful of fresh air mr spotcam looked at the window about to be thrown up and saw with pain that every square of glass had been broken out his mind turned to a nice mathematical calculation in which he endeavoured to make out the difference between the quantity of air received through an open window and one with no glass in it and gave it up in despair. End of section seven. Section eight.
Letter from Ike in the Country Hilltop, September 10th, 1852 Dear Bob, I wish you was up here, and the way we would train you wouldn't be slow. There is boys enough up here, but they don't know nothing. When I first come, they didn't know how to play jack stones. But you better believe I soon made em fly round. I've found enough to do since I've been here. We've got a boat, and we go out swimming every day. The boat tips ever so easy, and don't you think, the other day, when we were out with the girls, we tipped over right where the water was overhead, and we all had to get on to her bottom. I wasn't at all scared, though everybody said they know they did it on purpose, but you know I wouldn't. We've had some prime fun out of gunning. We didn't kill anything, only some tame pigeons, but we put some green beans in the gun and shot the dog, and he kee-heed just as if he didn't like it. I can fire at a mark first rate. I wish you could see the goose I made with the wheel grease on the newly painted barn door, its peppered brim full of holes. There's lots of apples and peaches, and if you was here we'd be in among em. There's some over in there in the pasture, just like some in our garden, but them in the pastures is best, and they belong to the old captain, and he's a cross old fellow, and I should like to fix him, cause he set his dog on me the other day because I fired an apple at one of his hens and broke a square of glass. He's a real cross old chap and hasn't got no friends. There's some fine ponds here and lots of mud turtles, but all that is humbug about their leaving their shell when you put a coal of fire onto their backs because I've tried it. It makes them go it though, I tell you. Our dog is first rate for catching of him, and I got a dozen of them the other day to bring home and put him in a barrel and forgot all about him and there they stayed for ten days. I put him in the water again, and away they went. Don't you think, Bob, I caught a big bull paddock and harnessed him the other day, and you should have seen him kick when I let him go. I don't like the oxen they have here, because they don't laugh, and when they are hauling anything they seem to do it unwilling-like, and look surly and cross. Reasoning with them don't do no good. I ride the horse to water and drive the geese out of the corn. Up in the corn yesterday I found what I thought was a great big watermelon, and when I got over the wall and cut it, it turned out to be a green pumpkin. They have begun to make sweet cider, and I don't see what people ever want to make sour cider for when this is so nice. I suppose school will begin soon and the old woman will want me to come home, but I don't want to a mite. Tell Jim Jones I swapped my jackknife and got a brand new hockey and that I cut myself in the bushes. Goodbye, Bob. Write to me if you've had any fun this summer, and I'm yours in Clover, Ike Pottington. Out of Place Does your arm pain you much, sir? asked a young lady of a gentleman who had seated himself near her in a mixed assembly and thrown his arm across the back of her chair and slightly touched her neck. No, miss, it does not. But why do you ask? I noticed it was considerably out of place, sir, replied she. That's all. The arm was removed. Tender names. There are people in the romantic period of their lives who delight in bestowing tender terms upon objects of their affection, borrowed from the pretty things of nature or fancy, such as my rosebud, my pink, my diamond, my lily, or some such nice and delicate name. Of all that we have ever heard, however, the Irish term my bloomer sounds to us the best. These terms are well enough when used in private endearment, but when uttered in the presence of others, they operate with the most nauseating effect. Fancy a man, brimful of the charms of his Dulcinea, to whom he has given some romantic appellative, coming into a tailor's shop among the forty girls there employed, of whom his heart's hope is one, and asking if his rosebud is present, or addressing her as his rosebud if she be there. If the girl has any sense, she will prove a rosebud with a thorn when she gets him out somewhere. We had a friend who was smitten with his mania for pretty names, and had adopted the romantic one of My Light for his idol, and for several years she had lighted his path in his pocket in the way that lovers understand. It grew near the period when the word was to be spoken that should make them one flesh, when calling at her dwelling one evening, he asked the house girl who met him in the entry if his light was in. No, said she, your light has just gone out with Mr. Naming an old rival. 
jealous pain seized him he rushed to his boarding house dashed madly upstairs three at a time opened his drawer and seizing a pen wrote a letter that extinguished his light for ever it was a severe blow to his spirit and in six months from the time of its disappointment the poor fellow committed matrimony with another and a more steady light the flame of which burns undimmed even now learning to relish it we were surprised to see mr slow at an opera one evening leaning over the back of his seat we remarked that we had an impression that he didn't like opera music i never did said he till lately but i've been educating for it it can be done talk about nature's having all to do with it that's all humbug nature don't have anything more to do with it than she does with learning us to eat tomatoes nor sardines nor olives but by education we come to like him that's just the way with opry music the first time you don't like it then you get another taste and it's better then you go a little further and it's first rate there's nothing like education nature is well enough in her place but education just the job mr stull looked grave as he uttered this oracular wisdom and his auditors admired phlebotomy a disease do you think people are troubled as much with flea bottomry now doctor as they used to before they discovered the anti-bug bedstead asked mrs partington of the family doctor of the old school who attended upon the family where she was staying phlebotomy madam said the doctor gravely is a remedy not a disease well well replied she no wonder one gets them mixed up there are so many of em we never heard in old times of tonsils in the throat or embargoes in the head or neurology all over us or consternation in the bowels as we do in nowadays but it's an ill wind that don't blow nobody no good and the doctors flourish on it like a green base tree but of course they don't have anything to do with it they can make them come or go the doctor stepped out with a genteel bow and the old lady watched him till his cabriolet had turned the corner her mind revolving the intricate subject of cause and effect hirsute ornaments well said mrs partington as she leaned forward with her hands resting on the window ledge and peered out into the street through a chink in the blinds it wasn't a deep well expressive of content or satisfaction but it was an ejaculatory well that found expression at some object which she had witnessed in the street well said she i hope that man is married i declare i do because if he isn't i'm sure he never will be for a dreadfuller looking creature i never did see with them musty chokes on his mouth nobody wouldn't have him i've heard him say that heaven's best gift to man was woman i should say that the next best gift was a razor to such a man as that folks didn't take pride in looking bad in old times she turned thoughtfully to the wall where hung in military rigidity that profile the cherished gem of bygone art the counterfeit presentment of manly grace ah paul sighed the dame you was an ornament of your species and the cheapest among ten thousand or more she emphasized the more as if the contrast was very great indeed between paul and him who had passed but the profile took no notice of what she said its gaze chained to the perpetual straightforwardness looked never to the right or left though at times she said it bore a kinder expression about the mouth but this must have been her fancy which gave to every object she looked upon the hues of her own benignity mrs partington and probate oh what trials a poor widow has to go through sighed mrs partington rocking herself in a melancholy way and holding the morsel of macaboy untasted between her thumb and finger terrible trials and oh what a hardship it is to be executioner to an intestine estate where enviable people are trying every way to overcome the widow's might where it's probate 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 all the time and the more you probe it the worse it seems the poor widow never gets justice for if she gets all she don't get half enough i have had one trial of it and if i ever should marry again if it should so please providence to order it i'll make my husband fabricate his will before he orders his wedding cake i'll take time by the foretop as solomon says you may depend upon it she here revived a little and the subtle powder passed to its destination and reported itself home by an emphatic sneeze 
extract from a great unwritten poem of 1051 verses entitled ye constable ye constable from one man took a large and ample fee i'll now take one from ye the other side said ye constable said he domestic purity impugned impugned have you got any rooms to let here ma'am said a little man to mrs partington who occupied half of a house the other half of which was to let and to whom was entrusted the care of answering the doorbell the rooms were shown they're not large said the little man depreciatingly no sir replied she they're not very ruminous but here are two little bedrooms contagious that perhaps you didn't see he looked in and in a supercilious tone muttered bugs implying want of cleanliness a reflection on the purity of the premises in her charge there is a point as she says where patience ceases to be virtuous and she had found it indignation choked her utterance and the little man fortunately departed before it found vent it was great the way in which she slammed the door to after him and ejaculated bugs till the empty rooms in echoing it seemed full of bugs it was a sublime moral spectacle did it hurt you much well on there did dwell a barber in one of the most populous streets of the city the hues of whose insignia by the street door red and white were typical often of his customers chins as they came under his professional hand suds was a little fellow but many a huge six-footer did he have unresisting by the nose and many a fierce eye quailed beneath the gleam of that blade whose edge so many had keenly felt it was a sublime spectacle to behold him while enjoying his momentary triumph his face absolutely shiny between the combined influence of sweat and exultation his razor urged by the fervour of his excitation whirling through seas of snowy lather with the rapidity of thought his customer meanwhile with eyes shut and breath suspended awaiting tremblingly the blow that should send him forth noseless a scoff and a reproach among men though thanks to mighty science such a calamity seldom happened a farmer who resided in the vicinity of the city and supplied the people thereof with fruit was excessively annoyed by the boys who would climb upon his wagon and bite his apples while inquiring the price and pretending a desire to purchase he took a big and fearful oath one day he was a very crabbed man that the first boy who that day took a bite should likewise take a cut with it he swore it on his whip he jogged on undisturbed the urchins read whiplash in his demeanour and judiciously gave him a wide berth but fate that generally has to bear the odium of causing all evil that by many is deemed a sort of subordinate providence who in conjunction with luck another genius of the same kidney takes the destiny of men to work out by the job pull the reins directly opposite the barber's door now mrs suds had that very day charged mr s to procure some fruit she did long so to eat an apple and he as he was looking out of his window his last customer having departed was minded of her request as the wagon with its rich and tempting load stopped within the range of his vision he was fond of apples himself and running hastily out he stepped upon the wagon wheel took up an apple and bit it and at the same time inquired the price fatal bite to such fatal as the first bite in paradise was to adam a whistling sound he heard in the air and then the whip stinging with the malignity of the concentrated spite fell quick upon his unguarded shoulders to his deep shame and astonishment and pain jumping down as quick as he could he stood on the pavement an injured and indignant man and fiercely demanded the cause of the outrage the farmer had mistaken him for a boy and profuse of apology endeavoured to appease the little lion of the brush by stating his annoyance by the boys to say nothing of his loss by biters and his determination to put a stop to it by the summary means he had given suds a taste of suds was a reasonable man and admitted that the farmer was nearly right even while he shrugged his shoulders with the remembered pain and they parted on as good terms as the circumstances would admit of unfortunately for the peace of the little man a neighbour who loved to stir up suds had seen the castigation and each day as he came to be shaved would he ask with a tenderest solicitude did it hurt you much always after shaving however for his nose would certainly have been in the way during the agitation the question produced had he asked it before 
that question so sneeringly asked human nature couldn't stand it patience couldn't stand it suds couldn't stand it and that question was a declaration of war with all who put it to him continual dropping will wear a stone one day suds was splitting wood in the backyard like a dentist working away among the old stumps fretting at the undrivable tenacity with which they held together when sticking his axe into one apparently on the point of yielding he swung it above his head to bring it down upon a block and thus forced the axe effectively through the tough fibres the axe with the wood adhering was raised aloft the blow was about to be struck but slipping from the iron the block took another direction and fell heavily upon the hatless pall of the unfortunate barber his wife had seen the whole proceeding from the window and rushed out to ascertain the extent of the damage she anxiously inquired mr suds did it hurt you much to say that fire flashed from his eyes would be inadequate chain lightning alone could typify the glance he gave the solicitous mrs s and a small thunderbolt like a bullet of wood darted upon the wings of a fierce anathema at her devoted head she dodged the missile in a smashed window remained a monument of his passion poor sads he soon removed from that locality and the little shop where he shaved and sheared and suffered is obliterated by the huge granite piles that indicate the progressiveness of commerce fair ma'am how do you do dear said mrs partington smilingly shaking hands with burbank in the dark square omnibus as he held out his five dexter digits towards her fair ma'am said he in reply to her inquiry well i'm sure i am glad of it and how are the folks at home fair ma'am continued he still extending his hand the passengers were interested how'd you like boston screamed she as the omnibus rattled over the stones fair ma'am shouted he without drawing back his hand i want you to pay me for your ride oh murmured she i thought it was someone that knowed me and rummaged down in the bottom of her reticule for a ticket finding at last five copper cents tied up in the corner of her handkerchief the lost war handkerchief with the stars and stripes involved in it and the action of the constitution and guerrier stamped upon it but the smile she had given him at the first was not withdrawn there was no allowance made for mistakes at the counter and he went on with a lighter heart and a heavier pocket to cash the other coach paying promptly if there is any place in this world where i like to ransack business more than another said mrs partington with animation untying from the corner of her handkerchief a sum of money she had just received if there's any place better than another it's a bank there's no dilly dalliance and beating down and bothering you with a thousand questions till you don't know whether your heels are up or your head is down all you have to do is put your bill on the counter and they pay it without saying a word the old lady had presented a cheque for a quarter's pension money received an account of paul who in the last war served a fortnight in fortifying boston harbour and got mortar in his eyes which hurt his visionary organs so that he took to glasses memento mori before old roger left boarding at number forty seven he forfeited all regard of the quiet inmates of the house by the perpetration of the following atrocity which was the true reason of his leaving and not the quality of the bread pudding as many believed maury the kilby street clerk got married and moved off it had always been a custom with maury to pile his dishes up in a curious manner after he had used them cups saucers plates in a heterogeneous heap a day or two after his departure from the house old roger was observed piling his cup and saucer and plates in the same manner and he took those of his neighbour to add to the pile the boarders watched him silently in much surprise and one of them a little bolder than the rest ventured to ask him what he was doing that for oh said roger very placidly crowning the pile he had made with the cover of the sugar bowl i am only erecting a memento mori mr bluffkins the serious man exhorted the more volatile boarders on the impropriety of laughing at such an outrageously sacrilegious use of a respectable dead language from that day roger had cold shoulder for dinner and the coldness of the landlady became suddenly manifest in cold potatoes and in the rheumatic condition of his rheumatic so he left 
Mesmerism. Do you believe in mesmerism? We asked of Mrs. Partington as she dropped alongside of us yesterday morning like a jolly old 74. Believe what? said she, sitting down in the other chair. The question involved an answer from us of some 15 minutes length, running through the whole of mesmerism, clairvoyance, and psychological phenomena, like a knitting needle running through a ball of yarn. Oh, yes, said she. I believe all of that, and I know a case in point to prove it. When Miss Jeems had her silver-plated spoons extracted, that was her mother's afore her, and she sought a sight by him, she come away to Boston to see a misery miser, I believe you call it. Well, he told her just where her spoons was, and who stole him, and all about it, and the color of his hair, and all that. Well, she gave him a dollar, and when she got home, she went right where the spoons was, and couldn't find a thing about him. No, no, that isn't the story, another. Uh, tis about Sally Sprague and her boat. You see... At this instant the door opened and company came in and Mrs. Paddington, pleading an excuse that she wanted to attend one of the adversary meetings, subsided like a wave upon the shore. A slight mistake. Mr. Very Green, passing by the entrance to a hall where some sable minstrels were exhibiting, saw a black fellow coming out through the ark. Mr. V stopped and looked at him earnestly at which the colored gentleman was rather indignant, and demanded what he was looking at. "'Nothing particular,' said Mr. Wee. "'I was just looking to see what a plagny difference there is betwixt you now and last night, when you were a-singing in there. I wouldn't have believed it it was the same individual.' Mr. Wee put his hands in his pocket and walked along. "'Considerably true.' We find it stated in a paper that a well-bred woman, if surprised in a somewhat careless costume, does not try to dodge behind a door to conceal deficiencies, nor does she turn red and stammer confused excuses. She remains calm and self-possessed, and makes up in dignity what she may want in decoration. This is true. The most sensible woman we ever saw was one who, when her husband took us home on a washing day to look at his new house, never made one word of apology for the confusion that existed, nor once begged us not to look around. Old Bull's Concert Old Bull's Concert, said Mrs. Partington, glancing up from her knitting as she read the announcement of the grand concert on Saturday evening and she smiled as a ridiculous fancy ran through her mind like a grasshopper in a stubble field of an old bull giving a concert. And yet, it isn't so very wonderful, continued she, for I remember a cat and a canary that lived together, and one or the other of them used to sing beautifully. But I wonder what he plays on. I suggested that he played on one of his own horns, which seemed to be reasonable. I am glad he is going to give his concert, because when I went out to hear a great artisan play on a violin, as they called it, though I found out afterwards it was nothing but a fiddle, they were going to charge a dollar till I told them I was one of the connections of the post, and they let me in. I can't think what music an old bull can make, I'm sure. It must be very uproarious, I should think, and better fitted for overtones than for pastoral music. She closed a critic with a pinch of snuff and got on to her wives again like a telegraphic dispatch and went ahead, while Ike amused himself by scratching his name with a board nail in magnificent Roman capitals upon the newly painted panel of the kitchen door. Angular Saxons I don't know, said Mrs. Partington, and the expression, considered as a mere abstraction, was true, for there are some that have more of the world's wisdom and a better knowledge of grammar than the dame, for the school for her teaching was not one of the letters. But let us hear her. I don't know, said she, about these Angler Saxons being any better than our old-fashioned ones. Ike had been reading to her an article upon the destiny of the Anglo-Saxon race. And as for the race, Isaac, and her voice fell to a pitch of deep solemnity as she spoke. It isn't proper at all, for when a funeral goes too quick, to say nothing about racing, it always is a forerunner, sometimes that somebody'll die before the year's out. The old Saxons were full fast enough, naturally, and art of the parish gin our Saxon the surfeit of plate for his officious services, it spruced him right up, and it seemed as if it would have pleased him to bury all of them. 
He was so grateful. No, no, we don't want any Angler Saxons, Isaac, when our own are full good enough. Ike, as she was talking, had amused himself with tying the old lady's snuff box in the corner of his handkerchief and was experimentally swinging it around his head, and she seized just as the box, released from the knot, dashed against the opposite side, scattering the pungent powder in plenteous profusion upon the sanded floor. Of course he didn't mean to do it, and that was all that saved him. End of section 8 Section 9 what a guess. Well, that is a discovery, exclaimed Mrs. Partington smilingly, and she stood with a small pitcher in her right hand, her left resting upon the table, and her eyes fixed upon the flame of a glass lamp that sputtered a moment and then shot out a light that irradiated every part of the little kitchen and revealed the portrait of Paul upon the wall and Ike asleep by the fire. She spoke to herself. It was a way she had. She met with no contradiction from that quarter. This is a discovery. Where is Tom Payne and his gas now, I should like to know? Here I've been and filled this lamp up with water, and it burns just as well as a real aisle. This experiment was perfectly triumphant. The problem of light from water was demonstrated, and yet, with this vast fact revealed to her, Mrs. Partington, with a modesty equal to that of the great philosopher who picked up a pocketful of rocks on the shore of the great ocean of truth, smiled with delight at her discovery. Not once thought of getting out a patent or selling rights. Mrs. Partington at the Opera we were surprised at the opera last evening by having a hand placed upon our shoulder. It was a gentle touch, altogether unlike certain other touches on the shoulder that delinquent men so much dread. It came at a time when we were all absorbed by the melody of the charming Sontag, and were provoked at the intrusion. "'Will you be kind enough to lend me your observatory?' asked a voice that we thought we remembered. Looking around, "'Great heavens!' we cried." mrs partington it was indeed that estimable dame but yet it was not for the black bonnet had disappeared and a new rigolette adorned her venerable pole beneath which every sprig of wavy grey was securely tucked but the smile was there as warm as a june morning at nine o'clock she repeated the request to use the pearl and diamond studded opera glass that we had hired at fetridge's for twenty-five cents denominating it an observatory is this a right pocus said she i suppose i shall have to digest it to my side for my poor visionary orgies are giving out she levelled both barrels at the singers at once and brought them down to her and pasolini directed three successive appeals to her tenderness it ain't no use said she as she handed the glass i can't understand better with that i should have bought one of the laboratories at the door she beat time gracefully to the music for a while upon the cover of her snuff-box and then went out like an exhausted candle to try and light on ike who was trading for a jackknife with another boy in the gallery stairs a slight misapprehension mrs partington was at thackeray's last lecture mr t had kindly sent her a card admitting one and forgetting the theme of the lecture she leaned over the seat and asked the gentleman before her what the subject was goldsmith and stern ma'am was the reply but he's on stern first mrs partington blushed there was evidently a question agitating her mind as to whether she should tarry and hear a lecture from a person so ridiculously postured as mr t must appear she looked around meditating a retreat but the avenue to escape was blocked up and she thought she might as well stay it out she watched tremblingly for mr thackeray and was much relieved by seeing him standing perpendicularly before her she thought she must have mistaken the meaning of her informant. Apollyon Bonaparte When will the world get rid of this Apollyon Bonaparte? said Mrs. Partington, as I threw down the paper in which she had read a comparison between the 18th Brumaire and the Coupe d'Etat. In the uncertain glimmerings of her memory, she confounded the nephew and uncle, and her thought took the course the dim reminiscence pointed. Apollyon Bonaparte? 
i remember all about him and his eighteenth blue mare too i always wondered where he got so many of em something like the woolly horse i guess and when he was transplanted to st domingo isaac folks went up to the king's chapel to sing tedium about it because they were glad of it and now he's come back again with all his blue mares with him the dropping of a stitch brought her down from the new hobby she was riding so furiously and ike drew a picture of a blue mare in chalk upon the newly washed kitchen floor mrs partington says she don't see why people want to be always struggling for wealth for her part she affirms that all she wants is food and raiment and clothes to wear to meeting paul and politics was paul inclined to politics we asked of mrs partington as we saw the old dame leading a grand rally handbill at the corner of the grocery store she asked us to wait a moment till she digested her specs inclined to politics said she and her eyes rested upon the period at the end of the last line till she seemed to be meditating at a full stop he was but he wasn't a propagander nor an oligarchist or an aversionist nor a demigod as some of em are all he wanted was an exercise of his sufferings and the use of elective franchise as he used to say ah heaven rest him exclaimed she as her eyes rose from the period at the bottom of the and rested on the top of the fence but did he never get an office mrs p we asked yes replied she and we fancy the tone of her voice had an expression of triumph in it enough to be perceptible like three drops of paragory in a teaspoonful of water yes he was put one year for a hoographer and got neglected as we were asking about her opinion of the new constitution i came along whistling jordan and swinging a pint of milk in a tin pail around his head and the old lady forgot her politics in her solicitude about ike soiling his new cap a prediction i came running in one day during the slaying season with oh aunt i just now saw a little boy fall right down under a sleigh in washington street dear me she screamed horror struck bless my soul did it hurt him much did it kill him instantly oh no aunt replied he it didn't hurt him at all for the sleigh hadn't any horse in it his face beamed with fun ah you disgraceless boy cried the old lady with a finger raised at the same time with her apron wiping away the mist that the momentary sympathy had gathered in her eyes ah you disgraceless boy you won't die in your bed if you tell such stories there never was a kinder creature than she and as she looked on his good-natured face and sparkling eyes she patted his head and gave him an apple the dessert dessert did you say growled old roger at a festival supper some time ago to a person who sat opposite him at the table who had called for the dessert come over this side my friend and you'll have no occasion to call for it it's quite a dessert and almost a perfect famine here already and has been so all the evening don't look at that turkey that is nothing that is only a promise made to the hope and broken to the stomach for human strength cannot divide its members they are unanimously tough and the little man recommended ogling a ham that was rapidly disappearing in the dim distance and mumbled cheese crumbs to allay the cravings of unsatisfied appetite boston music hall when mrs partington first visited the new music hall she looked at the structure with great admiration it was in the daytime and the gas burners over the edge of the cornice met her eye turning to mrs battlegash who sat next to her she remarked that everything seemed excellent except the out-of-the-way place where they drew the nails for the ostriches to hang their coats on and pointed to the ceiling saying she didn't believe they could ever reach them trousseau of princess wassa i read a paris the dressmakers, jewellers, and milliners have all been occupied in furnishing the trousseau of Princess Wassa. Stop, Isaac, said Mrs. Partington, raising her finger and glancing at him over the top of her spectacles. Is that so? He assured her that it was. Well, continued she, and a blush of offended modesty crossed her features like the sun flush on the newly reddened barn door. That may be the way they do things in Paris, but it isn't modest to begin with. A woman has no right to wear em. Tis again nature and decency. And what does she want so many of em for? 
she can't wear but one pair to a time and here she has got all the dressmakers making trousers for her as if she was going to live long enough to wear em out ah women ain't what they were once she rose suddenly as she spoke and i could was upon the back of the, her chair endeavouring to tie a string to a nail and the big beam that traversed the ceiling was thrown violently against the table breaking three plates and a teacup in his descent stock of the revolution we have little left of the revolutionary stock now said the schoolmaster as he seated himself in mrs partington's back room and wiped his brow there was a meaning in her spectacles as they glanced upon him responsive to his remark but she said not a word drawing a chair toward her she smilingly stepped up on it and standing on tiptoe reached away back into a closet in which were kept the remnants of past service bottles and paper bags and a heterogeneous mass of odds and ends that would have made the fortune of a showman the blue stockings revealing themselves as she prosecuted her search but the schoolmaster didn't see them not he revolutionary stock said mrs partington and her voice seemed choked by the dust raised in the old cupboard here's one of em and she reached out with a present arms motion an old musket stock here is a relict of the revolution that has survived the time that tired men's souls and poor souls i should think they would have been tired to death with the smell of the powder and balls i keep this up here away from isaac for fear he should do some mischief with it for i don't want him to have nothing to do with firearms isn't it a relict bless thee mrs partington and thou art a relict thyself more to be prized than stacks of arms and did thy warm spirit pervade the land war would be no longer the scourge of the nations and men would not know fighting any more philosophy of country help people may say what they will about country air being so good for em said mrs partington and how they fat upon it for my part i shall always think it is owing to their victuals air may do for chamomiles and other reptiles that live on it but i know that men must have something substantialer the old lady was resolute in this opinion conflict as it might with general notions she is set in her opinions very and in their expression nowise backward maybe as solomon says said she but i lived at the pasturage in a country town all one summer and i never heard a turtle singing in the branches i say i never heard it but it may be so too for have seen em in the brooks under the tree where they perhaps dropped off i wish some of our great naturals would look into it with this wish for light the old lady lighted her candle and went to bed the promenade we sat directly in front of mrs partington at julian's concert one night and were pleased to witness the marked attention that she paid to the performance the first part had been concluded and the fifteen minutes intermission for promenade announced on the bill had been well spent when we felt a finger laid upon the arm that rested upon the back of the next seat and a whispered voice was breathed into our sinister ear when is he going to carry it around we looked at her inquiringly and she looked inquiringly back again carry it around yes replied she the promenade here tis a refreshment part of the entertainment isn't it we explained to her the meaning of the word promenade and with a long-drawn oh like an extended cipher she sank back into her seat ike was blowing peas at a gentleman's boot projecting through the lattice work of the gallery mrs partington in the crowd don't go and eye it isaac said mrs partington with nervous anxiety on the day of the great railroad jubilee procession as the carriage bearing the big gun came by where she and ike were standing she had been very nervous all the morning and had made some curious mistakes when the procession first came along she waved her handkerchief at an elder man taking him to be the president and marshal tukey she thought was lord elgin don't go and eye it it's one of the pesky paxton guns we read of they call em peacemakers because they tear people all to pieces and depend upon it isaac if a man got hit once or twice with such a gun as that my idea is that there wouldn't be much left of him oh the wickedness of men that they should learn war and kill people and spoil good clothes and act more like cotton pots and salvages than they do like men they say this mr paxton has got up a christian parish in london and everybody is going to see it well i hope he will tend it himself and get good and repent of the evil he has done but i'm sure i hope he won't have any such machines as that ever to help his preaching 
the noise of the passing crowd drowned half her remarks and at that moment a marshal backed his horse near where she and ike stood with a command to her to stand back it was astonishing how the flies or something troubled that marshal's horse all the while he stood there a serious matter there was a serious accident happened down here just now aunt said ike running in hastily dear me cried mrs partington dropping her knitting work and starting from her seat in great alarm what upon earth was it isaac was anybody killed or had their legs and limbs broke or what oh replied he giving his top a tremendous twirl that sent it round among the chairs at a great rate oh no twas only a man capsized a box of candles that's all the old lady looked at isaac reproachfully he will break her heart one of these days her mind at the first alarm had flown among her balsams and bandages and lints that had lain up security since the poor boy next door had cut his toe off and to be thus lowered down from her hope of usefulness was too bad but ike went out with his top laughing all the while and the old lady subsided into the old armchair and went on with her knitting ancient and modern remedies contrasted they don't doctor folks now as my physician learnt me said mrs partington sagely tapping her snuff-box by the coach of a friend lying indisposed her gesture was very expressive and the profundity of a whole med fact beamed from her spectacles she took a pinch of farwell's subtle macabre in her fingers and shut the box and laid it away in her capacious pocket then with her closed forefinger and thumb raised went on with her remarks they don't subscribe for folks now as they used to my doctor used to tell me and he never lost any of his patients but once and there was an old man of ninety-seven whose days were shortened because he hadn't the strength to swallow he used to tell me and i've been with him thousands of times with sick folks he used to tell me first said he give him apisac to clear the stomach then give him purgatory to clear the bowels then put a blister on the neck if the head aches and have him blooded if there is a tenderness of the blood to the head and put hot poultices onto the feet or to soaking him in hot water there was a none of your homeopathies or nor hydropathies nor no other pathies then and what was done might be sure it would either kill or cure she inhaled the dust with great unction and the patient who lay making squares and diamonds out of the roses on the room paper thanked god and took courage as heartily as st paul did when he saw the three taverns that he had fallen upon times of more physical mildness mr slow in the moon mr slow and abimelech were out looking upon the moon as it gleamed about them in the sky the moon as they gazed passed behind a dark cloud the edge of which gleamed like silver how beautiful said abimelech yes my son said mr slow solemnly that ears well got up some people say they have brighter moons in other places than our but i say that's all moonshine look at it abimelech as it hangs up there now as bright as a dollar and don't you believe any of the gammoning stories about its being a green cheese but father asked abimelech his son isn't the story true about the man in the moon certainly son certainly said mr slow looking down at him that's all true that is cause it's in the primer abimelech was satisfied so was mr slow my little boy perhaps he is no wise different from everybody's little boy i dare say he is no taller or thicker or heavier than ten thousand other boys who have had existence and been the idol of doting papas and mammas and maiden arms he is not an original boy in a single particular i don't claim him as such he eats very much the same way and very much the same food as other young gentlemen of his age sleeps the same cries the same and makes up the same outrageous faces at castor oil i don't care if he is indifferent but every parent has a right in fact he is bound to think his boy better than everybody's boy by a law of nature that nobody no contravening will admit of none if everybody sees in the picture i draw of my boy a sketch of his own let him remember it is my boy still and not flatter himself that he has a prodigy that knows no equal my boy has the glory of more than a year of months to brag of three of which he has devoted to taking his steps in the initiatory of locomotion and excels in little manoeuvres in engineering of his own adoption steering wearily among chairs and tables and though frequently breaching to and foundering under a press of eagerness in circumnavigating the kitchen 
he invariably comes up all right and forgets minor adversities in the grand triumph my boy is a living proof of the great truth of gravitation as when unlucky circumstances kick him out of bed or throws him from a chair he invariably strikes the floor and my boy has had knocks enough on his head to realize the faith with regard to his profundity equal to that of captain cuttle in the renowned bunsby for the same reason my boy understands the moral of a whip thus young will he wield the rod in terror over the back of his shrinking sisterhood nor even spare maternity in his experimental philosophy my boy knows very well how to manage it when the slop pail is within reach and nothing pleases him more than a plentiful ablution in soap suds or greasy dishwater my boy delights in experimenting in hydraulics now essaying to administer hydropathy by the dipper fold to a healthy floor now sousing stockings into the water bucket and now putting the hairbrush into the sink my boy fills his father's boot with incongruities that do not belong there and looks on gravely as the load is shaken out wondering apparently why his father don't let it stay my boy watches his chance to pull a dish or a cup or a saucer no matter which from the table he seems to have an antipathy against crockery and vivid visions of sundered pears remind his father daily of the havoc he has made in the once respectable service here a white and there a blue some cracked noseless handleless stare him in the face my boy despises all conventional rules and unheeds the suasion that will limit will republicanism speaks through every act independence in every look freedom in every motion my boy is very decidedly partial to an ash hole it is a spot by him of all others to be craved he glories in an ash hole thereward his inclination ever points david of old in his utmost woe couldn't have gone deeper into the ashes a stove pan is a good substitute for the ash hole there is a luxury in strewing the gritty dust about a clean carpet that is not to be overlooked and never is there is fun in hearing it crunch beneath the feet of his mother and fun too in filling his mouth with the fragments i have thought from my boy's predisposition to pick up gravel that he required it to aid digestion my boy rejoices in a dirty face no mohawk chief in the pride of war paint could feel more magnificent than my boy under an application of molasses or anything he is not particular and no mohawk could fight harder to prevent its being wiped off my boy takes the sugar very readily he was very quick in taking to this it seemed instinctive with him i have heard of people's having a sweet tooth but i verily believe the whole of my boys he has but four are all sweet my boy is all exacting in his demands demands sure enough as imperious as those of a prince and his brow frowns and his little voice rings again if his demands are not complied with principally confined however to the matter of victuals my boy is everything that is affectionate a laugh and kiss his morning and even sacrifice and his bright black eyes and rosy cheeks glowing in the sunlight of a happy heart his voice greets me as i come from labor and his arms encircle my neck in a sweet embrace and his cheek reposes against mine in the fullness of childish love and then i feel that my little boy is better than everybody's and i can't be made to begin to believe at such times but that everybody must think so in short as mr micawber might say my boy is a trump card in my domestic pack my little boy that little boy of whom it was our delight and pride to speak is no more his sweet spirit had fled from the earth and left an aching void in our heart and an anguish which will be hard to allay the music of his voice is stilled the mild beaming of his eyes is quenched in the darkness of death his arms are no more outstretched upon loving impulses nor his steps speedy in affections errands the happiness of his smile will no more impart its blessed contagion to our own spirit nor the home places to be made again pleasant by his bright presence we were loth that he should depart there were a thousand ties that bound him to us we could not conceive that a flower so fair and full of promise should wither and die well within our grasp we fancied that we could hedge him round with our love and that the grim archer would not find access to our fold through the diligence of our watchfulness we had forgotten that the brightest and fairest are oftenest the victims of inexorable death and that the roseate robes of to-day's joy may be usurped to-morrow by the sable drapery of affliction there was much to endear him to us 
perhaps no more however than every child possesses to a parent he was precocious to an extraordinary degree and his little life was full of childish manliness that made everybody love him who looked upon him his kiss is still warm upon our cheek and his smile still bright in our memory replete with love and trust we were sanguine of a fruitful future for him and we had associated him with many schemes of happy usefulness in coming life and with foolish pride boasted of indications that promised all we hoped alas how dark it seems now as we recall the dear little fellow in his dreamless rest he was smiling as we laid him beneath the coffin lid as if the spirit in parting had stamped its triumph on the cold lips over the dominion of death that little boy was our idol and they were those well-meaning people too who would expostulate and shake their heads gravely and say that we loved him too much as if such a thing were possible where a being of such qualities was making constant drafts upon our affection it is our greatest consolation that we loved him so well that there was no stint or limit to the love we felt for him that his happiness and our own were so promoted by that affection that it was almost like the pangs of death to relinquish him to the grave it seems almost a sin to weep over the young and beautiful dead but it must be a colder philosophy than ours to repress tears when bending over the lifeless form of a dear child we may know that the pains of earth are exchanged for joys of heaven we may admit the selfishness of our woe that would interpose itself between the dead and their happiness we may listen to and allow the truth of gospel solaces and cling to the hope of a happy and endless meeting in regions beyond the grave but what can fill the void which their dreary absence makes in the circle which they blessed where every association tends to recall them thus it seems when the heart is first bereft when the sorrow is new and we sit down in our lone chamber to think of it and brood over it but we know that affliction must become softened by time or it would be unbearable and there are many reflections that the mind draws from its own stores to yield after comfort memory forgets nothing of the departed but the woe of separation and every association connected with them becomes pleasant and joyous we see them with their angel plumage on we feel them around us upon viewless wings filling our minds with good influences and blessed recollections freed from the sorrows and temptations and sins of the earth and with a holier love they are still ministering to us it is one of the amenities of grief that it pour itself out unchecked and everybody who has a little boy like this we have lost will readily excuse this fond and mournful prolixity this justifiable lamentation but we shall all go home to our father's house to our father's house in the skies where the hope of our souls shall have no blight our love no broken ties we shall roam on the banks of the river of peace and bathe in its blissful tide and one of the joys of our heaven shall be the little boy that died to talk of a man worth his millions giving a few thousands of dollars in charity is well enough said old roger he should be praised for it but what is his act compared with that of the poor woman who buys a pint of oil from her own hard earnings and carries it in a broken naked bottle to a sick neighbor poorer than herself to cheer the gloomy hours of the night what is his act compared with her i should like to know not that and he snapped his fingers and felt sustained in his high estimate of the poor woman's small donation. Mrs. Partington on Remedies This is an age of enervation in medicine, sure enough, said Mrs. Partington, as she glanced at the column of new and remarkable specifics. Why will people run after metaphysics and them nostrums when by taking some simple purgatory they can get well so soon? it's all nonsense it is and if people instead of dosing themselves with calumny and bitters would only take exercise and air a little more and wash themselves with care in a crash towel they would be all the better for it she said this on her own experience as for diet drink and summer beverages miss b is very noted a new instrument when is he going to bring on the violin whispered mrs partington to her neighbour at the melodium after listening through the first part of old bull's concert that's it ma'am which he's now playing on why that's a fiddle ain't it good gracious why can't they call things by their right names and she left the hall saying to the doorkeeper as she passed that is only a fiddle after all end of section nine section ten criticism 
A small crowd gathered before a window recently to admire the figure of a cat which was there as if for public inspection. Nearly everyone was delighted with its likeness to life. But still, said Augustus, there are faults in it. It is far from perfect. Observe the defect in the foreshortening of that paw, now, and the expression of the eye, too, is bad. Besides, the mouth is too far down under the chin, while the whiskers look as if they were coming out of her ears. It is too short, too. But as if to obviate this defect, the figure stretched itself and rolled over in the sun. It is a cat, I vow, said a bystander. It is alive, shouted Ike, delightedly clapping his hands. Why, it's only a cat, after all, said Mrs. Partington, as she surveyed it through her specs. But Augustus moved on, disappointed that nature had fallen so far short of his ideas of perfection in the manufacture of cats. Bleak House Dickens is fast getting along to the denouncement of the bleak house, said Mrs. Partington, as she saw a paragraph mentioning the approaching denouement of the story. Well, I should think he would have denounced it long ago and had it prepared, for I don't believe they could have made him pay one mill of rent unless he did it at his own auction. Bleak house, indeed, and Mr. Dixon a poor man, too, with the ailments enough on him to paralyze a whole hospital himself. The picture of the good Samaritan handing the wounded Jew a quart bottle of sarsaparilla bitters attracted her attention, and she delivered Ike a private lecture on the humanities while he sat pulling the cat's tail in the dark side of the chimney corner. Admiration for Eloquence Dear me, how fluidly he does talk, said Mrs. Partington recently at a temperance lecture. I am always rejoiced when he mounts the nostril, for his eloquence warms me in every nerve and cartridge of my body. Where degrees itself couldn't be more smooth than his blessed tongue is. And she wiped his spectacles with a cotton bandana and never took her eyes from the speaker during the whole hour he was on the stand. Knaves of the Crystal Palace well said mrs partington as ike read the paragraph from the post that the decorators were at on the two knaves of the crystal palace she passed at the well before she went further into it and ike stopped reading to hear what she had to say and chewed up a part of the paper into spitballs which he amused himself with by throwing at the old white pine dresser in the corner well said she this is the same well we left some time since I am glad they are taking time by the firelock and looking out to the knaves aforehand. Knaves in the Christian parish, indeed. But they will get in the best that can be done. There's many a one, I dare say, in all parishes that has a sanctuary in his face, but with the cloak of hypocrisy in his heart. Read on, Isaac. And the old lady looked up at the black-framed ancient picture of Susanna and the eldest, and patted her box reflectively. Mr. Bisbee's Confession it was a rash promise that I, Jeremiah Bisbee, had made to the youngest Miss Steele to gallant her to touch. I knew that she would be offended if I did not comply, and yet how I felt. The previous evening's amusement had extended well towards daylight, and a more miserably feeling fellow than myself never did rouse himself at the sound of breakfast bell on a Sunday morning. But the promise was made, and the glory of a new pair of plate pants and a red velvet vest was to blaze beside the modest beauty of Miss Seraphima in the Reverend Mr. Blunt's church. I had no seat there, but my cousins, the Misses Titmarsh, who owned a pew in the Broad Isle, had many times invited me to sit with them, informing me that there was plenty of room, and I determined to avail myself of their invitation. The pew was a very respectable one, I knew, as I had heard them many times describe it as having heavy drapery, and all the other essentials of genteel worship, just as they had inherited it from the deacon their uncle. I had heard them describe, too, the occupants of adjacent pews, and had been given to understand that the oglers and swigs and the aforesaid occupants were the most respectable people in town, and that they felt rather envious at the superior position of our pew, for so the young ladies... Forty-seven, if they were a day, called it. The day was bright. The pants fitted to a charm. The red vest gleamed in the sun. My coat was neatly brushed. With an unexceptionable hat and a pair of brilliant boots, I felt myself to be some. The sleepy feeling with which the morning commenced was overcome by the momentary excitement of walking and talking with a charming girl, a triumph over somnus that I thought truly wonderful. We reached the church, a large, venerable sleeping pile, having a good many pews in it, the latter a characteristic, I believe, of churches generally. 
There was a languor upon the still air of the old church that struck me sleepily as I took my seat in the spacious, high-backed pew. The monotonous toll of the bell sounded like a lullaby, and the swelling notes of the big organ, which rose like incense to the roof and pervaded the house, gave me a qualm that my boasted triumph outside would not be of permanent duration, opposed to the somnolent influences within. As ill luck would have it, we had a very dull preacher, a duller I never knew, trite and commonplace without originality or fervor and insufferably long i felt sleepy at the propounding of the text which was as near as i remember sleep on and take your rest and every wakeful feeling within me began to grow heavy about the eyes at the injunction i struggled against slumber as a man overboard would struggle with the tide my eyelids drooped in spite of me and when i would open them they felt as if they were interlaced with sticks and my sleepy soul seemed looking through a grating of wicker work the eyes of my cousins, the Mrs. Titmarsh, were wide open upon me. The bright eyes of Seraphima were upon me. The eyes of the augurs and spigs were upon me, for the Mrs. Titmarsh had informed me in a whisper that they were here in full force, and that the new plaid pants and the red vest and Seraphima's new bonnet, a charming thing, by the way, would produce a tremendous envy among their opponents in the adjacent pew. In my sleepy reflections, I saw the utter disgrace that would attend upon my cousins, the Titmarshes, if I misbehaved. I thought upon them positively more than upon my own shame. I thought of the horror they would feel were I to speak aloud, or laugh, or tumble down, or commit any extravagance in a dream. All of the tricks I had ever practiced in my sleep came up before me, frightfully magnified. What if I should practice some of them over again, or get up on the backs of the pews and go round, as a minor would sit over the tiles in the opera? I struggled manfully with sleep, but I found I couldn't hold out long. Hum, hummed on that long sermon upon my honor. I don't believe I heard a word of it besides the text, unless it were the word sleep, which seemed profusely scattered like poppies along the tedious way. I found myself rapidly sinking. The faces by which I was surrounded were melting away. The oglers and the spigs were becoming oblivious, and the preacher, just taking the form of a huge black beetle impaled on a pin, was humming a dull drone on one continuous key, when mustering resolution, I roused myself, thrust my hand hastily into my pocket to pull out my handkerchief, then the oglers and spigs were all looking, and so were the Mrs. Titmarsh and Seraphima, when, I blush to say it, though is the means of my becoming a reformed man, and a tolerable member of society, and the father of a large family, when I pulled my handkerchief out, a pack of cards, a deposit of the previous night, came leaping out with it, and as if actuated by the devil who invented them, they darted about in almost as many directions as there were cards, presently showing themselves in the holy house to my utter confusion of face. Had my worst enemy seen me then, he must have pitied me. I was wide awake now. The concentrated redness of every red card was painted upon my face, and the blackness of every black one was transferred to my heart. The spots on the cards to my heated fancy seemed bigger than a cartwheel. I heard a suppressed titter among the oglers and the spigs. Just then the eldest Miss Titmore fainted. Heaven be thanked for this, says I. Here's an opening. And seizing the unconscious spinster, I made for the door as speedily as possible. Placing her in charge of the sexton, I ran with all haste for the doctor. Strange that those medical gentlemen should be away at such a time i left an urgent order on the slate of six of them and was told at five of six an hour afterwards met in consultation on the steps of rev mr blunt's church as i said before i have now reformed and sit just in the shadow of life's afternoon looking back over the events of its morning rejoicing with hopeful trust that the errors of youth may not be carried forward to the amount of mature age if repentance make atonement for the past the Mrs. Titmarshes forgave me, and Seraphima, in a long life of devoted attention on my part, has quite forgot that Sunday's mortification. Germania Band How do you like the music, Mrs. P? asked a neighbor of the old lady, as she stood listening to the Germania Band one evening on the common, and beating time on the cover of a snuff-box. Beautiful, replied she, enraptured. Uncommon beautiful. It seems almost like the music of the syrups. I think the geranium band the sweetest of any of them. Can you tell me, said she in a big whisper, which is Mr. Bergamot? The name of Berg was associated with her rapi and hence her solicitude. She was told that Mr. Bergman belonged to the Germania Society and that the leader of Germania's serenaders was Mr. Schnapp. 
a smile lit up her face revealed in the declining twilight as she asked if she was akin to mr aromatic schnapps the gentleman that imported so much gin her ear was arrested by the strains of the music and the black bonnet waved in unison with a waltzing measure as isaac sat upon the grass in contemplation of a dog's tail before him wondering what the effect would be if he should stick a pin in it a good suggestion mrs chong and ing those interesting exotics from whose land all the golden fountains and talking lauras and singing trees that graced our juvenile literature were derived were much gratified by an introduction to mrs boddington one of whom assured her that he had heard of her in siam many years ago but the other didn't recollect about it on informing her of their intention to go to saratoga or newport the coming summer the old dame wondered at their determination how crowded you will be said she accommodations are so scarce though i dare say you could upon an emergency both sleep in one bed the suggestion was a happy one all the difficulty was removed in an instant and the dual gentleman smiled a thank ye with his four lips and mrs partington waved a patting benediction to him with a green cotton umbrella as he disappeared in the crowd catching an omnibus if you want to take a bus said mr swinks in his oracular manner you must be amazingly sly you mustn't go boldly up to em because they will certainly be full room for twelve and seventeen inside or the driver won't see you if you shake your umbrella or cane at him never so much buses are queer critters very queer it takes something of a man to understand their nature when you want one there ain't one coming put your head out in the rain and look every which way you can't see hide nor hair of one wait till the next one comes that's full so's the next then you get a little miffed and says you i'll walk start in the rain get wet when you get almost where you want to go long comes one of em like blazes lots of room looking at you as much as to say see here old boy don't you wish you had baited and whisks by like a racer if you see a bus a little ways ahead and run yourself into a fever to catch it two to one it'll be the wrong bus and you'll have to walk after all now the way to do is this act just as if you don't care a snap whether you ride or not be indifferent and one will come right along don't be uneasy about getting a seat and there'll be plenty of room conclude that you'll walk and you may have a whole bus to yourself that's the way to come it over saying which and shaking his head profoundly mr swings retired ike in a new position ike got a situation to blow an organ in town and one sunday a stranger organist took it in his head that he would try the instrument a little after the congregation was dismissed he expressed his desire to the boy who consented to blow for there are few more obliging boys than ike when he is well used he pumped away vigorously for some time until his arm ached when peeping round the corner of the organ he asked if he might go now no said the organist curtly and kept on drumming away among the dainty airs that he was taking upon himself now thundering among the bass notes and now glancing playfully amid the tender trills of the pianissimos when confusion to a few commenced the breath of the organ gave out and the music flattened to a dying and dismal squeal holloa cried the performer don't get asleep there blow away but no response attended his command he grew red blow away i say he cried louder still no response angrily and inharmoniously the man of music arose and looked for ike he was not there in the madman of melody as he glanced from the window caught a distant view of a pair of juvenile coattails as they disappeared round a corner unpopular doctrine i was surprised mr roger to see you speaking with that creature said miss prim significantly emphasizing the word why madam asked the old man because she's a low wild creature of the town said she waspily he took her hand within his own and looked her calmly in the eye as he replied call her not wild call her miserable rather and as such she is more worthy of your regard and pity for though she may have sadly erred she is still not all depraved that old spark of sympathy in her heart is there yet unquenched i have seen her not long since watch by the sick work for the needy and give her money for the relief take her own bread and give it to a poor felon in prison and comfort a little child in its sinless sorrow i have seen this and bad as you think she is i can honour her for her good virtues my dear madam gain her good qualities and add them to your own perfections before presuming to sit in judgment on her bad ones besides do you know what temptation is ma'am were you ever tempted 
the frosty look which met his own seemed to render such a question unnecessary and he released her hand gently advising her to exercise more of charity in her estimate of character benevolence the last repose the day after the great railroad jubilee appeared in public with two excessively black eyes it seems that we're going by one of our principal hotels when a large delegation arrived from out of town and hearing the remark all full his heart was touched and mounting upon a post he asked the crowd if they wouldn't like to have a nice house to stop at where every man could have a room to himself and every accommodation he could desire the response was yes well said the good man with emotion well if i hear of any such i will let you know the people were strangers and did not understand the benevolence of his intentions and one or two of them expressed their disapprobation in a striking manner which marked the good man's pleasant exterior as about described on the day of the above celebration a large locomotive was brought to a standstill in washington street in consequence of one of the wheels giving out belonging to the car it was on philanthropos with an eye always to the interests of the mechanic seeing the danger to which the engine was exposed walked sentry round it all night to prevent the boys from running away with it it was an act for which he should have been honoured but the workman called him an ass for his pains when they came the next morning to take it away his indignation for a moment was awakened despair succeeded of ever being able to benefit his race when a small voice whispered to his conscience will you abandon an eternal principle because crude humanity fails to appreciate your efforts and he responded promptly to the question and turned away in search of new objects for the exercise of his benevolence mysterious action of rats as for the rats said mrs partington as she missed several slices of cake the disappearance of which she imputed to them it ain't no use to try to get rid of em they're rather like the worm and anecdote and even chlorose supplement they don't make up a face at it must be the rats continued she thoughtfully and took a large thumb and forefinger full of rapi to help her deliberation it can be isaac that took the cake because he's a perfect prodigal of virtue and wouldn't deceive me so for i might leave a house full of bread with him and even touch it Mike sat there demurely with his right foot upon his left knee, thinking what a capital sunglass one eye of the old lady's speck would make, while a trace of crumbs was visible about his mouth. It is feared that not even chlorosive supplement, nor anything weaker than a padlock, will save Mrs. Pattinson's cake. Mrs. P. on the Mississippi when will the father of waters come along asked mrs Pattington as she sat looking at a panorama of the mississippi in the last hours of its exhibition the father of waters replied the individual addressed why this is it that you are seeing before you goodness me is it said she why i have digested my specs to look after a big man with a dropsy and it's nothing but a river after all how i wish they'd call things by their proper names there was something of disappointment in her tone but when afterwards she remarked to herself i wonder if that water will wash it was a beautiful tribute from benevolence to genius entered at the custom house said mrs Pattington, pondering on the expression i don't see how the vessels ever got in but i'm glad that the collector cleared them right out again it'll learn them better manners next time i think provisions of the constitution provisions of the constitution said mrs Pattington with an earnest air and tone for my part i should be glad to see him heaven and all of us knows provisions are scarce enough and dear enough and if they can turn the constitution to so good a use i'm glad of it anything that will have a tenderness to cheapen the necessities of life and here she laid her finger on the cover of her box and looked earnestly at a cracked sugar bowl in the buffet in the corner containing the onion seeds and the bone buttons and the scarlet beans and the pieces of twine long gathered from accumulated paper tea bags i am agreeable to it and if they can turn the constitution and all the ships of war to carrying provisions i am sure they will do more good than they do now a good many of them she here ran down like an eight-day clock and she smiled as ike rushed in with his arms full of votes and his face full of fun and molasses candy and asked her if he shouldn't give her a tig wicket severe but just dolly prim a spinster indeed said mrs partington as she heard her unmarried neighbour in the back parlour to him thus i should like to know what upon earth she spins but street yarn for she's gadding from morning to night the wheel she spins on would be harder to find a great deal than the fifth wheel of a coach oh she could be severe could mrs partington but there was generally a commingling of the bitter and sweet the warm word and molasses in her rebukes that tempered acidity and made reproof wholesome mrs partington and piety deacon snarl in exhortation 
would often allude to the place where prayer is wanted to be made. Ah, said Mrs. Pottington to herself, there's nothing like humility in a Christian. I'm glad you confess it. I don't know a place under the canister of heaven where prayer is wanted more to be made than here, and I hope you'll be forgiven for the rancorous butter you sold me yesterday. She was a simple-minded woman, was Mrs. P., and was apt to get the world mixed up in with her devotion, believing somehow that Christian duty prescribed worldly justice. She hadn't been long a member. Bricks and Straw Dr. Dick had discovered a striking analogy between the brick-making operations of the Israelites in Egypt and those of the present day. In the first instance, straw was required in the manufacture for perfect brick. In the latter, straw is an essential thing as is shown in the imbibation of juleps, an element in the manufacture of modern bricks where straw is invariably used. The doctor asks when Egypt was like a dry lemon. Presuming the answer will not be forthcoming, he says, after the Jews were all out of it. It is supposed he means Jews metallic prospects i don't see said mrs partington as i came home from the examination and threw his books into one chair and his jacket in another and his cap on the floor saying that he didn't get the medal i don't see why you didn't get the medal for certainly a more meddlesome boy i never knew but never mind dear when the time comes round again you'll get it what hope there was in her remark for him and he took courage in one of the old lady's doughnuts and sat wiping his feet on a clean stocking that the dame was preparing to darn that lay by her side. Mrs. Partington beating up. There's poor Hardy Lee called again, said Mrs. Partington on a trip from Cape Cod to Boston. The wind was ahead and the vessel had to beat up, and the order to put the helm heartily had been heard through the night. Hardy Lee again. I declare I should think the poor creature would be completely exasperated with fatigue, and I'm certain he hasn't eaten a blessed mouthful of anything all the while. Captain, do call the poor creature down, or nature cannot stand it. There was a tremor in her voice as indignant humanity found utterance. It ain't Christian. It is more like the treatment of hot and pots a heathen. The captain went on deck in a sudden lurch of the vessels and the old lady on her beam ends among some boxes, recovering from which forgetfulness of Hardy Lee ensued, and this tack brought her to the wharf. A dead shot. How do you feel with such a shocking-looking coat on? Said a young clerk of more pretension than brains one morning. I feel, said old Roger, looking at him steadily, with one eye half-closed as if taking aim at his victim, I feel, young man, as if I had a coat on which had been paid for, a luxury of feeling which I think you will never experience. And then he quietly resumed the reading of the post, and the young clerk made no further remark on the subject. Shocking joke. I see, said old Roger to a farmer, topping corn, that to one branch of your industry you are its worst enemy. Why? asked the farmer. Because, replied he, you are always raising shocks with the corn market. Yes, quietly replied the farmer, but the market is always saying, lend us your years. Old Roger and the farmer smiled at each other as they parted. End of section 10 Section 11 Riding What a vast improvement has been made upon the old methods and means of traveling, even within the memory of the youngest of us. Recall the old staging system a moment to mind when a day's ride was agony in its anticipation, not to be dispelled by the stern reality, over roads scarce redeemed from primeval roughness, which the jolly tongue of the red-faced driver, provided you were lucky enough to get on the box with him, was hardly capable of enlivening. What apprehension did timid insiders feel of threatening wreck at the bottom of the steep hills they rattled down? How fearful they would be of never reaching the top of the next hill, from the miserable horses giving out that were attached to the vehicle, how they trembled at the danger of having their brains knocked out against the roof of the low coach, and the rebound that anon jerked them from their seats as the stage wheel sunk into a cart rut. For this latter alarm, there was considerable cause to judge by a story told us once by one of the professors of the whip. He was riding, he said, one day over the way we were then traveling, in a terrible bad season of the year, and the cartwheels had cut the roads up into hideous gullies, into which the wheels would plunge, to the danger of all who chose to ride, and often the passengers had to get out and lay their shoulders to the work to assist the horses in their exertions to extricate the vehicle from the mud. The day he spoke of, however, he had but one passenger, an elderly gentleman wearing a wig, and feeling his responsibility lessened by his diminished fare, 
He took less heed as to where he went and dashed along over the road, whistling from absence of care, entirely regardless of horses or passenger, determined to achieve the distance to the next stopping place in a time mentally allotted for its performance. It was one of the old-fashioned low-roofed coaches, one of the oldest of its class. A sudden cry from a child who was passing caused him to look round, and there, to his horror, he saw the old gentleman's bald head glistening in the sun's rays like a mammoth mushroom, his eyes glaring on him wildly and his mouth vainly endeavoring to articulate. It was but an instant before he was extricated from his perilous situation, and one of the sudden lurches of the road he had been forced up through the canvas roof, and this closing round his neck held him there, incapable of helping himself, and he had ridden many miles in this manner before he was discovered. "'That story's just as true now as I tell it to you,' said the driver. "'Don't doubt it,' we replied. "'But what became of the hat and the wig?' "'I can't say anything about the hat, but I'm very much mistaken if I didn't see that old wig for three seasons used as a genteel residence for a family of crows down the road here.' "'A very singular story,' we thought and think so still. Mrs. Partington looking out. I can't make it out, said Mrs. Partington one morning, when she first moved to the city after the railroad plowshare had upturned her hearthstone. I can't make it out. And she reached further out of the window to the imminent danger of the embargo returning again to her head, or of a summer set into the street below. She had caught the sound. Here's Hack from stentorian lungs under her window, and she could not make out what the sounds meant. I wish I'd known what the poor critter was crying about, but I thought he said he had a sick headache, and I declare I pity the poor soul that has got such a distressing melody as that. She drew in her head like a clam and shut down the window to keep out the sounds of a misery she could not relieve. Foreseeing things beforehand. I wonder who's coming here today said Mrs. Pottington at the breakfast table, turning her cups and working the tea grounds to their oracular position. It was the 4th of July, and a procession was advertised to pass her door. I wonder who is coming here today. Here's a horse and a wheelbarrow and a tub, and there's a big jay and a cipher, and here's a flock of geese and a cow. The cow and the geese must mean the procession, that's clear, but what can the big G stand for and the rest of them? It must mean our seventh cousin, Mrs. Tubbs. It is so kind of her to remember her poor relations at such time, as she always does. Yes, it must be here, because there's a tub, and the wheelbarrow must run from an omnibus. But what can the cipher be? I guess, though, that doesn't mean anything. Scare up the German silver spoons, Margaret. We must be hospitable. I dare say she would be to us if she should ever ask us, and we should go. The prediction was fulfilled, and the fat lady occupied the front seat in Mrs. Partington's private box. A sinuosity. Old Roger was seated at the dinner table by the side of Seraphima, the youngest of the five marriageable daughters. The conversation turned upon conundrums and queer comparisons. The old fellow leaned back in his chair and wiped the traces of soup from his mouth, said, as he took the young lady's hand in his own, See this fair hand now, white as a snowflake, and rich with dimpled beauties. Seraphima smiled. Who is there among you that can tell me why the sweet hand is like the remains of that hawkshin soup before us all? The fair hand was drawn back suddenly. That fair hand, compared with a vile pile of beef sinews? The boarders were astonished at his audaciousness. Seraphima frowned. You can't guess, can you? said the jolly old fellow. Well, continued he, it is because there is such tenderness in it. He pronounced it tenderness and Seraphima smiled. But the boarders, who had found the meat rather hard, didn't see the relevancy of it. They didn't know what tendon meant. No more than a cow knows about its grandmother. The Science of Fish I wonder what this itch theology is, said Mrs. Partington, giving a somewhat novel pronunciation of the old science, as she read the announcement of the lecture by Professor Agassiz. What in the name of old scratch can it be? I suppose it must mean the itch for meddling with politics and things that doesn't concern them, and running down their own country and relations and praising up everybody else and at war with everything, all the time they are preaching peace. Someone explained that it was the science of fishes. Well, well, said the lady. It's just as well, for a minister preaching politics is like a fish out of water. He's out of his ailment. 
She passed over to the deaths and marriages, and Ike ganged his hook with an afternoon smelting in his eye and a ball of Mrs. Partington's piping cord in his pocket for contingencies. Internal Indebtedness When I let her the eggs, said Mrs. Partington, she said she would be eternally indebted to me. And I guess she will. How can people do so? I would go round the world on all fours a-begging before I'd be guilty of such a thing. Ah, well, it takes everybody to make a world. And she puts in Salteris enough to make up for the non-returned eggs. Her neighbor had decidedly taken a rise out of her. Borrowing Newspapers Shall I have the goodness to look at your newspaper one moment? Asked Mrs. Partington at the grocery store. Certainly, my dear madame, with the greatest reluctance possible, replied the grocer. They exchanged glances, and there was so much of thankfulness in her eye that he almost made up his mind to subscribe for another paper for her express accommodation. Promising children. What a to-do people make because children have to know something when they're young, said Mrs. Partington as she read an account of many men who had been distinguished in early years. Now all these together don't know so much, but one half is Dolly Spurk's baby. That is a perfect prodigal, to be sure, such an intellect. Why, it got through its Google Googles and into its bye byes before it was seven months old, and when it was only a year and a half old, it emptied a snuff box down its precious old grandmother's throat as she was asleep, and came nigh suffocating the old lady before she could wake up to conscientiousness and spit it out. There never was such another, its mother says, and he knows so well as a mother what a child is that has it watched over, and it's seen it expand itself like a tansy blossom, and sweet as a young cauliflower. The old lady was always eloquent on this topic. She was a believer in prodigies, and thought Solomon must have consulted some young mother when he wrote that every generation grows wiser and wiser. Forgiveness of Wrong He called me a termagrant, and said I wasn't any better than I should be said Mrs. Partington as she threw her shawl into the water bucket and her bonnet on the floor on her return from her landlord's, where she had vainly sought an extension of time for payment of the rent. There never was such an aspiration cast upon one of our family before, and there is no such thing in our whole chronology. And there is any statuary law for slander, I'll see if he can prove it. The termagrant I don't mind so much, but to be called no better than I should be, the mean pennycatch and curmudgeon? Bah, no. It's wrong to call him names. It makes me most as bad as he is. I'll borrow the money and pay him. I will, and show him that I don't bear mallets. And she brightened up in the thought of this mode of revenge, bustling about and putting the house to rights in the best humor in the world. Her conduct was a sermon in seven tracts on the sublime principle of forgiveness of wrong. What kin is that which all Yankees love to recognize, and which always has sweet associations connected with it? Why pumpkin, to be sure? A negative affirmative. Mr. Timms, a farmer up in the country, had a habit of putting in yes, 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 yes. At every pause in his speaking, which sometimes had a ludicrous effect, the old fellow owned a fine horse, which he was very careful of, and would never lend or hire him to the most particular of his friends. A youngster of the village, who wished the horse for a Sunday ride, went over to the old man's house to hire the animal if possible. So, you want my horse, young man? Yes, 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 said Timms. And you say you'll ride him gently. Yes, 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 yes. And you'll give him plenty of oats. Yes, 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 yes. And rub him down well when you get where you're going. Yes, 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 yes. And will give me a dollar for the use of him. Yes, yes, yes. Well, upon the whole, you can't have him. Yes, 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 yes. The young man left sorrowing. We see it stated in the prints frequently that vessels going to California double Cape Horn. If this is the case, by and by, there will not be a single Cape Horn left. Taking pictures. That is a splendid likeness by heaven! exclaimed Augustus rapturously as Mrs. Partington showed him a capital daguerreotype of her own venerable frontispiece. No, it isn't, said she, smiling. No, it isn't by heaven itself, but by its sun. Isn't it beautifully done? All the cemetery of its features and cap strings and specks as brought out as natural as if from a painter's palette. 
any young lady now, continued she. He would like to have the liniments of her pretended husband to look at when he is away, could be made happy by this blessed and cheap contrivance of making pictures out of sunshine. She clasped the cover of the picture, paused as if pursuing in her own mind the train of her admiration, and went out like an exploded rocket. Man is born to work, and he must work while it is day. Have I not, said a great worker, all eternity to work in? Well, said Slug, who didn't love work, if that's the case, what in time's the use of putting in so? I've just the leaves divide the work. Do part of mine when the cove's resting. Procosity. The elder smith was somewhat astonished one evening at finding a berry pie for tea, a rather remarkable thing in his gastronomical experience. For Mr. Smith indulged in few luxuries, for regions which will be understood by people of limited means, it was an excellent pie, the chef de ouvre, of the culinary skill of Mrs. Smith, who prided herself upon what she could do if she only had the greedances. Smith, Jr., numbering some three summers, sat opposite his sire. "'My son,' said the olden, during a pause in the work of mastication. "'Did your mother make this pie today?' "'Certainly,' said the precocious youth. "'She didn't, of course, make it tomorrow.' The elder Smith looked mournfully at the miniature edition of himself, then, wiping the crumbs from his mouth and ejaculating, "'So young,' he left the house." Mr. Thimble's Mouse Trap. The old gentleman one morning discovered a mouse in his bedchamber. A mouse or a rat was what he held in the utmost dread, and even the idea of getting his hand on one by any accident always gave him a tremor. Seeing the little animal thus in his very bedchamber was most provoking, and reaching for an oaken cane always at the head of his bed, a defense against hostile invaders of this inner shrine, he at once vowed the mouse's destruction and, cane in hand, started upon its accomplishment. Ha! said he between his fixed teeth, as he closed the door and firmly grasped his stick. Now, Mr. Mouse, I've got you. I'll fix your flint for you. And the poor little timid thing running into a corner, the old gentleman leveled a furious blow at him, repeating his threat to fix his flint for him. The offer to fix the flint for the mouse is hardly intelligible in this age of patent matches, but Mr. Thimble lived in thunderbox times, when flint and steel were inseparable, and he probably thought that an animal so inclined to steel must have a flint. The blow was wrongly directed, and the mouse escaped to another corner. Another blow, and another, resulted in the same manner, until at last the mouse, finding cover beneath an antique bureau, the old gentleman was compelled to exert all his generalship to bring him out. But in vain he got down on all fours and looked beneath the bureau, in vain was the cane thrust in the direction of his eyes. The enemy was nowhere to be seen, and Mr. T got up, flushed with the exercise, brushed his knees, and went down to breakfast, wondering where the little animal had gone. After relating the incident, he was calmly engaged in cooling his coffee when, dropping his cup, he darted from the table into the middle of the floor, dragged half the breakfast things after him, and practiced antics very unbecoming in an elderly gentleman of sixty-two. His family, astonished to see him thus, had incipient ideas of lunatic asylums and straight jackets dart across their minds. The old gentleman, the while, capering about the room like a mad dancing master, shaking his right leg as if St. Vetus had selected this member for his particular favor, regardless of the rest, until, with a tremendous spasmodic kick, out fell the mouse from where he had secreted himself. It was a long time before Mr. T regained composure. Some time after, speaking of his activity, Mrs. Thimble remarked, "'My dear, I didn't think it was in you.' Mr. T looked queerly at her as she uttered this, but didn't say anything. Mrs. Partington versus Cookbooks "'A beef steak fried in water?' said Mrs. Partington. "'It seems to me it must taste very much as if it was biled. "'They do have such curious ideas about cooking nowadays.' And people have to learn lots of outlandish names before they know what they've got for dinner. Ah, the good old times was the best. When people seasoned their dishes with flag root and such spices and a poor man's fragile repast was eaten when he knew what he had to be thankful for. What a cook she is, to be sure. And isn't it the cause of rejoicing for a week among the boys in the neighborhood when she fries up a batch of donuts and Ike knows where they are kept? No wonder, she thought as she said, that he ate like Pharaoh's lean kind that eat up the fat of the land of Egypt. 
Oh, doesn't he just climb fluidly? exclaimed Mrs. Partington, delightedly, as she listened to the exercises of the Humptown Intellectual Mutual Improvement Society. Her admiration knew no bounds as a young declaimer with inspiration truly demosthenic launched the flashing beams of his eloquence broadcast among his auditors with thrilling, dazzling, burning force, anon soaring like a rocket into the Amphirian blue, dashing helter-skelter amidst the stars and harnessing the fiery comets to the car of his genius, anon scoring the land like a racer, the hot sparks like young lightning marking his phaetonish course, anon breaking through the terraquist shell and raveling in Hadrian horrors in underground localities somewhere. The voice of Mrs. Partington, whom we left standing on the threshold of her admiration some way back, recalls us to herself. How fluidly he talks! He ought to be a minister, I declare, and how well he would look with a surplus on, to be sure. He stands on the nostrum as if he were born and bred in oratory all his life. I wish the president was here tonight. I know he'd see he was an extraordinary young man, and like as not appoint him minister extraordinary instead of some that never preached any at all. The old lady beat time with her fan to his gesticulations, nodding the black bonnet approvingly, and smiled as the young man told the world that Franklin had made it a present of the printing press. Outrage during a concert one night, a reckless individual in the upper gallery of the large hall in which it was held, whose name we did not ascertain, allowed his bill of the concert to slip through his fingers, which, falling below by the rule of gravitation, fell suddenly upon the exposed head of one of our first young men. The effect of the concussion upon an object so tender may be well imagined. Smelling bottles were called for, and none being at hand, one young lady applied her glove to the sufferer's nose, which, having been lightly cleansed with turpentine, had the effect of bringing him to. The diabolical perpetrator of the act had the audacity to look over the edge of the gallery and grin at the injury he had done, but before the officer could get to the gallery and arrest him, he had flown. P.S. We wish it to be distinctly understood that it was the glove and not the nose that had been cleaned with the turpentine. Ike in the Country During the last winter, Ike was sent to visit some of Mrs. Partington's relatives, who live on the borders of the Great Bay. Squid River, which empties into the bay, is a very beautiful stream in summer, but in winter it is dreary enough, with the tall trees stripped of their foliage, standing, as it were, shivering upon its brink. But it is a rare skating course from Moose Village to the river's junction with the bay. Ike had used up all his resources for fun at the end of the third day. He had snowballed the cattle into a frenzy, caught all the hens in a box trap, tied the pigs together by the legs, sucked all the eggs he could find, and was looking round for something else to do while the boys were at school. He was just calculating, as he poised a snowball, how near he could come to a tame pigeon on the windowsill without hitting it, when the glass was saved by the appearance of the house cat outside the sacred precinct of the kitchen. Ike had watched this cat wistfully ever since he had been there, and the cat had manifested a strange repugnance for him ever since he trod on her tail as she lay by the stove. He immediately seized upon her, and expedients, never wanting, soon suggested themselves to him. There were plenty of clamshells about the yard, and selecting four of the smoothest, he, by the aid of some grafting wax at hand, soon had Tabby beautifully shod with clamshells and on the way to the river. Ike's idea was to learn her to skate. The river was smooth as glass, and a sharp wind blew along its surface towards the bay. Now, puss, said Ike as he pushed her upon the ice, go it! An instinct of danger instantly seized upon her. Her claws, which Ike had found so sharp a short time before, were now useless to her, and with a growl of spite she swelled her caudal appendage to the enormous size which, taking the wind, impelled the poor feline like a clipper over the slippery path. The tail stood straight as a topmast and grew bigger and bigger and faster and faster flew the animal to which the tail belonged. Ike laughed till he cried to see the cat scuttling before the wind. But now the bay lay before her and far out over the smooth ice was the blue water of the sea. The result can be guessed. The cat never came back and everybody wondered what had become of her and thought it augured ill luck for a cat to leave a house so suddenly. Ike thought so, especially for the cat. Ike's conscious reproached him sadly, but he compromised the matter by leaving the tenants of the barnyard in peace all the while he stayed there, and came home with a pocketful of doughnuts and an enviable reputation for propriety. The New Year and Allegory What are your intentions toward Miss New Year? sternly asked the old guardian of years, as time, in the garb of youth, 
stepped forward to make his proposals. The fair being to whom he aspired stood veiled before him in mystical beauty beside the seer, whose dim eyes had seen the birth and death of thousands of years, and whose beard was white with the frost of centuries, and whose voice creaked with the rust of many ages. Time, buoyant on the hopes of youth, promised much. Their union, he said, would be fruitful of great events. Joy and prosperity would attend upon it. By their union, the arms of the weak would be strengthened. The tyrant's power be shorn of its might. The poor and downtrodden be exalted. The desponding be made to sing for joy. Abuse be banished from the earth. The wrath of men be restrained. Struggle for light be crowned with success. The old guardian shook his head incredulously, and a tear fell upon his gray beard as he spoke. Alas, alas, he said, the same promises were made by your sire to his fair mother, and broken, as have been all the promises of time since the world began. Where is the fruition of the glorious hopes held out for bygone years? They have found their end in the gloom and disappointment. How can I trust, then, this precious charge to your arms in view of olden failures? Then young Time, laying down his hourglass and gaily swinging his scythe among the few weeds left of the herbage of the old year, made answer with a firm tone and a cheerful air. The violated promises of others should not be the criterion for judging of mine, nor their failure be urged as a presage for my own ill success. Let me prove myself by my acts, and if endeavor may win the goal, my chance is good. Let me try. The old guardian grasped Time by the hand approvingly. The hand of the virgin year was placed in his, and as the clock struck the hour of twelve, the form of the old seer faded from view, and the mystical one, for better or for worse, for joy and sorrow, became the wedded bride of time. Personal cleanliness is a virtue, but it is not pleasant to see a man cleaning his teeth with a questionable pocket handkerchief. Neither is it to see a man, however attentive he may be to the wants of his family, put a beef stock in the crown of his hat and fill his trousers' pockets with cucumbers. It don't look well. End of section 11. Section 12. The Architectural Black Eye. We met old Guzzle one day with a terrible black eye. Ah, said we to the interesting individual. Bad eye, that. Yes, that ear's an architectural eye. We asked an explanation. I say this ear an architectural eye because I got it from the Elizabethan architecture of our house. We were in the dark as much as ever. T'other night, continued he, I went home partially tight. I say partially, for upon my honor, I had drank but seven times during the evening. I felt my way up by the wainscoting because I didn't want to make a noise. And when I got to the top, I forgot what a deuced wide staircase it was. And when I turned to go towards any door, what does I do? but walk right downstairs again a good deal faster than when I went up and struck my head against the corner post and be hanged to it. Bad eye, in it? And all for that infernal Elizabethan stairway. We thought that the fault lay with the rum. Seeking a comment. It was with anxious feeling that Mrs. Partington, having smoked her specks, directed her gaze towards the western sky in the quest of the tailless comet of 1850. I can't see it, said she, and a shade of vexation was perceptible in the tone of her voice. I don't think much of this explanatory system, continued she, that they praise so, where the stars are mixed up so that I can't tell Jupiter from Satan, nor the consternation of the great bear from the man in the moon. Tit all dark to me. I don't believe that there is any comet at all. Who ever heard of a comet without a tail? I should like to know. It isn't natural, but the princess will make a tale for it fast enough, for they're always getting up comical stories. With a complaint about the falling dew and a slight murmur of disappointment, the dame disappeared behind a deal door like a moon behind a cloud. Among the Roman priesthood was a class called augurs. There are many great bores among our modern priests. Benevolence Unappreciated Philanthropos was at a public meeting one evening, where the heat was distressing, and observing a lady on a seat in front of him who appeared to be suffering from excessive warmth, he went out and bought a large fan, which he delicately set in motion, as if fanning himself, 
while he made every effort to give her the benefit of the artificial breeze becoming himself additionally heated from the exertion he made losing all interest in the concert from his intentness in the benevolent action and smiling to himself with the belief that his kindness was felt without its source being known he was thus benevolently happy until he heard the lady tell her husband to go and shut down that odious window behind her for she had felt cold on her neck all evening from the east wind philanthropos went out and sold the fan for seven cents that he had given a quarter for an hour before an editor having stated in his paper that he had been presented with a number of varieties of plums old roger declared his preference for the perpendicular the parting word in telling the story about a printer i am not about detailing the mysteries and difficulties of his occupation although a feeling and interesting sketch might be made of the business of his life with its care and toil for the good of the world i love the printers from association and long habit am proud now of their companionship and when walking arm in arm with my friend the president of the franklin typographical society i feel as well as if the individual in the hook of my arm were the president of the united states my intention in this little tale is simply to give the incidents of a printer's life wherein his heart was concerned and not to meddle with his profession in any way save to dignify my hero by the association the freeman's star was located in patney the shire town of seaburn county in our state and it exerted a great influence upon the mind and manners of the people society took its tone from the printing office the magnates of the place owned its sway perhaps through fear and the humblest looked towards it with reverence for they had heard of its power as the quote, defender of the people's rights end quote, and never deemed how much of humbug there was in the profession the editor was looked up to as a great man and people would touch one another as he passed and whisper that is the editor he had been foreman of a daily office in the city and his importance was unbounded on the assumption of his new honors in a proportionate degree all hands in the office were marked men the single journeyman the grown-up apprentice from the neighboring town and the demon himself were all marked individuals and people treated them deferentially for their connection with the mighty engine that had such power their opinions expressed at times about the weather or the elections or the crops were listened to attentively and everything that appeared in the freeman star was imputed to one or the other of the printers by the particular friends of each let a piece of village poetry appear or a good story called from some city paper and at once would be seen in it by the different parties traces of the mind of each of their favorites they would have known it to be his if they had seen it in the moon if they were by accident located in that planet and had met with it there it was in this office that i made the acquaintance of the hero of my story the grown-up apprentice who bore the un euphonous name of jabez b he was a spirited fellow very intelligent and as full of mischief as an egg is full of meat to use an expressive modernism he was a constant attendant upon the tavern in all his leisure moments we are attracting a crowd of countrymen around him he would astonish them by the keenness of his wit and the extent of his information and many a marvellous story have his country friends carried home as latest news that originated in the teeming brain of jabez steamboats were blown up and railroad accidents were as common then in this way as now when the melancholy realities need no draught upon the fancy for instances but he gained a character for wit at the expense of his moral reputation which is too often the case and at eighteen though everybody liked him and laughed with him he was set down as not likely to turn out very well a great phrase in patney people cautioned their sons and daughters about going in his company and evil communications corrupt good manners was written as a copy in every girl's and boy's writing book in town but he laughed at them all and the boys joined him and the girls who somehow or other always seemed to set more by the wild and mischievous than by the staid and prudent loved jabez very sisterly he was bold and generous qualities which no true woman can see in a man without admiring them far more discerning than older ones in matters of soul they had discriminated long ago between the mischief and wildness of jabez and his malice and wickedness and a large balance was set down in their heart in favour of his good qualities they saw a sympathetic smile or tear where those who decried them saw but levity and heartlessness they smiled upon him for striving to save the child's lamb from drowning in the well and rejoiced outright when he threw the bully over the fence who was maltreating the widow's son 
the most beautiful girl in patney was susan bray she was a charming little creature with an eye as blue as a violet in spring a voice as soft as the evening's bird a cheek like the blush of the apple blossom and a breath as sweet as its perfume breathed over the pearly purity of her teeth her form was slight and graceful and as lithe as the bending corn or the wavy pliancy of the yielding grass i am not good at describing beauty in ladies tis not my forte but i am determined hereafter to put myself under the hand of my friend paul creighton or some other master of art and become better versed in the science of drawing word portraits enough is it for my purpose to say that she was very beautiful and that over her beauty was thrown a fascination of manner and a propriety that was peculiarly delightful she gained for herself from her admiring companions the expressive sobriquet of the lily of the val and her modesty and grace justified the title she was the daughter of mr bray the village blacksmith and having been educated in a distant town her return to patney was like the rising of a new star or the discovery of a new flower the young men were delighted with her manners and the young women pleasant creatures gave her their hearts willingly for they feared rivalry from her no more than they would from the new moon she moved in a circle that the bold printer boy did not enter the blacksmith was a hard man and the reputation of jabez was such that it did not commend itself very favorably to the old man's mind and he had discouraged acquaintance with him from the time of her return however had jabez b looked upon the fair susan admiringly but at a distance he gazed upon her with a respectful feeling that had no affinity with the lighter and laughing affection he felt for the village girls of his acquaintance he felt that she was a superior being to the whole of them and his soul bowed with reverence to her shrine hoping nothing and asking nothing but to lay its silent offering at her feet as the simple votary brings garlands in the still of the morning to hang upon the shrine of some favorite saint it was a beautiful feeling and as pure as beautiful the love at first almost unconscious became at length the absorbing feeling of his life it marked his conduct and conversation and the unconfessed passion he felt molded the impetuous and the wild boy into a dreamer and a visionary he pored over books and the woods and glens and water brooks were familiar with his footsteps he acted in short dear reader as you and i and almost all others have done or might have done under like circumstances made himself very ridiculous and the freeman star literally groaned with the efforts of his awakened muse and well it might groan as everybody did that read what he wrote the poetry was more truthful than lovely and its quantity like the irishman's dance compensated for its quality the change in his conduct was marked business was more closely attended to and the tavern frequented less he became a perfect marvel to his friends who wondered what had come over him and as the spiritual knockings had just come along some in levity gave it as their opinion that he had had an interview with the ghost of his grandmother that had rebuked his gracelessness but though he was less lively than formerly he was none the less kind to all and everybody loved him as well or better than ever but fate so called that officiates as a sort of junior providence in the affairs of men decided that a passion so fostered and concealed should be known and that all the speculation with regard to jabez b's mystery grandmother's ghost and all should be swallowed up by a knowledge of the fact there was to be a great picnic in patney the freeman star had announced it for a month in big type and in an editorial notice had apprised the people that it was to occur on such a day weather permitting the editor dwelling with great eloquence upon the happy combination of beauty and cold chicken pancakes and poetry crackers and conversation cider and scenery and making up the sum total of its enjoyment the day came auspiciously the sun was bright and the air was balmy the lads and lasses laughed lavishly and the birds sang sweetly in the bushes in a grove near the company held high carnival to pan and the arches of the woods were vocal with the noise of mirth near by was a charming little lake hemmed in by trees and bordered by sedges dotted here and there by patches of lily pads amid whose deep green the water flowers gleamed like stars and this lake wooed many to its brink to admire its beauty to splash in its cool water or sail upon its still bosom in a tiny boat that was at hand jabez and susan were of the party and through the atmosphere of her presence he saw a new and mystical beauty in everything the trees were greener the berries were brighter the air was balmier and the music of the pines had a new and sweeter melody 
susan was one of a few that had wandered towards the lake and jabez had watched her at a distance fondly drinking in with every faculty of his being her charms as they became revealed to him and her playful movements among the trees and her smiles though not for him were sunshine to his heart and now his heart that interesting organ throbs wildly as he sees her with playful recklessness step upon the tiny boat and push it from the shore the treacherous twig to which the boat was tied broke at the strain it received and susan bray was afloat and alone upon the waters of the lake each effort she made to gain the shore was fruitless when her paddle having become entangled in the lily pads she was thrown pale as one of her kindred lilies into the water confusion immediately ensued and rash endeavour to save her only threatened her more sure destruction when jabez b rushed madly to the scene and in a minute was by her side the water was very deep but with one arm grasping the boat and the other supporting his fair burden he held her above the current until assistance came when completely exhausted with the exertion he fainted as he reached the shore in such a manner did the intimacy commence between jabez the printer and the fair susan bray an intimacy that resulted in a mutual affection as pure and exalted as ever burned in the breast of more noted heroes or heroines of romance the heroic conduct and generosity of her lover won her heart as her beauty and innocence had won his and they were mutually happy of course but the freeman star waned in its brilliancy its four hundred subscribers did not pay buckets and applesauce in which subscribers generally paid had ceased to be negotiable articles in the payment for paper and ink and the star went down in darkness leaving poor jabez minus employment but with plus hope love fed hope and hope held out her candle and faith grew strong within him that the future had great things in store for him lovers partings have been so often described that the parting of jabez and susan must be imagined for as every one will at once perceive it became necessary for them to part we will merely state with regard to it that it was tender and interesting to themselves and also to the miller's maiden sister who watched the last kiss on the doorstep when he tore himself away the night before he went to boston but she didn't hear what he said dear susan said he keep up a good heart and i shall return to you don't fear and i will prove myself worthy of you too god bless you and when we meet again we will love each other all the better absence makes the heart grow fonder you know so wipe your eyes susan dear and give me some word that i may remember when danger is nigh and will prove a love charm that evil and temptation cannot overcome he pressed her to his beating heart as he spoke and put the imprint of a kiss upon her brow jabez said she smiling through her tears your affections may be sorely tried in the great city and temptation will beset your path but my prayer shall be offered for you and the word i would have you remember above all others is fidelity let us be faithful to each other remember fidelity he kissed the lips that uttered the word and vowed to remember fidelity it is a strong word and embraces in its meaning the whole duty of man all of love truth honesty is comprised in its significance faithful of course he would be faithful and how could he be otherwise in the ardour of his young love it seemed the easiest thing in the world and now he is in the city a wondering and admiring stranger and after considerable difficulty a compositor on a morning paper day by day and night by night high under the eaves he is toiling breathing the fetid and smoky atmosphere of the printing office he has become the slave of the lamp he and all other slaves night which brings rest to the world brings no rest to him the holy sabbath with its sweet influences brings no solace for him christ has risen in vain the click of types at midnight is heard like a death watch denoting the flight of time telegraphs steamboats and railroads combine for his discomfort the reckless and the unhappy are his companions and gray struggles in vain to grow in an atmosphere impregnated with lamp smoke and sin it is the sacrifice of liberty and health of body and soul for money jabez had a strong hope in him which sustained him he bears the ribald jest often aimed at what he regards most sacred he sees the irreverence which bad men show for holy things at first he is shocked but the ingrained generosity of his associates leads him to think less unfavourably of their lack of morals and he laughs at what at first gave him pain fidelity was it a voice at his side that uttered the cabalistic word in his ear and that sunk down into his heart that word saved him 
it was a good angel enshrined in his memory that came to warn him of danger and exhort him to faithfulness and his feelings became again pure and fresh as when he left their inspiration come jabez said a brother typo tis saturday for this day at least we are free and now my boy what say you to having a good time let's go round and see the folks and with a laugh on his lip and the fire of fun in his eye and a sense of freedom in his mind he went with his good-natured persuader plunged with him into dens where rum flowed like water and the hoarse shout of revelry smote his ear with the discordance of the bottomless pit it needed no friendly warning to save him for his spirits shrank instinctively at the sights he saw and the sounds he heard one after another of these places he visited and each time with a dimming sense of their abominations the light of conscience became foggy in the dun of tobacco smoke and sensibility was blunted in the frequency of the vile exhibitions that met his gaze fidelity that word came again to him and the scales fell from his eyes the demon had lost his power and the serpent was revealed in all his hideousness from pleasure to pleasure through temptation after temptation in the dance in the saloons in the theatre his secret monitor came to him like the voice of a fire-bell and his spirit grew strong under its admonition on seasons of quiet and peaceful enjoyment too the word came to him approvingly and his soul received it as a beautiful token of unbroken love and hope revived it must be confessed i think that never yet was a printer attended by so faithful a monitor or by one that was half so well heeded and now sickness pressed upon jabez and he thought he was going to die i believe that it always happens that people in love or homesick people are more fearful of death than others it is your jolly debtor who honest man hopes by paying the debt of nature to pay all the rest he owes that is ready to die the poor printer was sad and said fidelity was heard but faintly in his dread to go he was delirious his mind wandered amid early scenes again with susan bray her voice he heard in his dreams exhorting him to fidelity again they stood together upon the old doorstep in patney and he was pouring into her listening ear the story of his temptations and his support and received from her sweet lips the desired approval of his faithfulness the meeting-house came up in his dream of bliss and within its walls robed in white stood susan bray and by her side himself arrayed in the bravery of a holiday suit a happy bridegroom a new star arose in patney boasting innumerable subscribers who all paid in money and not in buckets and applesauce himself its editor and himself the most important man in the village and whispered about as he walked along the street alas twas but the vagary of a diseased mind soon dispelled by the officious obtrusion of a spoon with medicine beneath his nose day by day he was watched almost hopelessly at last however a youthful constitution triumphed over disease and medicine a fearful odds and he became conscious bright eyes were beaming over him blue eyes suffused with tears and affection reader can you guess whose eyes they were right you have guessed right the first time they were susan bray's as bright and true as when two years before he had left them at patton though they had shed many tears over his prostrate form during his unconsciousness as if he or any printer that ever lived were worth such solicitude the first word they both pronounced was fidelity and their eyes proclaimed the fidelity of their hearts it is now about four years since the foregoing scene was enacted and the other day i received number one of a new paper called the freeman's star from patney edited and printed by jabez b a letter accompanied the paper containing a request that i should visit him at home and that susan his wife would be delighted to see me as soon as spring opens i shall go success to the printers say i and when temptation is besetting them as it too often is may they have a voice to speak to their generous souls exhorting them to fidelity on ghosts do you believe in ghosts mrs partington it was asked of the old lady somewhat timidly to be sure i do replied she as much as i believe that bright fulminary there we'll rise in the yeast to-morrow morning if we live and nothing happens two apprehensions have certainly appeared in our own family why i saw my dear paul a fortnight before he died with my own eyes just as plain as i see you now and though it turned out arterwards to be a rose-bush with a nightcap on it i shall always think to the day of my desolation that it was a forerunner sent to me 
t'other one came in the night when we were asleep and carried away the three candles and a pint of spirits that we kept in the house for an embarkment believe in ghosts indeed i guess i do and he must be a dreadful stippic as doesn't and she piously turned to the part of the book relating to the witch of endor stage companionship some folks are always talking and some with provoking taciturnity are always saying nothing to use a left-handed expression we like a good talker intelligent quick ready whose happy conversational power tends to make the rough way of life pleasant and we have a corresponding dread of one who drones and hesitates and speaks only by monosyllables and then as if he took out each word and looked at it before he dared to utter it it is amusing at times to observe two of these human opposites come in contact to hear the lively laugh and playful jest of the one as he rattles on like a fast horse over the paving stones striking a spark at every step and the sombre glumness of the other who hardly deigning to smile sits tongueless brooding over his thoughts like a hen at midnight put the two in a stage coach or rail car to modernize a little and see how the former will shine while the latter poor dummy though perhaps morally and intellectually worth six of the former sits unnoted or regarded only as some cheap fellow of no consequence we were one of three who one day long ago occupied seats with the driver of a stage during a fifty-mile ride and one of the company was the merriest fellow we ever saw he told stories sung songs and laughed till all rang again with our accompaniment by the dim woods that we passed and over the hills that we climbed it was a jolly ride surpassing that we think of the renowned mr pickwick where the very correct bob sawyer occupied an equally outside position with our illustrious selves we were somewhat inclined to be merry in those days may heaven forgive us and that ride was an event to be remembered lifelong the whole party enjoyed it save one and he was the most woebegone looking customer we had ever seen joking wouldn't have moved him he was impenetrable to any missile of that kind and there he sat with a countenance fifty miles long tis fair to reckon it by the length of the road gazing very sadly at the right ear of the nigh horse our funny companion at last bent his whole battery upon the silent man and tried to draw him out it was an entire failure and the joker a little chagrined at the other's imperturbability asked him in a somewhat hasty tone why the something he didn't talk without moving his eyes from the contemplation of the horse's ear he opened his head and these words dropped out what's the use of talking my son said mr smith to his little boy who was devouring an egg it was mr smith's desire to instruct his boy my son do you know that chickens come out of eggs oh they do father said young hopeful i thought the eggs came out of chickens the elder smith drew back from the table sadly and gazed upon his son then put on his hat and went to his work mr slow upon moral worth bim licked you must try and be a good man i always taught you that never let your name be at discount or change always mind and take up your notes cause credit's everything in the world what's a man without credit he ain't nothing he ain't nowhere for a man to be without credit is about as bad as poverty and a man without money or credit is to be despised avoid such people as you would the smallpox look at your grandfather bill Nitch, there's a sample for you to follow he always acted right he never owed a dollar and never lost one cause he was shrewd he never run round lending his money to folks not he mortgages did it and people used to love to have him foreclose on him cause he did it so good-naturedly he was a good man his name was always right on change he could always get money let it be ever so hard you never catched him squandering his money on charitable humbugs and encouraging porpoises not he and when he died he was worth two hundred thousand dollars and the ship's colors were histed half mast cause a good man had fell in israel blimmeck must approve under such training and isn't it the world's teaching continually mr slow off soundings the earth is round my son said mr slow impressively taking an apple from a boomlech's hand and holding it up beneath his thumb and finger like an apple and revolves on its own axle tree round the sun just as regular as any machine you ever see the earth is made up of land and water and rocks besides vegetation and trees and things growing the mountains upon the surface of the earth are very high more than a half a mile i should think some of them are called white mountains because they ain't black 
The ocean is very deep, and some folks think it ain't got no bottom. This is all gammon. Everything has got a bottom, my son. The reason they can't find it is cause the world is round. They throw their sinker overboard and goes right through one side like this, thrusting his knife through the apple, and hands down underneath just so. Of course, they can't find a bottom. Mr. Slow gives his boy the apple and turns round, much satisfied with himself. What is a waxed end? asked one not posted in the vocabulary of Lynn. A waxed end, was the reply, as the end that receives the wax. An editor a little heated. Copy, quotha, copy, with a thermometer at ninety-six degrees. What an unconscionable dog it is, to be sure, to worry one so. Not one line, so help us, Stebbins. Not one line. Avant, quit our sight, for the heat of the day is fused into our spirit, and by that sword which gleams above us, annihilation awaits you if you dare provoke us with your importunity. The idea of writing at such time is abominable, and no reasonable devil would insist on it. A vile knave thou art at best, with thy swart and lank jaws, there disintended, bawling for copy. Grin away, you waif, from the lake of Tartarus, whose burning flood ne'er yielded a more hideous whelp for our, or the world's torment. We tell thee, swart minion, vile mercury of inordinate jaws, that copy thou canst not have. What? Right when the atmosphere, like hot lava, wreathes the brow, and sticks there with the tenacity of molten pitch, and burns, and burns upon the brain like the thirst for revenge, or the seething scald of impending pecuniary obligation. Away, caitiff, and tell thy master this, and tell them too, that we will see them hang, ere we will write a line for them to-day. Vamos, eh? Mizzle, scatter. Or by St. Paul, temper outrage shall take to itself form and launch its thunders on thy devoted head. But stay, this the abelian of our wrath is copy, poor at best. Give it him. Don't cut it, miss. Don't you think my dress much too long? asked Serafina, the youngest of the seven, of old Roger. Don't cut it, miss, even if it is. I beg of you as a friend not to cut it, said the old man seriously. Why not? inquired she timidly because miss i remember a difficulty of my own once under like circumstances which was a source of much shame to me overtaken by a severe shower far from home i was terribly drenched and a new pair of sheepskin inexpressibles that i wore tied close to the knee was the fashion then received the dripping streams from my body and distended like a bad case of the dropsy fell below my calves like your dress they were too long and i cut them off at the knee but the warm sun came out, and the sheepskin contracted. Inch by inch I felt it creeping up my legs, and by the time I got home you may be sure I was a sight to behold. Don't cut it, miss, unless you feel perfectly sure it will not shrink more. There was a smile at the old gentleman's delicacy in the matter, but there could be no fear of danger, and they didn't see how the cases were parallel at all. Twenty-nine cats. Scat! screamed Mrs. Partington from the head of the stairs, as the noise of an interesting quadruped of the cat species in the kitchen below met her ears. Skaya, I say! She listened to ascertain the result of her command, but the noise was resumed, and the little kitchen echoed again with feline music, spitting and mewing and growling, with a concatenation of malignity and every note of it that reached her as she leaned over the banister. Gracious heaven! cried she. I should think that there were twenty of them. What shall I do? Scat! She screamed again, and the noise redoubled. Indeed, it appeared to her excited fancy that a reinforcement had arrived, and were all in full chorus, and now the crash of crockery added to her fear. She dared not go down, for, of all things in the world, she feared a spiteful cat. It became suddenly still in a moment or so, and she ventured downstairs. A broken plate was on the floor, with traces of molasses upon the fragments, and Ike very demurely sat behind the stove, counting his marbles. "'Has there been any cats in here, Isaac?' asked the kind old lady, looking anxious round the room. Twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine. "'Where, for goodness sake, did twenty-nine cats come from?' asked she. "'But I know there was a good many of them. "'And there's a chooser,' continued Ike, still counting, "'and a Chinese. "'Anything like the Maltese, Isaac?' inquired she. "'I mean marbles, aunt,' said Ike. "'And I mean cats, Isaac,' said Mrs. Partington severely. "'It was a scene for a painter. "'Coffins should do it up. 
her eyes alternated between the broken plate and the boy as if pondering the mystery of the sound she had heard and ike wiped the molasses from his mouth on his sleeve didn't the molasses on the plate explain it he had to take a lecture you may depend on the certainty of roguish boys being awfully punished for plaguing the aged and he had to read the story aloud before he went to bed that night of the boys who were eaten up by the she bears. End of section twelve. Section thirteen. A coach containing a young man and woman with one trunk on behind, behind the coach is meant, is pleasingly suggestive of matrimony. Yes, said old Roger sardonically but a half a dozen young ones and seven handboxes are much more suggestive. There's no mistaken signs like those. Mrs. Partington on tobacco. I know that tobacco is very dilatorious, said Mrs. Partington as Mr. Trask sat conversing with her upon the body and soul, destroying nature of the weed. I know that tobacco is dilatorious, especially to a white floor. And taking out her snuff-box, the broad one with the picture of Napoleon on the color, she tapped it and offered a pinch to her guest. "'Snuff is just as bad,' said he, laying his finger gently on her arm and speaking earnestly. "'Snuff injures the intellect, affects the nerves, destroys the memory. It is tobacco in its most subtle form, and the poison appears as the devil did in Eden, under a pleasing exterior.' She gazed upon him a moment in silence. "'I know,' said she. It has a tenderness to the head, but I couldn't do without it. It is so auxiliating to me when I'm down to the hill. And if it is a pison, as you call it, I should have been killed by it forty years ago. Good stuff, like good tea, is a great blessing. And I don't see how folks who have no amusement can get along without it. The box was dropped back to its receptacle, and her friend took his leave, sighing that she would persist in shortening her days by the use of snuff and stopped a moment to lecture Ike, who was enjoying a sugar cigar upon the front doorstep. Guitar in the head. Mrs. Partington's neighbor, Mrs. Sled, complained one morning of a ringing in her ears. It must be owing to the guitar in your head, dear, said the old lady. She knew every sort of human ailment, and like the downcast doctor, was death on fits. I know what that ringing in the ears is, continued she, for my ears used to ring so bad sometimes as to wake Paul out of his sleep thinking it was alarm of fire. There was no doubt she was telling what was true, but there were some that questioned it in a gentle cough. We haven't a doubt in its truth. A singular fact. Them were our very fat critters, remarked Mrs. Partington, as she stood viewing a yoke of splendid steers. Yes, am replied the farmer. And would you believe it, mum? They were fattened on nothing but oat straw, and it hadn't been threshed neither. You don't say, said she for a moment doubt of the probability of the story occupied her mind it was but for a moment well i never continued she and turned aside to admire the beauties of a new cider press a hit at the times bred by steam power screamed mrs partington as she heard isaac commence a paragraph about making bread by steam she laid down her work placed her hands upon her lap and looked broadly at the boy through her specs bred by steam said she what will the world do next? I wonder if this is one of the labor-saving inventions now. But I see what it will end is. People are fast enough already, in all consciousness. But what will they do when they come to be bred by steam power if they act according to their bringing up? Ah, uh, Isaac, people may be faster now, but they are no better than they used to be. Isaac explained that it was a new mode of making bread. She looked at him steadily for a moment, when, taking a thumb and finger full, she put the cover on the box, resuming her knitting, and told Isaac to go on, which he did. The poor printer. The poor printer, poor in purse we mean, reduced to penury and rags and asking alms about the printing offices, is a melancholy sight. There is enough in one such spectacle to give any man the double-breasted horrors for a whole day. There is a most woe-begone, miserable hopelessness in him as he asked your aid in the name of his profession of printing the noble art that he, perhaps, may have honored in his better days. Bad luck, or worse, liquor, often symptoms of the latter predominate, combined with a want of self-respect, have reduced him to his present condition. He is no common beggar. 
There is a something in his tone as he asks for your aid that tells plainly it is not his true vocation, that he is forcing his nature into a most unnatural current and asking for assistance. He has none of the same lies that appear ready framed on the lips of common vigors. No volcanoes have poured their burning lavas on his head or other property. No furious tornadoes have swept away his earthly hopes and homestead and driven him forth a wanderer. No overwhelming tide has pursued him relentlessly in other lands to give him a fortune here. But he stands before you, and his appearance pleads for him. He looks like a low case, dusty and pied, or a form picked from sorts and squabbling under the accumulation of indulged dust. There is a persuasion in his seedy coat, buttoned to the chin, a coat in which a dim geniality struggles to overcome the poverty clouds or cobwebs that mar it. There is persuasion in the hat, that venerable tile, whose form of three fashions past indicates certainly as an almanac the date of the declension of his golden days. There is persuasion in his familiar look at things, an air that says, This is nothing new to me. I've seen all this before. There is persuasion much more in the tone of the voice that asks the gift, as if it were a loan or the return of some money in your keeping from him. There is no servility in his asking, and his story is a direct recital of his troubles. He is sick, has a disorder in his head, his wife is dead, his hope has all fled. For days, haven't seen a bed, nor had one mouthful of bread, and is quite famished shed. What a recital! And you cry, Nuff seed! and the quarter comes at once from your yielding purse. What a comfortable reflection it is as we place the coin in his extended hand, and it forces home a question of great moment, drawn from a contingency that grows, some think, out of the nature of the art. Whose turn will come next? And the richest of the journeymen feels more humble as he ponders on what may happen. Mr. Slow on Grave Topics Bail Mac, my son said Mr. Slow, shaking his head with oracular and owl-like profundity. "'It isn't well to know too much, my boy. Your father never did, and he knowed too much for that. Thoughts as perplexing in the human mind, Bill Mac, as too precious the thing to be wore out with too much friction. Don't abuse the gifts of Nader, my son, cause Nader's one of them. She is. Don't investigate anything new, my boy, cause there's a thousand old things of more contents to look arter. A first of which is number one. New notions perplexes the mind, dear. There's full enough fools in the world who look to look arter sich things without your trouble and benefit to you. Call em all humbug and moonshine and them as believes in lunatics and scoundrels and that'll save you a good many discussions and give you a character for dignity and prudence and prudent folks make money. Philosophy and scions and them things is humbugs and everything is humbugs but money. Mind, I tell ye. Mr. Slow ceased, overcome by his own eloquence. Paying an old debt. Working out a debt is often called working a dead horse, and we think not inaptly, the more especially when a man is poor, with a family depending upon him for support, then a pickaxe becomes a weary thing, and every shovelful of dirt weighs four times as much as when the heart of the laborer is cheered by the hope of the dollar ahead. But it is well to pay one's debts, though it is far better not to owe anything. A piece of advice that St. Paul utters with great earnestness as if he were practically sensible of the disadvantage of indebtedness. A man who had run up a long score at a shop for liquor, cigars, and other creature comforts found himself utterly unable to pay a stiver of it. In vain was he urged to pay the bill, and in vain was he threatened if he didn't. He hadn't any money, the true secret of his getting in debt in the first place, and the creditor gave it up. At last he thought he would compromise the matter and let the man work the debt off. The creditor had a large pile of wood in his barn, several cords of it nicely sawed and split, and he forthwith set the debtor at work to throw the wood into the street and then pile it back again, at the rate of a shilling an hour, until the whole debt would be wiped out. The man took hold with a will, and in short time the wood was all in the street, then went back with equal celerity, and then out again, and then in, everybody wondering what it could mean. Some charitably intimated that he was crazy, and others, equally charitable, said he was drunk. He toiled on thus the whole day, throwing the wood back and forth, but every hour seemed full sixty minutes longer than its predecessor, as he watched the clock on the old church in the neighborhood. He was working a dead horse, and it was hard making him go, but the longest road must have an end, and the hour neared when the labor and debt would cease together, and as the hammer of the clock told the hour of his release, the freedman threw the last stick of wood into the street with a shout of triumph. 
The shout brought the owner of the wood to the door, who found his late debtor putting on his coat to go away. Hello, said he. You are not going away without putting the wood back again, are you? I'll put it back again for a shilling an hour, said the man. The proprietor of the wood saw that he had been done, but good-naturedly told his late debtor to go ahead and put it back. He went about it, but strange to say, it took him just three times as long to put it back as it did to throw it out. Mrs. Partington, having been asked what the consequences would be if an irresistible should come in contact with a movable body, replied that she thought one or t'other of them would get hurt. Operatic Rebuke I can't catch the malady, said Mrs. Partington at the opera, as she stood upon tiptoe in the lobby of Howard Athenaeum, in vain attempting to look over the heads before her. She had received a ticket, but it secured nothing but an outside position, and she had gone wandering round like a jolly planet without any particular orbit. Ike was in the gallery, eating a penny's worth of peanuts, and throwing the shells into the parquet below. I can't catch the malady of the uproar, and more half the words are all Dutch to me. This is the first opiotic performance I ever went to, and if I can't get a say, I can't stand it to come again. She said it very firmly. As she was going down the stairs, a young gentleman with curly hair reached over the banisters and blandly informed her that he could furnish her with a seat. She turned her benevolent spectacles and face attached towards him, and told him it was rather late, after the evening had half gone, to think of politeness. It was a picture, the young curly head bending over the banister, and the spectacles and the black bonnet and the widow of Corporal Paw on the stairs looking up. It was sublime. Smith and Blank It gives us a mournful feeling every time the above sign on a business street meets our eye. It is simply a white pine sign with the letters upon it done in black. There is nothing peculiar in its construction, but the blank termination with the ampersand, once the connecting character of a prosperous firm, maybe, but now seeming to exist only with reference to some future contingency, denotes separation, and thus as indicating this, the sign becomes an important sign of the times. The name that formerly graced it, though no longer needed there, is still to be traced through the white coat spread over it, as if yet asserting its claim to consideration. Alas, poor ghost! Is it better to let Smith have it all to himself? What caused the separation? Did the Jones, whom we see dimly through the white lead, which covers him like a shroud, shuffle off this mortal coil, and leave Smith there alone, like a boy tilting on one end of a plank? Had Jones a wife and children, and do they yet look up wistfully at the sign as they pass it by, as if with a sort of undefined hope in their minds that Jones may be in there somewhere now? Or do they weep as they gaze upon it at its suggestion of their own loneliness? Or has the widow forgotten, long ago, the man under the mold, and another Jones, with another name, taken his place in the domestic firm? Or does she yet stand, like the ampersand, on the sign, beckoning some other Jones to write his name on the blank space in her heart and begin anew? It may have been a separation in strife, where uncongeniality of mind, temper, and habits engendered bitterness, and the hours flew by freighted with mutual curses upon the ill-starred union of Smith and Jones, and separation was the result. How happy were they, maybe, at the beginning, as they sat down to talk over their business schemes, while Hope held her candle for them as they ciphered out a path to fortune through the intricacies of trade, talking as lovers talk, never dreaming like lovers that the elements might exist in themselves for the destruction of their hopes and happiness. We can fancy the bitter days, the reproaches, abuse, and violence that ended in the painter's brush upon the sign and the announcement in the post of dissolution. But why is that ampersand left there? Does Smith, with his bitter experience, want another Jones to torment him? Perhaps Smith and Jones were well-meaning men, who tried the firm on and found it unable to carry double, and then divided good-naturedly, and are now carrying on trade each by himself, and each happy in a knowledge of the good qualities of the other, each ready to endorse the other's note, each having for the other a cordial salutation when meeting, and, How are ye, Smith? And, how are ye, Jones, sounding heartily, as if they meant something more than the words usually imply, and inquiring about each other's business, with as much earnestness as formerly went together, each referring to that time with satisfaction, and speaking of my old partner Smith, or Jones, with affection and respect. It is some comfort to conjure up a picture like this, and regret that Jones should be cut off in his goodness. Smith and blank. 
We don't like to see it, anyhow. If Smith should choose to let his name stand there forever, as now, he may do so if he can, nobody can hinder him, or will want to, but Smith should not allow that ampersand to remain there, as if hinting at something it is afraid to say, trembling upon the verge of it, and holding back without venturing upon it. The bond is broken that united the twain, and why should Mr. Smith offend our chaste eye by leaving that ampersand to drag along behind his name? Now there is no use for it, like the end of a broken chain beneath a cart. "'Pull away, ma'am, pull away,' said old Roger in the omnibus, as he saw a heavy lady dragging vigorously at the check-string. "'Another such jerk as that, and he must come through.' "'Ta where?' asked she sharply. "'Why, through the hole there, to be sure you were trying to get him through it, wasn't you?' "'No, I wasn't. I was only stopping the horses, Mr. Impudence.' "'Oh,' said the old gentleman. "'Was that all? Excuse me.' She got out, and the bus moved on. A woman that one could love. Now, there is a woman that one could love, said old Roger delightedly as he saw a figure arrayed in the full feather of fashion in a window in Washington Street. A long life could be spent very quietly in such company. No quarreling for precedence, no jealousy, no strife of any kind, no teasing for dress and follies, till one's purse strings ache in sympathy with aching heart strings at unchecked extravagance. Even I could love such a woman as that. Perhaps you could, responded a sweet voice at his side. But would it love you back again, think you? There would be no return for your investment of affection here in this heartless thing, this mere frame. You should turn your attention to something worthy of your love, where, for a small outlay of affection, a tenfold return would be made you in domestic joy. Alas, said the old bachelor, where shall I find this? But the beautiful eyes that met his proved how easily the question might be answered, and with a melancholy step he passed along. He was more a bachelor from habit than from choice, after all. Introducing the Water "'Bless me!' exclaimed Mrs. Partington, coming in out of breath, and dropping down into a chair like a jolly old kedge anchor, at the same time fanning herself with an imaginary fan. She did not say, "'Bless me!' because she was in want of any particular blessing at that time, it was merely an ejaculation of hers, expressive of deep emotion. "'Bless me!' said she. "'I don't see why the water commissionaries were so much worried and fretted about introducing the coquituant water for. I think it is the easiest thing in the world to get acquainted with. Look at that bonnet now.' Holding up the antiquated but well-preserved bit of crepe, dripping with water drops like the umbrella of Aquarius. "'Look at that bonnet now. Ruined to all tents and porpoises by the pesky waterworks. Introduce it, indeed.' continued she ironically, looking severely at the wrecked article in her hand. "'Tain't no use of introducing an acquaintance that makes so free with you at first sight.' She arose to hang up her bonnet when Ike, who was hanging upon the back of her chair, fell heavily against the window and thrust the rear portion of his person through four panes of glass. "'Oh, Isaac,' said she, "'you'll be the ruination of me. If I was rich as Cressote, I couldn't stand it. Isaac gathered himself from among the fragments of glass, and seemed quite tickled with an idea that he could sell the pieces in conjunction with a reserve of old iron and half of the clothesline and three junk bottles to raise funds for the 4th of July. Rather funny. Old Roger was standing in State Street and saw an Irishman rolling a keg of speci from his cart to the institution for which it was intended. There said the old fellow to the foreign gentleman who was standing by him. There you see the benefit of our free institutions. There is a man who came to this country six months ago, as poor as poor could be, and now, you see, he is actually rolling in riches. He said this and turned round very red in the face and struck his cane several times violently on the sidewalk and waited for his friend to explode. Hearing no sound of cachination, he turned and found the gentleman vainly endeavoring to decipher the emblems on the merchant's exchange. He evidently hadn't understood the joke. On one string. The prayer of Moses executed on one string, said Mrs. Partington. Praying, I suppose, to be cut down. Poor Moses, sighed she, executed on one string. Why, well, I don't know as ever if I heard of anybody's been executed on two strings unless the rope broke. And she went on wondering how it could be. Seeking the light. 
I declare I don't know what to think on it, said Mrs. Partington as she looked intently into the water pail. The attitude was peculiar, and the iron-bowed specks were on duty like a sentry on a bridge, keeping a bright lookout over the water. I can't see into it. This was wrong if we take it literally, because the water was as pure and transparent as her own benevolence. I can't see into it, and the more I preponderate upon it, the more I'm in a bewilderness. How Mr. Payne can make light of water is more than I can see. I can't throw no light on it. I think it's made of some sort of gin. My poor Paul's head used to be made light by gin and water, but it didn't burn as they say this well. Her listeners stood hatless, almost breathless, as her voice came up through her cap border, like the steam from around the cover of a wash boiler, while Ike put the experiment to a practical test by pouring a dipper of water into the stove. Judging virtue by its smell. It smells virtuous, said Mrs. Partington as she smelt of the heart-shorn bottle that had long lain in an old-fashioned high closet, before which the old lady stood on a tall chair exploring the dark interior of the receptacle for unconsidered trifles. It smells virtuous. We had often heard of the peculiar odor of goodness that rises like frankincense amid an atmosphere of vice, and here was a practical application that attested the justness of the term. It was sublime, and the figure standing there on the high chair, like truth on a pedestal, with the specks and the close cap and the blue yarn stockings, formed a subject for a sculptor poorer than which had immortalized hundreds. Abuses of the Press The printing press is a great steam engine, said Mrs. Partington, but I don't believe Dr. Franklin ever invented it to commit outrages on a poor female woman like me. It makes me set everything, Mrs. Sled, and some of the things I know must have been said when I was out, for I can't remember them. And she dropped three stitches in her excitement. They ought to know, continued she, that them who make sport of the agent don't never live to grow up. Mouse Hunting An Incident in the Life of Mrs. Partington it was midnight, deep and still in the mansion of Mrs. Partington, as it was very generally about town, on a cold night in March. So profound was the silence that it awakened Mrs. P., and she raised herself upon her elbow to listen. No sound greeted her ears, save the tick of the old wooden clock in the next room, which stood there in the dark, like an old crone, whispering and gibbering to itself. Mrs. Partington relapsed beneath the folds of the blankets, and had one eye again well coaxed towards the realm of dreams, while the other was holding by a very frail tenure upon the world of reality, when her ear was saluted by the nibble of a mouse directly beneath her chamber window, and the mouse was evidently gnawing her chamber carpet. Now, if there is an animal in the catalogue of creation that she dreads and detests, it is a mouse, and she has a vague and indefinite idea that rats and mice were made with especial regard for her individual torment. As she heard the sound of the nibble by the window, she arose again upon her elbow and cried, Shoo! Shoo! energetically several times. The sound ceased, and she fondly fancied that her trouble was over. Again she laid herself away as carefully as she would have lain eggs at forty-five cents a dozen when, nibble, nibble, nibble. She once more heard the odious sound by the window. Shoo! cried the old lady again, at the same time hurling her shoe at the spot from whence the sound proceeded, where the little midnight marauder was carrying on his depredations. A light burned upon the hearth, she couldn't sleep without a light, and she strained her eyes in vain to catch a glimpse of her tormentor playing about amid the shadows of the room. All again was silent, and the clock, giving an admonitory tremble, struck twelve. Midnight, and Mrs. Partington counted the tintinnabulous knots as they ran off the reel of time with a saddened heart. Nibble, nibble, nibble. Again that sound, the old lady sighed as she hurled the other shoe at her invisible annoyance. It was all without avail, and the shoeing was bootless, for the sound came again to her wakeful ear. At this point her patience gave out, and conquering her dread of the cold, she arose and opened the door of her room that led to a corridor, when, taking the light in one hand and a shoe in the other, she made the circuit of the room and explored every nook and cranny in which a mouse could ensconce himself. She looked under the bed and under the old chest of drawers and under the washstand and shooed until she could shoe no more. The reader's own imagination, if he has an imagination skilled in limey, must draw the picture of the old lady, well upon this exploring expedition, accounted as she was, in search of the ridiculous mouse. 
We have our own opinion upon the subject, and must say, with all due deference to the years and virtues of Mrs. P., and with all regard for personal attractions very striking in one of her years, we should judge that she cut a very queer figure indeed. Satisfying herself that the mouse must have left the room, she closed the door, deposited the light upon the hearth, and again sought repose. How gratefully a warm bed feels when exposure to the night air has chilled us as we crawl to its enfolding coverit. How we nestle down like an infant by its mother's breast, and own no joy superior to that we feel, coveting no regal luxury while reveling in the elysium of feathers. So felt Mrs. P. as she again ensconced herself in bed. The clock in the next room struck one. She was again near the attainment of the state when dreams are rife, when, close by her chamber door, outside she heard that hateful nibble renewed, which had marred her peace before. With a groan she arose, and seizing her lamp, she opened the door and had the satisfaction to hear the mouse drop, step by step, until he reached the floor below. Convinced that she was now rid of him, for the night she returned to bed and addressed herself to sleep. The room grew dim, and the weariness of her spirit, the chest of drawers in the corner, was fast losing its identity and becoming something else. In a moment more, nibble, 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 again outside of the chamber door, as the clock in the next room struck two. Anger, disappointment, desperation fired her mind with a new determination. Once more she arose, but this time she put on a shoe, her dexter shoe. Ominous movement. It is said that when a woman wets, her finger flees had better fly. The star of that mouse's destiny was setting, was now near the horizon. She opened the door quickly, and as she listened a moment, she heard him drop again from stair to stair, on a speedy passage down. The entry below was closely secured, and no door was open to admit of his escape. This she knew, and a triumphant gleam shot athwart her features, revealed by the rays of the lamp. She went slowly down the stairs until she arrived at the floor below, where snugly in a corner, with his little bead-like black eyes looking up at her roguishly, was the gnar of her carpet and the annoyer of her comfort. She moved towards him, and he, not coveting the closer acquaintance, darted by her. She pursued him to the other end of the entry, and again he passed by her. Again and again she pursued him with no better success. At last, when, in most doubt as to which side would conquer, fortune, perched upon the banister, turned the scale in favor of Mrs. P. The mouse, in an attempt to run by her, presumed too much upon former success. He came too near her upraised foot. It fell upon his muscipular beauties like an avalanche of snow upon a new tile, and he was dead for ever. Mrs. Partington gazed upon him as he lay before her. Though she was glad at the result, she could but sigh at the necessity which impelled the violence, but for which the mouse might have long continued a blessing to society in which he moved. Slowly and sadly she marched upstairs, with her shoe all sullied and gory, and the watch who saw it through the front door squares told us this part of the story. That mouse did not trouble Mrs. Partington again that night, and the old clock in the next room struck three before sleep again visited the eyelids of the relic of Corporal Paul. End of section 13 Section 14 Stargazing out beneath the starry heavens, Mr. Slow took his son, Abimelech, to point out to him, to read to him from the broad page of nature, the wonders of the spacious furnishment on high, as he called it. All these air stars, my son, said Mr. S., pointing up to the studded sky above them, that you see up there, stationary and unmovable, marching along in sublime grandeur, and winking at the air with their jolly yellow eyes like gold eagles. Them are called fixed stars, and... But what's that, father? said young Abimelech, as a meteor, like a racer, darted across the southerly sky. Mr. Slow was prompt with his answer. That, said he, I guess is one of them that's got unfixed. Mrs. P. on Mount Vesuvius So there's been another rupture of Mount Vesuvius, said Mrs. Partington, as she put down the paper and put up her specs. The paper tells all about the burning lava running down the mountain, but it don't tell us how it got a fire. I wonder if it was set fire too. There are many people fool wicked enough to do it, or perhaps it was caused by children playing with frictious matches. 
I wish they had sent for a fireman. They would have put a stop to the raging element, and I and I dare say Mr. Barnacle and all of them would have gone, for they are what I call real civil engineers. There was a whole broadside of commendation of the fire department in the impressive gesture accompanying her words. Time and space for a moment became annihilated, and imagination figured the city engines pouring their subduing streams upon the flames of Vesuvius and hold on sewing and break her down twelve rising above the vain roarings of the smothering crater the picnic a grand domestic drama in many acts in which are detailed the fun and drawbacks attending a pleasure execution in the town of Budsledon. mr homespun who has something to say to all and about everybody Jemima Short, a sweet little country rose, Mr. Blisby, a gentleman from the city, Miss Primrose, a refined lady of thirty-five, full of sentiment and some snuff, Mr. Brindle, a bachelor of fifty-eight and a justice of the peace, Miss Pigeon, a bird too tough for sentiment, auxiliaries, horses, pigeon pie, etc. by the company. The morn as bright in Basleton, and kindly beams the sun, and spreads his choicest rays around as if he dreamt of fun. The girls are up and wide awake, the lads are spruce and gay, for a picnic party is arranged for this bright summer day. And won't we have a time of it? Just see the bag of doughnuts that Jemima Short has thrown out of the window into the wagon, and there go three chickens and four pies and a jug of cider. Goodness gracious, Jemima, you're an angel of a provider, you are. You don't mean to put us on a regiment today, do you? You look like an earthly goddess, too, and your new pink calico. I vow it looks first rate. I took it for chinchilla rod off. Jemima, I don't know. I don't think much of it, but folks tell me it's becoming Miss James, the railway now got the pattern from the city, and... How do you do, Miss Short? Gwyn in the picnic? Miss Short, with a cold in her head. No, guess not. Don't feel smart, Saxony. And the old man's got the romantic affection in his leg and can't go another. But my mom's going, and she has had her hair and papers a whole week to make her look pretty. Jemima, why, mother, how do you talk? But here they come. Oh, what a host of them. How proud Betsy Bab feels of her new dress. I guess some folks can look full as well as some folks, and there's that everlasting old maid, Miss Pigeon. How I hate her with her scraggy neck and long tongue. And there's Patty Sprigg's city beau. Oh, I wouldn't be hard to be seen with such a fright. The wagons packed with eatables go groaning o'er the road. The long carts filled with girls and beaux show an attractive load. And laughter rules the pleasant hour and eyes shine gay and bright, the only kind of stars that show as well by day as night. Laughter. Guess you'd think so to hear it. Now the cart settles down into a rut. Dear me, says Miss Tibbs, we shall all be upsot tupsy turvy. Do hold on to me. And then everybody thinks that they must be held on to, and everybody else is trying to hold on to somebody. Oh, how frightened the city beauty is. Do you apprehend any danger of tergiversation? No, says Joe Hayes. The slack men look arter than things, and everybody's inoculated for it. Female voice. Be still, won't you, oh you Satan, see how you have tumbled my collar with your pesky nonsense, and my face burns like fire coals. Right before a city gentleman, too, oh for shame. City gentleman, upon my honor, miss, I was entirely oblivious to any impropriety. Oh, it wasn't very improper either, he he he, only such things shouldn't be done publicly, you know. Miss Pigeon, if Susan Fry isn't settin' on Sam Sled's knees, I ain't a livin' sinner. Such conduct I must think improper. I was never guilty of such indiscretion. I never was. Boy is singing. There's fun in a country cart and life on a dusty road where mirth warms every heart and pleasure finds abode. The town may boast of its joys, its racket and its din, but give a hunt away from its noise, some quiet nook within. 
far from the busy din of town in some secluded grove the happy parties sit them down or unrestricted rove all austere rules that bind the world are here thrown far aside and reveling in mirth's bright beam how fleet the moments glide arm in arm under the shady tree they now wander picking posies or bright berries and such fun miss primrose smiles languidly a sort of sky-blue benignity upon old brindle the bachelor miss primrose sentimentally how delightfully those pines sigh in the gentle breeze like the soft music of love in the ear of youth old brindle yes so it does miss primrose oh i do so love the pines old brindle they're better in may mum when the liver is thick and creamy come out here then ma'am out with your jackknife throw away your tobacco cut out a square and sliver up the tree allers sliver up ma'am some slivers down that's when you'd know the pines mum miss primrose that's an entirely new aspect I meant their romantic beauty. Old Brindle. It has some beautiful wood, very worth four dollars a cord in Boston. Here comes Patty Sprigg and a musty, choked man from the city. City man. Miss Sprigg, how delightfully rural it is here. Always thought I should like to live among the beauties of nature. It's a great pity we can't have any nature in town, a great pity. I've heard some of human nature round here, but never seen any of it. Patty Sprigg. I should think they might bring it in by package, as they did the cottage weight. City man. Are those ground nuts? Patty Sprigg. No, my dear, no, don't eat them. They're toadstools. Thus we go on, chatting, walking, voices ringing with the pines, nothing our gay fancies bulking, doing all our heart inclines. Now on the green in beautitous sod, the varied viands spread, and appetite shall wait on health and wit its influence shed. The social tongue with music rife blends with the platter's noise, as earth's rude jarring interferes with its harmonious joys. Here's a tongue and ham and sausages and pumpkin, pie and cheese, mercy, what a bill of fare, Miss Pewitt. Shall I help you to a piece of tongue? No, thank you. I've had enough of my own, but I'll trouble you for a piece of chicken. Chicken, did you say? From his toughness, I should say, he was a grandfather to thousands. Pass the pigeon yonder, will you? What's the old maid? No, no, the pie. There's the plate. The pigeon is unavoidably detained. Miss Pigeon. I'd thank people who use my name to speak so that I can hear I don't like being backbitten. We were speaking of pigeon pie, ma'am. Something more tender, aside. Say, Tom, what have you got in the dish there? Pickled grasshoppers, I should think. Will you have some? Miss Primrose, do allow me to help you. Here's some ham, delicate as your own nature, ma'am. Miss Primrose, I declare you are quite complimentary, comparing my nature with smoked hog. Will Mr. Blisby, the gentleman from the city, favor us with a song? Silence, ye gentlemen and ladies, all that grace this famous picnic. Mr. Blisbury's going to sing. Mr. Blisby, I'd rather be excused, but though I am not exactly in tune, I'll endeavor for the occasion. Mr. Blisby sings, My love is fair, oh, she is fair, her lips are red, her eyes like slow. A golden glory is her hair, falling over shoulders white as snow, and when her eyes upon me turn and burn with radiance divine, my ardent gaze encounters hern, the same as hern encounters mine. Child yelling, Mother, give me another piece of pie. Mother, hush, my darling, there ain't any. Boy, I say that is, I want a piece of pie. Oh, such a mingling of talking and jingling. The noise and glee sound merrily and set our ears a-tingling. 
a dance a dance and gleefully a set as forth with planned a fiddle most mysteriously has happened here at hand and here beneath the dark tree shade with leaves and berries crowned each happy lad and laughing maid whirl in the dance around go at my top sawyer on the pussy gut work your elbows lively and we'll put her through by daylight oh dear i'm all of a perspiration with sweat how slippery it is underfoot it ain't slippery anywhere else i swore to man there's bill not her and jemima short both down up and try it again clumsies miss promos how these old woods echo with the music mr brindle like the arcadian groves with the dulcet notes of the satires mr brindle i've never heard em i guess they never was in these woods they never was that i can remember i declare there's mr blisby dancing like an animated bean pole <laughs> he's on all fours now all he wants is a tail then moving to the tuning of the fiddle and the bow how sparkles every eye with mirth as round and round we go no ballroom artists now are here to circumscribe our sport and nature smiles approvingly for here she holds her court a lake romantic lying near tempts to its cooling veil and tiny boats in swift career across its bosom sail and waving handkerchiefs respond in answer to the song that rising from the venturers is borne the breeze along jump into the boat paddy not the least danger in the world of it tipping over oh my i've got my shoe all satiated with water i shall get my death a cold you've got your foot in it this time that's a fact mr blisby is there any danger of seasickness now just say that boat how she scoots it i vow if paddy sprague hadn't got a hold of bow oar and pulls away like a little satan if i thought that spindle shank from the city was going to have that gal i cut his eternal acquaintance i would i even most said throat but that would be manslaughter and i don't see how it could be now that for killing such a thing as he is a voice some love to roam over the dark sea's foam where the shrill winds whistle free well they do hi look here's jim sly what have you got in that bottle old fellow haven't seen you to-day afore jim sly drunk i've got some cough drops to cure the sea-sickness with a little rum tea with some spirit in it to keep it sally twist his sweetheart you jim sly you drunken miserable fellow you you sot you brute you individual you 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 jim sly jim go it sal and i'll hold your bonnet what you're going to do about it sally you'll see when we get home you sot you brute you vagabond sam let her lean elder wine cures the gout boys the colic in the seasickness who cares for sal can you tell me jemima why miss pigeon yonder is like forty-nine big apples no i'm sure i can't unless it's cause she's sour no tain't it it's cause she's a virgin nigh fifty but gracious what an awful cloud has risen in the west and what a frightful lightning flash then swept across its breast i feel a drop upon my hand the pine trees rock and roar the waves like blacks with nightcaps on rush madly to the shore oh what shall we do where shall we go what will become of us screams everybody do dear mr wiggin says miss pigeon tell us what we shall do mr wiggin why tain't no use to runs i see for the rain is here and there ain't a house within a mile and my opinion is, is that we get in the woods and make ourselves comfortable but don't the lightning always strike trees but there's more danger from your eyes jemima lightning's attracted by anything bright you better shut em up jemima your wit isn't bright enough to attract it any more mr impudence how does that strike ye old mrs fogg oh that folks should joke and trifle so when there's so much to make em solemn ain't you afraid the thunder'll kill you and where would you go if you died laughing the rain pours down in torrent force among the forest shades and timid men the closer cling to timid shrinking maids the whitened cheek and blanching eye denote the force of fear and many a head bows low with dread the thunder loud to hear well this is a comfort see where miss primrose is cornered old brindle cheek by jowl 
that's right. Go it, old gal. My eyes, how it rains. If Pan is the presiding genius of these woods, in my opinion, he's a dripping Pan. Oh, Brindle, young man, I'm a justice of the peace in this ear jurisdiction, and if you commit that again, I shall commit you for contempt of court. Here comes Jim Sly through the wet, pitching like a mackerel catcher in a chop sea. Hello, Jim. Where's Polly, like a widowed hen refusing to be comforted? Jim sobered. Sally, will you forgive me? Sally, no, you disreputable individual, to think that you should go away and, and leave me to... <laughs> Jim, th there, don't cry, and I'll go and take the total pledge, main liquor law and all, and become a useful membrane of society, and if I drink any more, I hope I may never starve. See, Mr. Blisby, while we are soaking, how the horses outside are smoking. Mr. Blisby, do horses in the country smoke? Yes, and we've got a filly at home who throws all our chews tobacco. You don't say so. Thus, while the rain is pouring so, fun may mingle with our fear, and while the wind is roaring so, still many waken words of cheer. The rain clears up, the burnished sun comes out with scorching ray, dispelling from the sky and heart all shapes of gloom away, and laughter now bursts forth once more in cheerful merry peal, and home again is sung with glee as o'er the road we wheel. Are you comfortable? Sit close as possible. Here we go. And now on the road for home, let us be merry as we can be. Miss Pigeon, did you enjoy your duck? You are a goose, sir, to talk so. Miss Primrose, you look refreshed since you're sprinkling from nature's water pot. Mr. Blisby, this is fine, a subject for a letter, Mr. Blisby. Jemima, my dear, you look as blooming as a rose in June and twice as sweet. There's the Bottleton factory rising above the trees, and the old vane, little vanity, pluming itself in the sunshine. Hurrah for home! Old lady with the mob cap, take your head indoors. Urchins and corduroys, scatter! Young maiden with the milking pail, who are you looking at? Mr. Blisby rising. Before we part, I should like to say that the pleasure I've experienced has far exceeded my expectations, and that I shall always entertain a pleasing recollection of the delightful moments spent in this, in this hay cart. Three cheers for Blisby, ladies and gentlemen, if it is your opinion that we have enjoyed ourselves a great way over the sinister, you will please to manifest it. Yes, then we'll adjourn with the chorus. Some seek for glee by the heaving sea, some rush on a railroad train, but give us a part on a country cart and a picnic out in the rain. Excellent Omnibus An excellent test of affection. The summer is no more to try the strength of affection, said Miss Partington. Though it's pretty well to sing love songs beneath a window at midnight and rainstorm and stand billing and cooling on the doorstep till two o'clock in the morning. The winter season is the one. Many's the time my poor pa had rid five miles to see me in the coldest weather and often the dear creature had been found in the morning fast asleep in the middle of the cow yard with a saddle on his shoulders for fatigue with courting me and riding a hard trotting horse. That was devotion. I never seen a cow without thinking of poor pa and saying which the good old lady went to bed. High Dutch versus Politeness Has the Washington Street train going by here? asked Mrs. Partington of a gentleman with a huge mustache who stood picking his teeth on the steps of the Revere House. The old lady met the Washington Street omnibus that runs between the Lowell Depot and Dover Street. The gentleman still picked his teeth and looked gravely at her but said not a word. Has the Washington Street train passed by here? She asked again, thinking the gentleman hadn't heard her. He still stood and stood still and looked and picked, but said nothing. Well, said the old dame, half musing and half addressing the man with the mustache. It was only a civil question, and I didn't think there was anything harmonious in asking it, but some people think it's a great hardship to do anyone a favor. It wouldn't have required much effort. I should think to have answered me, nor took a great deal of Amber's time, nor interfered with anybody's occupancy. If anybody has got focal organs, I should think they might use them. Nine first done, responded the man with a moustache as he put his hands beneath his coat-tails and walked up the steps, leaving Mrs. Partington standing like a note of interrogation at the end of her speech, while the omnibus, which had passed while she was speaking, was seen far in the distance. Good taste. I can't bear children, said Miss Prim disdainfully. 
Mrs. Partington looked at her over her spectacles mildly before she replied. "'Perhaps, if you could, you would like them better,' she said at last. "'But why is it that unmarried old maids and single bachelors are always railing at children? It seems as if they have never read the command given to our forefathers to increase and multiply and punish the earth. For my part, I love the little dears, and I have rather hear a child cry any day than hear the brass band.' And she went right to work covering a ball for Ike. Old Roger, much excited. "'Mrs. Thames,' said old Roger one morning to his landlady at the breakfast table. He was an old bachelor, was Roger, and as such was an object of considerable interest both with the landlady and three antiquated spinsters who boarded with her. "'Mrs. Thames, what sort of house do you keep? What sort of neighborhood is this that you live in? And why is it that you have such a bad character round town, ma'am?' The landlady was astonished, and well she might be, for he looked excited, incensed. "'I've boarded here, ma'am,' continued he, "'just seven weeks, and every week we have had a track left here, and every track is against some cardinal sin, ma'am, that you, nor me, nor the young ladies here, I hope, ever committed. Here's drunkenness, and gambling, and swearing, and lying, and stealing, and adultery, and bearing foul witness.' Almost all the sins in the church calendar, ma'am, and what'll come next I can't guess. I can't stand it, ma'am. Why, the devil himself can't stand it. And his brow looked hot and steamy, and he bore the look of a man injured by an implied reflection on heretofore bright reputation. Rare done. One morning, old Sledge got capsized out of his weary halibut and all at the spring market in P. Blank under the old dynastiness of that institution, and was nearly drowned when they got him out. He was so near death that the ones who caught him couldn't see any signs of life in him, but they rolled him over and rubbed him and shook him and sent off among the neighbors for warm blankets to put him in. Old Mrs. Twist, who lived on Church Hill, in the kindness of her heart, stripped her beds at once and left her work all hanging, as she said, by sixes and sevens to go and help bring the man to she warmed the blankets and rubbed away vigorously at the inanimate sledge working as if her heart was in the operation as undoubtedly it was after a while the rubbing took effect or as some suggested his ugly nature refused to die and he revived slowly slowly first a gape and then a groan then he opened his eyes and the first person he looked upon was mrs twist busily engaged in her benevolent manipulations he looked at her a moment and consciousness returned Ah said he as he spit the salt water out of his cod-like mouth. "'Glad to see you've been looking out on you for a long time. Would like to have ye pay me the two shillings you owe me.' Mrs. Twist assured us it was the most unthankfulest thing she ever heard of, and we think so too. The Bearskins "'Here comes the Sogers, aunt!' cried Ike at the door. "'Here they come in the Bearskins!' "'In the Bearskins?' said Mrs. Partington, glancing out of the window into the cold towards the weathercock that had looked obstinately east for three days, much to the danger of a return of her rheumatism that an east wind always induced, so much so that she had declared her determination to move in the vicinity of some Catholic church, whose vein always points one way. "'In their bare skin such as a day as this, Highlanders, I guess.' She hastened to the door, and a company with huge and hideous caps were then marching by. She saw that she was sold. Ah, said she, this is one of the oars of roar. To go looking so, and suppose one of them poor creatures should fall down. He said, top heavy, his heels would go up in the air like a cornstalk witch, and all his brains would run down into his head. I can't bear to look at him. She closed the door carefully, but she stood in the entry and beat time to the music till it had gone far past the house. Awful Dewey. Old Roger stood looking from the window out upon the solitary tiger lily, the only one that could be coaxed to grow for the summer, and the meager atmosphere of the boarding house yard. The sickly lily held its head up stoutly beneath the refreshing dew that had fallen upon it during the night, and the shed top and the ashes barrel in the yard, and the few blades of grass that sturdily struggled against difficulty and managed to grow in spite of circumstances were all wet. Old Roger turned around, and all knew by his looks that something was coming and were prepared for it. Why, said he in a cheerful tone, was this last night that has just passed like a certain very eminent clergyman? All guessed it at once, except the deaf milliner, who hadn't heard a word of it, but they didn't say so and gave it up. It is because it is awfully dewy. What a laugh greeted the answer, in the midst of which the jolly old brick put on his hat and went off like a rocket in a blaze of glory. 
a slight misapprehension. How do you like the bustle and confusion of Boston? asked the shopkeeper as Mrs. Partington stood by the counter. It gives me confusion to Sam, said the old lady. Folks didn't do so when I was a girl, and besides, what an awful sight a bran and cotton it takes to say nothing of their awkwardness when they get slipped up on one side. I mean, broke in the shopkeeper, the bustle and confusion of the streets. Oh, said Mrs. P., that is quite another thing, and immediately left the store. The steak was terrible tough one morning, and old Roger worked away at it in silence. At length his patience and masticators gave out, and turning to the landlady, Madam, said he, your boarders should all have been umpires at horse races. Why so? said she, coloring highly, because being accustomed to tender steaks, they would have none of the difficulty that I experienced. They could obviate it. It was an unpardonable thing in him thus to expose her before all the boarders, and she thought the outrage more than offset the tough meat. End of section 14. Section 15 of A Remembered Mistake It is all very true, Mr. Knickerbottom, said Mrs. Partington, as she read in the Knickerbocker something concerning brevity and simplicity of expression. It's true, as you say, and how many mistakes there does happen when folks don't understand each other. Why, last summer I told a dressmaker to make me a long visit to wear, and would you believe it? She came and stayed a fortnight with me. Since then I've made it a pint, always to speak just what I say. Her mouth grew down to a determined pucker at the end of the sentence, and the snuff-box was tapped energetically, as if the fortnight of unrequited bread and butter was laying heavy on her memory. Faith is a great thing, and confidence in the cook, and the trust that what you have before you is the true representative of the name it bears, said old Roger, in his lecture over the bread pudding, and he peered intently into his plate as at some mysterious thing which had there arisen to perplex him. But, he continued, can I be expected to swallow everything, always in blind credulity, or go so far as to construe pork skins and cheese rinds to mean bread crumbs? And he gently pushed his plate away and took a piece of the pie. Mrs. Partington and Jenny Lind I never liked the Sweden virgins, said Mrs. Partington. She was orthodox, and always sat in the asylum pew in the northeast corner of the gallery, and had charge of the children in sermon time. Her raised finger was an admonition that brought young refractories to their obedience at once. Every Sunday was she there, and people expected to see the faded black bonnet above the railings in prayer time as much as they did the parson. I never liked the Sweden virgins, but I ain't one that believes nothing good can come out of Lazarus for all that. Now there's Jenny Lind. May heaven shower bags of dollars on her head that is so very good to everybody, and who sings so sweet that everybody's fallen in love with her, tipsy-turvy, and gives away so much to poor indigent people. They call her an angel, and who knows? But she may be a syrup in disguise, for the papers say her singing is like the music of the spears. How I should love to hear her! She grasps hastily at the long bead purse in her reticule, but an unsatisfactory response came back from it to her hopes, and she laid it back again with a sigh. The Use of the Aztecs we are fearfully and wonderfully made, said Mrs. Partington, after she had stood for a long time contemplating the Aztec children. Her hands were resting upon the back of a chair as she said this, and she made the remark so loud that a tall gentleman who stood near her stooped down to get a look under her black bonnet. He thought she had spoken to him. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, continued she especially some of us. The ways of providence is past finding out, and we don't know what these haystack children are made for, 
no more'n we do why the mermaids were made or the man in the moon perhaps they are made a purpose for curiosities and nothing but providence could make anything more so unless mr barnum should try human nature never come down up in so queer a wrapper before they say they are distended from the haystacks long ago gone to grass and isaac said she turning to ike who was teasing one of them with a stick isaac look upon em and pray you may never be born so the people had gathered around and were listening to the words as they fell like the notes of a hand organ from her lips and when she ceased they turned with renewed eagerness to inspect the objects that her remarks had rendered classic the mystery of the brazen nose or the maiden's revenge chapter one the hero of the story night closed around the field at agincourt sir hildebrand helly to split who had been watching its approach for an hour from a neighboring hill with a spy-glass turned his horse's head towards his quarters with a sad heart for the day had been destructive to horse-flesh and thousands of the french and norman chivalry bit the mud not dust of agincourt he sought his tent his brow was dark and gloomy as could be plainly seen through his iron helmet and an unevenness of gait as he strode along betrayed great agitation of the nervous system walter de courcy stubbs said he hoarsely to his squire in attendance hang up my horse and give my cask some oats and water and hark ye disturb me not until the connecticut wooden horologue in the vestibule striketh the hour of seving now away sir hildebrand helly to split slowly divested himself of his armour which clanged upon the stillness of the night like a tin kitchen and then taking a match from his vest pocket he lighted a three-cent regalia and puffed away at it in moody silence he stretched himself upon three chairs with a bundle of old newspapers under his head and dropped asleep and then caught a nap but his sleep was troubled anon he started and shouted st dennis for france give him fits again a clammy sweat covered his brow and he muttered ha thrice to-day hath the brazen nose gleamed upon me in the battlefield down old copperhead down but soon his slumbers grew calm and not a sound disturbed the silence save the man-at-arms who sat wetting his jackknife on a brick in the entry and indulging in whistling some old familiar psalm tunes as if his mind were elsewhere for that man-at-arms had a heart he had chapter two the brazen nose it was midnight within about ten minutes and sir hildebrand helly to split still slept at this moment a slight noise was heard at the door and bearing in his hand a tin lantern a knight of gigantic size some five feet six in height in complete armor strode into the tent he gazed intently upon the sleeper and then in a suppressed voice of great anguish sighed out ah oh um and sank into a seat like a cooking stove his face could not be seen but there was a dignity about the strange knight that betokened a genteel bringing up which had won the respect of the man-at-arms who had been bribed by a ninepence to admit him to the tent on the plea of special business his armour was of complete black with no distinguishing mark save a huge nose of brass borne upon the cask which gleamed in the light of the lantern like a quart pot taking a pencil from one pocket and a card from another he wrote a few hurried lines when whispering to the man at arms for an envelope and a wafer he sealed the missive and deposited it by the side of the sleeping sir hildebrand 
saying to the admiring attendant no trouble sirib about mailing letters here we can mail them with our own mailed hands eh it were better he had not uttered this for the man who hoped for further largesse laughed loudly at the pleasantry the light in the lantern disappeared as sir hildebrand helidisplit awoke and starting upon his elbow he cried aloud what ho without there what in thunder's all that noise about the men-at-arms and squires came rushing in rubbing their eyes none had heard the noise and at the suggestion of walter de courcy stubbs that he had been awakened by his own snoring sir hildebrand turned over and went to sleep again keep shady was the parting word of the stranger knight as he placed a quarter in the hand of walter and strode forth from the tent mystery crowned the hour chapter three the game is up scarcely had the wooden clock done striking the hour of seven the next morning when walter de courcy stubbs stood by his master's side to awaken him from his slumbers which he accomplished by pulling one of the chairs from beneath him sir hildebrand held it to split wiped his eyes with his hand and combed his hair with his fingers and then as was his wont commenced pummeling his attendant by way of gentle exercise after which he proceeded to dress himself in a panoply of war stooping to pick up one of the stovepipes that encased his legs sir hildebrand espied the letter left by the stranger lying upon the ground he gazed upon the writing and a mortal paleness covered his face his limbs trembled in every joint and rivet and his teeth which were not metallic shook like a set of props he read perfidious wretch your hour is come meet me to-morrow outside the english lines and i'll give you jesse yours respectively nosey sir hildebrand helly to split drank his coffee in silence after which arming himself with two spears a battle axe a sword mace and shield besides filling his belt with bowie knives revolvers and slung shot he walked forth into the fields in the rear of the english camp where he soon discovered the knight of the brazen nose sitting on a rock reading a newspaper who sprang to his feet and pulled out his sword the contest was speedily begun and quicker ended for sir hildebrand had too many irons in the fire and he couldn't come in well one blow from the powerful arm of him of the nose and the head of sir hildebrand helly to split like an iron pot rolled at the feet of the victor uttering a fearful cry of agony at this consummation the strange knight tore off his helmet revealing beneath a head of hair like a pound of flax the fair but hard countenance of judy o'brien the washerwoman gentlemen said she he was a perjured man and i have avenged myself upon him he owed me a bill for washing but alas in wiping out that score i flummoxed myself tell this to my country women never seek for vengeance tis better to forgive a little if they lose a shilling on the pound farewell saying which she disappeared up a tall tree that was near by and they never saw her more coroner de smythe under the circumstances did not think it advisable to summon a jury and informed sir hildebrand's friends by telegraph that they had better come on and look after his effects as he wasn't exactly in a condition to do it for himself a flemish jew bought sir hildebrand helly to split's wardrobe after a few keepsakes had been taken by friends for about the price of an old iron going to california dear me exclaimed mrs partington sorrowfully how much a man will bear and how far he will go to get the soldered dross as parson martin called it when he refused the beggar a sixpence for fear it might lead him into extravagance everybody is going to california and chagrin arter gold cousin jones and the three smiths have gone 
and mr chip the carpenter has left his wife and seven children and a blessed old mother-in-law to seek his fortune too this is the strangest yet and i don't see how he could have done it it looks so ungrateful to treat heaven's blessings so lightly but there we are told that the love of money is the root of all evil and how true it is for they are now rooting arter it like pigs arter ground nuts why it is a perfect money mania among everybody and she shook her head doubtingly as she pensively watched a small mug of cider with an apple in it simmering by the winter fire she was somewhat fond of drink made in this way a tough customer will you help me to a piece of chicken asked miss seraphina of old roger on thanksgiving day the old man was engaged elbow deep in the intricate task of carving the perspiration stood upon his brow from his exertions truly herculean efforts in dissecting a large fowl chicken muttered he do you call this a chicken why it has been the father of thousands miss he hadn't a very thankful spirit that day and the older boarders with bad teeth joined with him in questioning the propriety of being thankful old roger's boarding-house having failed and the furniture being taken to be sold on mean process as he called it he asked one of the chambermaids who always had been saucy to him if she was to be sold with the rest of the furniture she answered him no as sharp as vinegar oh said he coolly buttoning up his coat i supposed you were for the advertisement reads that the house is to be sold with all the impertinences thereto belonging he very cruelly laughed at the indignant look she gave him and stepped out funeral obstacles how solemn these funeral obstacles is said mrs partington as she looked down from an upper chamber window on the day of a mock funeral of one of the presidents she took off her specs to wipe the moisture from their discs tapped her box mournfully to the measured time of the distant drum and looked anxiously down the street to catch the first glimpse of the funeral train here it comes at last quoth she with the soldiers all playing with muzzled drums and their flags flying at half-mast is that the catastrophe whispered she to a gentleman near her that is a catafalque madam replied he well well said she no matter i know there was a cat about it and i didn't know but it might be a cataplasm will you tell me when the artillery flies over that come on here to tend the funeral good gracious madam cried he testily they don't fly they are artillerymen on horseback merely dear me replied she i thought it was one of the wings of the army and flew how easy it is to get mistaken she pensively gazed upon the pageant that slowly passed before her what a pity it is said she that we don't valley people till arter they are dead but then what paragories we pour on them she here paused a silence pervaded the chamber the procession had passed the company had departed and two hours after the old lady was found still sitting by the open window fast asleep so powerful is grief excellent advice never get in debt isaac said mrs partington as she raised her teaspoon with an oracular air and held it thus as if from it were suspended the threads of a fine argument on economy discernible to her eye alone and she was watching an opportunity to make it tangible never get in debt no matter whether you are creditable or not it is better to live on a crust of bread and water and a herring or two than cows and oxen cut up into rump steaks and owe for it think of our neighbor what a failing he had 
and had all his goods and impertinences took away on a mean procession and sold and his poor wife reduced to a calico gown starvation and shushan tea and he in california some tea please said ike as he handed over his tin dipper the tea like her own reflections trickled out musically and she passed along the caution with the cream and sugar never to get in debt timely reflection dear me exclaimed mrs partington and her hands were raised above a basket of potatoes in a provision store as if she were asking a blessing upon it it was in response to the shopkeeper who had told her in sepulchral tones that the potatoes were all rotting oh dear me said she if the potatoes is all rotting what on earth will poor people do for bread what will the poor patagonians do that don't eat nothing else and flour is very high too they tell us every now and then of an improvement in the market but flour is always just as dear after it and we have to pay full as much for half a dollar's worth it takes almost a remissness of californy gold every week to get along nowadays heaven help the poor what a heartiness there was in that simple prayer the provision dealer was affected he dropped the long red he had been holding pensively into the basket again and wiped his eyes on the sleeve of his white frock that stern man who had unrelentingly cut up tons of beef nor shed one tear over the struggles of expiring lambkins showing no quarter while quartering them that stern man wiped his eyes on his frock sleeve and murmured yes'm it was touching everything was sixteen ounces to the pound with him for that day preparing to see the president mother wants to know if you'll lend her a little molasses to start a cap to go and see the president said a little girl coming into mrs partington's kitchen bearing in her hand a tin cup certainly dear said the good dame pleasantly she never thought of the unreasonableness of the request she never dreamed of guile the treacle depository was brought out the golden liquid filled the tin receptacle and the child departed well said the old lady everybody's going to see the president but what is a president or a king or a justice of the peace but a man arter all with flesh and blood and bones and hair like any of us and thousands will come further to see him than they would to see st paul or hebrews or revelations or any of them sich man worship sich man worship the president's coming aunt said ike bursting in and he's going by our door and the little fellow was half crazy with delight and threw his cap in a pan of milk upon the table in his enthusiasm how do i look isaac said the dame with animation is my hair combed and my handkerchief digested right on my neck and my cap border even and she took her place by the window when these questions were answered as eager as any one to see the president and ike stepped out but her eyes were strangely dim and those hitherto faithful specks gave indications now of failing her she took them off to wipe them and both glasses were gone an hour before ike had borrowed them for a telescopic experiment but it didn't make any odds for the procession had turned down another street and didn't go by her door at all a church incident the bell had tolled for some minutes after the time of meeting and some signs of impatience were manifest a stranger touching the occupant of a pew in front of him asked is your preacher often as late as this oh yes sir replied the interrogated 
it often happens that he don't get here till the sermon is half through the stranger looked at him intently a little while and then made a memorandum of this fact in his notebook a dry good lesson have you any stout dark marines said mrs partington to the shopkeeper he was one of those good-humoured young men whose hair nicely curled betokens an elegant taste and he stood swaying back and forth leaning on his yardstick and smiled amiably as the old lady spoke have you any dark marines suitable for thick ladies outside undergarments we have dark moreens ma'am replied he and cast his eyes towards a brother clerk and winked archly she gazed upon him a moment before she spoke again well well young man it was only a slip of the tongue and if you never make a greater slip in measuring cloth you will be much more honest than many clerks i know the clerk coloured and stammered out an apology but it was needless there was no unkindness in her looks the spectacles bent their bows upon him steadily from the cavernous gloom of the big bonnet but his perturbed fancy alone made them terrible she made the purchase she intended and in measure it proved full half a quarter over what she had bargained for a glance at poverty it must be very inconvenient to be poor said mrs partington as she glanced with honest pride at her high-backed chairs and old-fashioned chest of drawers and continued her eye onto the open cupboard in the corner how people can contrive to get along with so little i don't see there is our poor neighbour down the yard now is so pinched for room that she has to have a bed in the very room where she sleeps kind old lady her benevolence walked ahead of her grammar but a trifling error in speech is as pardonable in mrs partington as in henry clay slanderers if there is anybody under the canister of heaven that i have in utter excrescence said mrs partington it is a tale-bearer and slanderer going about like a vile boa constructor circulating his calomel about honest folks i always know one by his fizz mahogany it seems as if Belzebub had stamped him with his private signal, and everything he looks at appears to turn yaller. And having uttered this somewhat elaborate speech, she was seized with a fit of coughing, and took some demulcent drops. A stormy season. Cease, rude bolus, blustering railer, said Mrs. Partington, as she reached out into the storm to secure a refractory shutter and the wind rushed in and extinguished her light and slammed to the door and fanned the fire in the grate and rustled the calico flounce upon the quilt and peeped into the closet and under the bed and contemptuously shook mrs partington's night jacket as it hung airing on the chair by the fire and flirted with her cap border as she looked out upon the night it was a saucy gust how it blows said she as she shut down the window i hope heaven will keep the poor sailors safe that go down on the sea in vessels this must be the obnoxious storm continued she when the sun crosses the penobscot she donned her specs and sat down to consult her almanac next to her bible in importance and she found she was right while the wind howled around the house most dismally and yelled wildly down the old chimney. End of section 15 Section 16 Dietetical Counsel You mustn't be too greedy, Isaac, said Mrs. Partington, as with an anxious expression she marked a strong effort that the young gentleman was making to achieve the last quarter of a mince pie. You shouldn't be so gluttonous, dear. You must be careful, or you will get something in your elementary canal or sarcophagus one of these days that will kill you, Isaac. She had been to hear a course of physiological lectures, 
and then you will have to be buried in the cold ground and nobody will never see you no more and what will i do isaac when you are cut down in your priming like a lovely jelly flower much affected by the picture her own prolific fancy had conjured up she pensively sweetened her tea for the fourth time and looked earnestly upon isaac who unheeding all she was saying sat gazing at the street door revolving in his mind the practicability of ringing the doorbell unperceived without going outside domestic peace can never be preserved in family jars mrs p confers with paul and do you believe in the spiritual knockings asked mrs partington as she leaned forward over the table and bent her eyes on a queer individual who had related some wonderful things he had seen oh i would so like to have poor paul come back a gentle rapping upon the old chest in the corner attracted their attention and the whole of them immediately surrounded it if it's paul's apprehension said mrs partington i know he'll answer me paul is that you just like him said she smiling when he was living he was always tapping when he had anything in the house to tap didn't you paul can't you speak to me does that mean yes or no what does it mean some of the party suggested that the alphabet be called which was done are you in want of anything said she what is it and the anxious spectators through the medium of the alphabet spelled out s i d u r it is paul cried the old lady delightedly that's the way he always spelled it do you want me to come to you paul the answer came back no i'm in better company the old lady turned away mournfully there was sorrow in the wavy lock of gray that struggled beneath her cap border there was a quaver of grief in the tone that inquired for the scissors there was a misty vapor upon her specks like the dew upon the leaves after a rain the cap border like a flag at half-mast trailed in woe over the ruin of disappointed affection at that instant the cover of the chest opened and the head of ike protruding disclosed the secret of the knockings ah you rogue said she a smile dispelling all evidence of disorder ah you rogue was it you you'll never be a good spirit as long as you live i'm afraid if you go on so but i knowed it wasn't paul there was triumph in her tone and it seemed as if a whole basket full of sunshine had been upset in that room it was so pleasant all the rest of the evening mrs partington at the play the playhouse is the way to the pit said mrs partington solemnly and pointing significantly downward but remonstrated a friend who had asked her to visit the museum with him there is no pit in this theatre and the way to the pit is removed she looked earnestly at him a moment and then said she would go the play was the stranger and she was much interested in it why don't he make it up with her she inquired what's the sense of being ugly when she's so contritious for what she had done i should like to know i think it shows a bad temper in him and the dear children too coming in like little cherubs to make him forget all old troubles and follies we hadn't ought to dwell so upon old grievousness because we are all liable craters how i do pity her and the old lady wept copiously she wouldn't leave the house till she ascertained from the policeman whether old tobias got back his son that had listed for he looked but feeble she said when he went away and the great grief and the long pole the old gentleman carried for a cane must have broken him down breaches of faith breaches of faith screamed mrs partington as she heard that term applied to mexican violations of an armistice well i wonder what they will have next 
I have hearn tell of cloaks of hypocrisy and robes of purity, but I never heard of breeches of faith before. I hope they're made of something that won't change and wear out, as old Deacon Gudgeon's faith did, for his was always changing. He went from believing that nobody would be saved to believing that all would be, and at last turned out a phrenologer and didn't believe in nothing. I wonder if it's as strong as Casimir. And she bit off her thread and prepared a new needleful. A Queer Conceit Why don't they make these tragedies turn out different? said Mrs. Partington after seeing Virginius performed. I think they might end them with a dance, and all that are killed should take part in it, just to show folks that they're alive. This now was too savage. And when Mr. Virginius got the other gentleman by the throat, I looked round for the police to see if he would part them, and there he was, enjoying it as well as the rest of them. I should like to know what he is there for, if it ain't to keep the peace. And the old lady was tucked up for the night. Mrs. Partington on cold porters. So they've took our minister and made a cold porter of him, said Mrs. Partington to her neighbor, Mrs. Sled. I suppose they're going to set him to carrying all the coal in the parish, and so take the bread out of the pockets of the foreigners and Irishmen, poor craters, that do it now. He preached last Sunday on mortifying the flesh, but when he gets to carrying the baskets, I think he will look like one mortified all over. She smiled at the conceit, and then turned to see what David said on the subject, and what analogy there was between hewing of wood and drawing of water, and coal-portering, but dropped the search on his summons to tea. No matter, said she, it won't hurt him any. And my dear Paul used to say that everything honest was honorable, and that black coat of his'n won't show the coal dust at all. Fourth of July Isaac, said Mrs. Partington, rapping on the window, as she saw the boy in the act of putting half a bunch of crackers into the pocket of a countryman who stood viewing the procession. The caution came too late, and the individual was astonished. Isaac had stepped inside the door to await the explosion, and the old lady met him in the entry. "'Oh, you spirit of mischief!' cried she. "'What will become of you if you go on in this way? Is this all your ideas of liberty and regeneration, that you must fill that poor man's pockets with your crackers?' Do you suppose this was all that the days of seven by six was made for? I should think you would be ashamed to look upon your Uncle Paul's picture there, and hide your face in conclusion, arter behaving so. Ah, she mused, how different boys are now from what they used to be, so wild, so rakeless, and tricky, crack. What's that? I should like to know who fired that. It was a great piece of impudence. Crack! Goodness gracious! Somebody must be throwing them into the windows. She ran to look out. Not a soul was near that could have done it. Crack! Another explosion at her feet, and she looked round. Isaac sat demurely, eating some gingerbread by the table, but said nothing. There was an expression about his mouth which looked torpedoish, and for a moment she mistrusted him but he couldn't have done it. He was so quiet, and she shut the window that opened upon the street to prevent their throwing in any more. Seeing the fireworks. Oh, dear, said Mrs. Partington, stretching herself on her toes to get a better look at the fireworks. I always wish I was seven foot tall at times like this. And I wish I was nine foot, said the little woman before her, spitefully. How I hate to see people so selfish, don't you, Mrs. Brown? whispered Mrs. Partington to her neighbor. There, there, they are touching off the volcano, I vow, said Mrs. P., 
now look and see if the burning lather runs down the hill this way and the old lady looked anxiously toward the park the telegraph mrs partington is much prejudiced against the magnetic telegraph and takes an entirely new ground in her opposition to it you may send your letters on it said she to the philosopher if you're a mind to but i shan't trust one of mine on it while people can cut it off before it gets there and let the whole world into family secrets and how presumptuous it is too for men to draw heaven's blessed lightning down and set it a-dancing on a tight wire like a very circuit rider it's absolute blasphemy and outrage on the highway and again all nater and scriptor and she turned to the books to find an appropriate text but changed the subject by commencing a discussion with her niece on the relative merits of ball yarn and skein and taking her sides she went on like a jolly old wheelbarrow let none be vain of imagined superiority over their brother men for whatever advantage may be fancied in one respect in another there may be a deficiency the man who has law and divinity at his fingers ends in the lore of horseflesh may be instructed by his stable boy and she who speaks italian and embroiders can perhaps take lessons in yarn stockings from mrs partington franklin who could draw the lightning from heaven made a poor hand at tending a baby a story for christmas it was with a clouded brow and an angry eye that young frank harlow stood looking upon his father's face and hearkening to his words as he violently rebuked him the flush upon the old man's cheek betokened the tempest that raged within his breast and his raised and clenched fist descended in fearful emphasis as he uttered the words obey me or by heaven you leave my house for ever mr harlow the father of frank was one of those unfortunate men whose impulses are stronger than their powers of resistance his passion once aroused reason affection common kindness were forgotten in the storm that held him in mastery the hasty and severe word that conveys such bitterness in its utterance in his moods of temper was always ready and the hasty blow fell upon his children with cruel violence at the least provocation correction they never received it was the vindictive visitation of an avenger of wrong rather than the chastisement of a parent at heart mr harlow was a kind man and oftentimes and bitterly when the storm had blown by and his mind was calm again did he repent with a sincere repentance of evil he had done of which he was fully sensible benevolent intelligent noble-spirited self-sacrificing as occasion called for action he had won himself a name for probity and usefulness that was enviable and but for the turbulence of temper above described few finer men could be found this weakness was his besetting sin his temptation and his will was insufficient to resist it frank harlow his youngest son and favorite was his counterpart in body and mind handsome intelligent and witty at seventeen he was the favorite of all in the village in which he lived his generosity was unbounded and the tendrils of his youthful nature shot forth and strengthened in the fertile soil of congeniality at social gatherings he was the crowning spirit his voice rang merriest at the harvest home his story elicited the warmest plaudits at the husking frolic and in the old woods his song echoed through its sombre arches with the joyousness of unrestricted freedom no jealous rivalry stood in the way of his supremacy young and old admitted his claim to the distinction and the smile of beauty and the rustic rose of rural artlessness beamed for him with constant and kindly glow such was frank harlow in his social intercourse petted and happy in the genial flow of his unembittered enjoyment but at home he was a different being the contrast between the sphere of home and that of neighborhood was too marked 
the reverence due parental authority was too little excited by parental love disobedience to imperious command was followed by violence of invective or blows and his high spirit revolted at the irksomeness of domestic oppression his two elder brothers had no sympathy with him they were plotting and matter-of-fact men taking from their mother a more passive and quiescent nature than his own they grubbed along the way of life like the oxen they drove they knew no joy beyond the herbage they cropped having no aspiration beyond the bound of their enclosure content with old routines no new hope obtruded upon their ruminations they frowned upon the bold boy whose spirit and brilliancy cast a reproach upon their lethargy and they rejoiced when the reproof came to curb his ambition home was no longer home to him the ties of consanguinity were to him iron bonds from whose release he would pray to be freed his mother's love alone sanctified the existence he led it was the one solitary star in his night of domestic gloom his affections thus turned from the home circle had concentrated upon one the fairest of the village but whose coquettish predilections had rendered her obnoxious to censure and her fame having reached his father the knowledge of frank's attachment for her had provoked a discussion the result of which was the imperative command with which my story commences a command that he must renounce her for ever the boy stood gazing upon his father with a flashing eye and a swelling breast as he spoke feelings too powerful for utterance were depicted in the look he gave and he left the room with an expression of bitter rage the next morning there was confusion in mr harlow's house frank had fled no one knew whither and the circle whose union was so illy cemented was broken a letter in the village post office explained the reason it read as follows dear mother it grieves me to bid you farewell but longer sufferance from father's tyrannical usage is impossible i go to seek my fortune and when we meet again may it be when he and i shall have learned a lesson from our separation and the alienation of father and child may be forgotten in the renewed intercourse of man and man farewell mother and may you be more happy than i should have been able to make you had i lived with you a thousand years farewell remember sometimes your poor boy frank the letter fell like a thunderbolt upon that household so unprepared for such an event and deep contrition wrung the erring father's heart who saw too late the evil he had wrought the spirited boy had been his favorite so like him was he in form and mind he remembered that no word spoken to him in kindness had been unheeded he heard his praise in every mouth admitted the justness of the meed that was awarded him and every word and every thought was a dagger to his soul in view of the ruin he had caused then for the first time he felt the weight of the responsibility that was rested upon him as a parent and trembled as he reflected how far he might be instrumental in his son's eternal doom too late came penitence for the past but he vowed reform for the future and prayed for strength to fulfil his vow a change came over the man and his home the mould of years and care mingled with the raven hues of youth for years had passed and no line of remembrance had come from the absent boy the brothers had married and had children and the old homestead was glad with the music of childish laughter and a sad happiness smiled upon the lives of mr and mrs harlow the mother had mourned for her child and his remembrance often came to her in the voices of her grandchildren and in the sweet reminiscences which solitude brought the hope of seeing him had long died out in her breast for twelve weary years had elapsed since he went away the village had changed the young and joyous companions of frank had turned into grave family men or had moved to strange cities and become the devotees 
of the money god or worshipped fame in high places the maids with whom he had sported had lost their smiles in the matronly cares of life or had transferred them to their children upon whom they bloomed again the coquette of frank's idolatry had years before given place to younger rivals and mourned her faded charms in singleness of state the village had become populous and new steeples gleamed above the trees in the sunlight and new streets and houses marked the steps of progress a railroad whistle greeted the morning sun instead of the song of birds as of old and the quiet of village life had been usurped by the confusion of city habits frank was forgotten in the march of present excitement or only remembered as a pleasant dream it was christmas night in the year of grace fifty and a pleasant party had met in the house of mr harlow to celebrate the birthday anniversary of his eldest grandson the wind howled around the old mansion house and growled down the spacious chimney as if threatening the elements of geniality that reigned below with a submerging visit the snow rattled against the windows red with indoor light and piled itself in little heaps upon the sills but all was unheeded by the party within and the wind and snow were unheard amid the music of mirth the song was trilled from pretty lips and manly voices joined in a chorus of praise to the festive season when a loud knock of the ancient brazen lion upon the door arrested every attention the sound reverberated along the old entry and up the broad stairway and through the large and airy rooms with remarkable freedom for such an intruder at such a time the timid shrunk at the sound as from a boding of evil and anxiety marked every face the door was opened and a female form was ushered in in whose scant and ragged habiliments poverty was but too plainly read and in the bronzed and wrinkled face revealed by the removal of a red hood were seen the traces of want and exposure her keen black eye as she entered surveyed the scene and her bronzed complexion glowed ruddily in the firelight good people she said in a cracked and tuneless voice that made the flesh of her hearers creep at its sound i am weary and hungry give me of your bounty in the name of him who upon this day took upon himself the condition of man i am weary i am hungry an appeal thus made could not be resisted and the best the house afforded was provided for the poor stranger the ferocity with which she ate attracted the attention of the circle fully attesting her famished condition and a glance at her apparel confirmed the impression of want and distress and mercy conquered the disgust which her presence had at first occasioned her feet protruded through her travel-worn shoes and the snow melted from their soles and ran down upon the sanded floor as soon as her hunger was appeased she turned to depart but the voice of mr harlow asked her to remain and in sympathetic tones reminded her of the inclemency of the night the woman expressed her thanks gracefully and seated herself by the fireside the sport went on noisily and happily when it became whispered that the old dame was one of those weird people who tell fortunes by the stars or more ignoble means and open to view the destinies of men that lay concealed in the future can you tell fortunes good woman asked one of the youngest and boldest i have travelled far replied the belle dame and i have learned strange things in my wanderings the heavens are open to my gaze and the stars where the mysteries of fate are hid are as the printed page the human palm is to me a key to character who will test my power one by one did the company pass before her and the prescience she displayed was most marvellous the lines of the hand seemed pregnant with meaning 
and the past life of each individual was read with an accuracy that gave importance to her predictions for the future scenes were recalled to many that had long been forgotten loves that had been disappointed hopes that had been destroyed prospects that had been blasted and many a tear was shed at the recollection of some old grief revealed by the power of that singular woman at length mr harlow presented his hand for examination gazing upon it a moment intently with a voice choked by emotion she said here is violence and strife the line of life is crossed by threads of bitterness and woe and the whole of its deep course is marked by traces of grief tears tears are here and the lines of penitence and anguish of soul are strangely interwoven with the strong lines of resolution i see that a deep sorrow is yours the result of fierce passion repented of and subdued is it not so she fixed her eyes suddenly upon mr harlow's face it was pallid as death and the tears stood in his eye yes answered he and trembled as he spoke god knows my sin and god knows my repentance secret tears have been my portion for years and oh what would i not give if the memory of my wrong might be wiped away he bowed his head upon his hands and sobbed in the anguish of his spirit and mrs harlow wept in sympathy with her husband whose deep grief she had thus discovered which had long been concealed beneath the calm exterior of philosophical resignation woman he cried at last what is the future of this picture is there no balm in store for my wounded spirit he grasped her hand forcibly as if he would have wrung from it an answer to his question yes said she with deep emotion there is a future of peace and happiness in store for you and the sun of your declining years shall be radiant with supreme splendour and thank god who has given me power to verify my prophecy father mother behold your son he threw off his ragged habiliments as he spoke removed the grey and matted hair from his brow and the patches from his cheeks and stood before the company in the noble form matured in manly strength and beauty of frank harlow there was a new joy in the house that night at the wanderer's return and tears and smiles mingled at the recital of his story the wide world he had travelled and he had learned and profited by the lessons it had taught him he had returned home rich in gold but he was richer in the spirit he had gained it had become softened by the trials it had suffered until it had brought him back to his father's house and to his mother's feet his letters home had failed to reach their destination and deeming himself an outcast he had at length refused to write at all he had married a lady of wealth and had become a denizen of a faraway city but the thoughts of home pressed upon him and the smile of his mother haunted his sleep with fond persistence and he longed to see once more the old familiar faces that were his companions in childhood he had thus come back to revisit the home of his early life stopping at the hotel he had made such inquiries concerning his old friends as led him into the secret of their past lives then assuming his disguise he went to his father's house in the manner above stated the secret of his soothsaying ability was thus revealed the whole of christmas night was occupied with the story of frank's adventures and in thanksgivings for the reunion the next summer a splendid mansion graced the hill opposite the old homestead which soon became and is now the residence of frank harlow esq who retired from business has here settled down to enjoy himself amid the never forgotten scenes of his boyhood and to endeavor to make up by attention to his parents for the long years he had failed in his duty to them mr harlow is a happy old man 
and instills it as a sacred lesson into the minds of his grandchildren to beware of cultivating a hasty temper which had been so full of misery to himself mrs p among the animals you call this a carry van don't you said mrs partington at the menagerie maybe it is but i should like to know where the silks and other costive things are that we read of which the carry vans carry over the deserts of sarah in the eastern country the elephant has them in his trunk marm replied the keeper then that is the reason i suppose why he always carries it before him so he can have an eye on it but what is this animal with a large wart on his nose that is a new marm mercy on me exclaimed mrs p this must be one of them foreign news that the steamer brings over they feed em i dare say on potatoes and vegetables and that is why breadstuffs and flour are so awful dear most always after they arrive and the old lady left soon after full of new light and admiration for the monkeys End of section 16. Section 17. Peaceful Cogitations. When will distension and strife cease among our foreign relations? said Mrs. Partington with a sigh, as she looked abstractly at the black profile on the wall, as if she thought it could answer the question. When will distension cease? The Peace Congress didn't do no goods, I see, for the Russians and ostriches are a carrying on just as bad as ever they did, committing all sorts of outrages and wrongs on the hungry. Heaven never smiles on them that distresses the poor. We ought to hold the Russians and all that belongs to em in excrescence. I don't know about hating the Russians selves, though, because they hain't done us no harm, and the ostriches too that lives on nails and gimblets that the wild beast man told us about the unnatural heathen then the frenchmen are all in a commotion and i should think they would be eating frogs and sich things and the english ministers are quarrelling like dogs delight where it will end i can't see she laid down the times as she said i can't see and Ike, who had been burning off the outside pages of Levitt's Almanac while she was speaking, here poked the light out, leaving the room and the subject equally in the dark. Home Missions So Mrs. Brattle has become a member of the Home Missions, said Mrs. Partington. Well, I am rejoiced to hear it, for her poor husband's sake for though i think it is a husband's duty to help about the house some he shouldn't be left to wash and cook for himself and children and mend his own clothes as poor battle has had to while she was running around i hope the home missions will keep her at home now and the old lady stirred her souchong with animation and she made the comment and didn't see that ike was making tremendous havoc with the pound cake it is astonishing what opposite effects will be produced by the same cause as for instance suppose a blacking whose principal component is alcohol its effect when applied to boots is apparent in the cracking of the leather and in the opening of fissures admitting the free passage of water when applied to man in quantity the same fluid has the effect of making him tight old roger and the boarders old roger attempted the following upon the boarders one morning they were all sitting quietly at breakfast when with a most provoking smile around the corners of his mouth as if he himself fully appreciated what he was going to say he asked if any of them could tell him why a man deeply impressed with reverence was like a very hungry one the idea of hunger associated with the bountiful board at which they were seated caused the blood to rush through every vein of the landlady's body to her face for she felt hurt the boarders all said they didn't know 
they couldn't see the least resemblance why said he chuckling it is because he inwardly feels a gnaw they couldn't understand what he meant an awe and he said it was no use talking to men whose stomachs were full of the bounties of life this he said to propitiate the landlady who was all smiles again as bright and sparkling as the coffee in his cup which catching the rays of the sun danced and shimmered on the wall overhead bad tempers how these shopkeepers will fib it said mrs partington with an expression of pain on her venerable features that young man i bought these needles of said they were good-tempered only see how spitefully this one has macerated my finger she held up the wounded member a small red spot denoting the injury the sewing circle sympathized with her it will feel better i dare say after it has done aching continued she as she took the last stitch in the thick little boy's jacket and rolled up her work for the day many a pair of raised trousers has the world seen added to its wealth and the world never knew where they came from perhaps didn't care giving thanks may the lord make us thankful for the critter comforts spread out before us said deacon hayes over the hard-boiled beef on the table well perhaps he will says mrs partington to herself but it seems to me it would be easier to be thankful if the meat was tenderer and then like a barefooted boy she went cautiously among the mussels a good deal of truth poor girl's fair said mrs partington as she spelled out the inscription upon a flag that swung across washington street her eyes dimming with the vapors that arose from her warm heart poor girl's fair indeed they do and fair hard too god help em many of em fair hard with them that should treat em better trying to rise till all their risable powers is gone and they are shipwrecked and cast away and driv to making trousers and shirts for a living and die on it i do pity em a melancholy tone pervaded her speech and thoughts the rest of the day her snuff the choicest macaboy bore a taint of wormwood and rue her tea was salt as if tears were an ingredient in its composition her specks revealed red eyes in every visitor and the faces of the poor girls looked out at her from the teapot and the sugar bowl the lamp and the little scrap box on the work table bless her kind heart there is a wide difference between the throes of an expiring titan and the throes of a straggling tight un political extravagance rebuked i don't blame people for complaining about the extravagance and costiveness of government said mrs partington as she was reading an ardent appeal to the people in a political newspaper she always took an interest in politics after paul was defeated one year as a candidate for inspector i don't blame em a mite here they are now going to canvassing the state as if the earth wasn't good enough for em to walk on i wonder why they don't get isle cloth or kid minister and done with it and i heard yesterday said ike putting his small oar in that some of em was going to scour the country to get voters well continued she that would be better than throwing dust in the people's eyes as they say some of them do canvassing the state indeed she fell into an abstraction on the schemes of politicians and took seven pinches of snuff in rapid succession to aid her deliberations sleigh riding as the last paving stone hides itself beneath the descending snow the jingle of the bells informs us that sleighings come and from that minute riding on runners becomes a mania every young head and some pretty old heads are full of expedients for fun boys hunt up their sleds and dash out of doors to the terror of nervous mamas who prophesy disaster dire for their progeny the old sleighs and new sleighs 
the big sleighs and little sleighs are put in requisition and the streets are full of the music of the bells 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 all the day long their silvery notes are sounding in our ears and later nights state citizens who are staying at home are disturbed by the frantic yells of returning sleigh parties mingling with the noise of bells making the hour hideous or the sound of voices and cheerful song making melody with the tintinabulous accompaniment we like to hear this last we gladly listen to its approach as we snuggle beneath the blankets in the watches of the night and distinguish the chord of male and female voices in some familiar strain and are almost sorry to hear it melt away upon the midnight air in distance like voices heard in dreams there used to be great sport to us in sleighing, though we were never sanguinary. But time has tempered us by matters of graver import. We can indulge now in little beside our daily omnibus rides, and can hardly realize in these the buoyancy of old enthusiasm. We watch for the appearance of our domicile, coming to meet us, and pull the check string at our door, careful not to go a step beyond so little do we feel now about riding but in the old time gee who how our heart leaped to the music of the bells how quickly our pulse throbbed to the maddening impulse of the moment as we quiet and sedate though we now are flew over the slippery road hiya 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 how we dashed on our course leaving house and tree and millstone behind us we knew no greater speed than this for it was anti-railroad time and the iron horse we think someone has given it this name before had not then annihilated space as we believe somebody has said we love to feel the cool air revel upon our cheek and whistle among our hair and as it came up from over the smoothly frozen ponds with stinging force we laughed at its violence in the glow of excitement the hoar-frost gleamed upon hair and eyelash and fur collar and our breath streamed away behind us on the cold air like steam hiya 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 we cried the old pine woods echoed the eldritch scream and people in distant cottages caught the sound and listened to the unusual strain and the woodchoppers ceased from their labors to catch a glimpse of the fleeting fiends that awakened such strange echoes then a stop at mine inn and the old-fashioned southern hot we took mulled cider of course made all right for the return and a ride by starlight closed the day's joy it was joy then it was long before we knew Mrs. Partington and Ike and the perplexity of types. Ghosts of big sleighs came up before us, brimful of happy people nestled beneath the buffaloes, and hats and hoods occupy alternate positions throughout the party. Pleasant voices come back to us, and the old familiar faces renew themselves to us. Delightful but as memory recalls the happy scene the thought of a fair form and face the brightest of the group flits like a spirit across our mind leaving behind a shadow of sorrow and gloom ah maria the sweet eye and voice that animated and blessed us are now blessing other spheres the music of that glad tongue is now attuned to the music of celestial harmonies there is no memory of joy that we may recall however bright but has some woe connected intimately with it and twin smiles and tears make up the sum of the past hiya 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 comes to our domicile and startles us as we write and dashing along the nearly deserted street alarming ponderous watchmen on their walk a sleigh comes furiously by and another and another and the music of the bells chimes gratefully upon our ear here is a sleigh ride song that may do to sing some time if any one can find a tune to fit it over the snow over the snow 
away we go away we go the earth gleams white neath the stars tonight and all is bright above and below old care good-bye old care good-bye from you we fly from you we fly as if on wings our fleet steed springs and the welkin rings with our joyous cry gay mirth is here gay mirth is here our hearts to cheer our hearts to cheer while on we glide there's one by our side to cheer or to chide who is always dear over the snow over the snow away we go away we go there's freedom rare abroad in the air everywhere above and below hunk for the union the union dissolved said mrs partington with her specks upon her forehead and her finger raised as if admonishing the universe dissolve the union and who would dare assassinate such a thing as that such an outrage on the body's politics i thought it would come to this and if they dissolve the union which on em will have the children or will they let em grow up without nobody to look arter their moral training or things never think of dissolving it nor breaking it what god has joined together let not man put us under and that's gospel truth and they can't do it if we stick by each other with what an emphatic italic jerk the snuff-box came out as she concluded speaking the remembrance of her felicitous union with paul crossed her mind and the remembered pain of its dissolution mingled with her patriotic emotion and she dropped a tear as she uttered what would our foreign relations think of it the union was safe from that day thenceforth and for ever mrs partington says it seems to her a queer provision of nature that eggs should be scarce when they are so dear leaf from philanthropos journal monday morning seven a m summoned to the door when shaving a boy after cold victuals sorry we had none ours were all hot these evils come not as single spies but in battalions seven beggar boys in succession for cold victuals strange that they should be so anxious to have it cold it shows a corrupt taste probably the vitiating effect of poverty eight a m woman and child asking alms heart bled for them strong smell of gin persuaded that it was a gentle soporific for child nothing more subject to colic husband in california been there three years seven children dependent on her exertions didn't seem to exert herself much promised to call and see her nine a m foreigner with a certificate fine-looking man certificate reads right signed john smith honest sounding name think i've heard it before horrible volcano in italy swallowed up his vineyard and threw him and a large family upon the world heaven help him can't speak a word of english told me so himself felt strongly inclined to aid him will hand his name to the wandering samaritan society ten a m dressed to go out gentleman a stranger asked me if i had a ninepence in my pocket and if i would loan it to him to procure a letter from the post office sorry i hadn't the precise amount but gave him a dime was surprised to see him go into a drinking house suppose it must be one of the new sub offices eleven a m asked by a little barefoot boy for a cent implored me for his mother's sake to give him one knew the deceptions of this kind of beggars and refused the urchin called me a most scandalous name and followed behind me repeating it though several of my friends were in hearing gave him a quarter to get rid of him 
shall never forget the horrid leer he gave me great depravity training days i don't object to training days altogether said mrs partington to the major as the ancient and honourables passed her door the dress looks well and the children likes the music and i know this is moral training because the governor is there and his suet with his chateau on his head and his sword by his side how finely he does look so bold and portable i declare he looks too good to be a malicious officer she here leaned out of the door to catch a last view of the corpse as it turned a near corner and a portly-looking gentleman under a cocked hat waved his hand to her as the pageant swept from her view mrs partington resumed her knitting that had been disturbed by the music life life how curious it is curious is the word we wouldn't have any other for it expresses the very thing how curious it is from the cradle to the grave the hopes of the young are curious reaching forward into the future and building castles in perspective for their possessors that will crumble before them ere they arrive at that spot in time where their fabrics are located how curious it is the first dawning of love where the young heart surrenders itself to its dreams of bliss illumined with stars and garnished with moonshine how curious it is when matrimony crowns the wishes and cares fancied to be surmounted by ardent hearts are found to be but just commenced how curious it is says the young mother as she spreads upon hers the tiny hand of her babe and endeavors to read in its dim lines the fortunes of her child curious indeed would such revealings be could she there read them how curious it is the greed for gain that marks and mars the life of man leading him away after strange gods forgetting all the object and good of life in a heartless chase for a phantom light that leaves him at last in threefold egyptian darkness how curious it is the love of life that clings to the old and draws them back imploringly to the scenes of earth begging for a longer look at time and its frivolities with eternity and its joys within their reach how curious it is when at last the great end draws nigh the glazing eye the struggle the groan proclaiming dissolution and the still clay that denotes the extinguishment of the spark known as life how curious it is that the realities of the immortal world should be based upon the crumbling ashes of this and that the path to infinite light should lie through the dark shadow of the grave how curious it is in its business and pleasures its joys and sorrows its hopes and fears its temptations and triumphs and as we contemplate life in all its phases we must exclaim how curious it is an interesting fact dr digg and old roger were conversing upon wonders in nature and the doctor had given a long account of discoveries he had made during his travels in the east of intelligence in different kinds of animals the elephant the ichneumon and oxford county bear being particularly mentioned for their sagacity with regard to the last named description of animals he relied principally upon the testimony of his friend fitz whistler who had given him some wonderful particulars concerning their habits mr f had stated to him during a conversation that the oxford county bear had been known to be at times devotedly attached to new england rum and to make no great scruples about using now and then tobacco in its various forms which he considered a degree of intelligence very nearly approximating to the refinement of human civilization 
and surpassing that of all other animals roger admitted the truth in the main of what the doctor submitted but said that however much he was disposed to yield to fitzwhistler and the doctor in most matters in this one particular of superiority he must differ from them for there were animals in his own state new hampshire that excelled them all the doctor had not claimed for either class he had named any knowledge in mathematics but from a long residence in the granite state the doctor with that greatness of mind so characteristic of the individual immediately tendered his hat to roger who magnanimously placed it again upon the pundit's head new patents we often read in patent office reports of patents being granted for improvement in governors we don't care how much governors are improved and all efforts in this direction will receive the full consent of the governed we have seen too not long since that a patent has been given for an improvement in railing this invention must be of vast utility in quarrelsome neighborhoods where the quality of the railing has long needed improvement brief answers it is a terrible affliction to fall into the hands of one who either cannot or will not answer a question directly who will either evade a direct answer or by an everlasting prolixity in replying render his information useless the question you ask like the eye of the ancient mariner holds you fast and you cannot escape until as the reviewers say you arrive at the end of the volume for instance mr walker is out in the country and going towards a certain place he is in doubt about what direction he shall take and asks a man whom he meets the way to blank why the man replies after hesitating for five minutes if you should go back a quarter of a mile you could take the road that leads round by the old mill but that'd be a little further or you can take the road straight ahead and get over the wall and cut across only there's a swamp in the way which would bring you about half a mile out of the way or you may go through deacon willie's pasture you can see his barn from here and when you come to the barn take the path that leads through the woods this is the farthest way but the gals allers go through this way when they go home with their sweethearts or you can go up the road to the left and when you come to the crossroads turn to the right or the shortest way is for you to go right ahead and you'll get there in a half an hour organs a quiet tone is observable in the russian organs said mrs partington as the line in the telegraph news arrested her eye she mused upon it a moment church organs i dare say and we heard the other day that the emptier of russia dear pious man was organizing his soldiers to go and give the gospel to the turks at the point of the bayonet quick-toned organs well i wonder if they won't get one for our church that'll play nothing but serious tunes for the one we've got'll play yankee doodle just as well as old hundred and for my part i don't put no faith into it she looked at the vane on top of the distant spire that turned in the wind and mixed with variableness with church organs that played many tunes and men of the church as variable as the organs while ike was teasing the kitten with a brand new cap border that the old lady was just doing up End of section 17. Recording by John Brandon. End of Life and Sayings of Mrs. Partington and Other Members of the Family by B. P. Shillaber.